Okay, you know, I'm actually kind of happy with myself because I'm starting this stream pretty much on time. This is mostly right around when I said it was going to be. I said it would be like at two and I'm like 25 minutes late, but there were a few important things I had to get done. But I'm not like running hours over time, so I think everything should still be going on schedule. Uh, hello, Kuan. That was very fast. That was like seconds after the stream started. Um, okay, so. This stream is obviously going to be very different. As the title implies, I'm testing every single healing spec, which, well, minus preservation, because the entire point is low-level dungeon testing, and preservation, it's a bit weird. Uh, so we're going to be testing all healing specs, including both priest specs, and it's specifically going to be roughly 50 to 60 dungeon leveling. Basically just enough to get an idea on the strengths and weaknesses of each of the different healers, and then we move on to the next one when they hit level 60. Uh, so it's not like a speed run, we're not measuring the time, because at the end of the day, dungeon leveling, it's extremely random, especially if you're not the tank, which is, you know, part of the problem with it. So this isn't like a, you know, timing thing, it is purely how does the specs kit work for dungeon leveling. Uh, now I've gotten one of everything set up, so I have a Resto Druid here. This is actually the same character that I used in my uh, 10 to 70 world record, except if you remember for that one, I copied the character over midway through and then finished that run on the PTR. So this is actually the live server version of that character, which was left off at like level 35 or something. So I got that up to just over 50 to this one is like 51 and a half because the other characters I'll be testing are older ones that have full rested experience. So roughly they're all kind of starting at the same point. These ones I think have some of the time walking buffs, which I can't click off. I didn't realize that. So they might be slightly faster, but it's whatever. Like I said, we're not going for speed here. We're just purely testing how the specs kit functions. So before I start, obviously, while everybody goes in here, uh, I'm going to hop onto each one of these healers and just go over, generally speaking, the build and stuff that I'm going to be running for them. I should also note I'm not using any super fancy consumables or anything like that, partially because some of the characters, as you'll see, are on random servers that have nothing on them. I don't have any gold on them, so I wouldn't be able to get consumables, so just to set a baseline, I'm not using any. But realistically speaking, it won't matter because consumables, as I've mentioned many times, only really have a major impact towards the start of the run, and any movement stuff won't matter in dungeons. Like, gun shoes, if you're not a tank, it doesn't matter if you gun shoes in dungeons or not. So, the wrestler druid and the holy priest, I've already gotten, like, pretty much completely set up to where I want them, because I had to level them up to 50 before the start of the run. Uh, so, you know, I have all my basic heirlooms here. None of this stuff is enchanted, but we have a traditional heirloom set. And for talents. So this is one where I'm sure that a lot of healer mains are going to look at some of the talents that I'm using in these runs and are going to be very confused. Because the reality of leveling healers and dungeons, and honestly, leveling healers in general, is you do not build them anywhere even remotely close to the way that you would build them in endgame. Because here's the thing, healing doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for any of these specs. I'm not going to be concerning myself with optimizing healing at all, because the entire point, the entire strength of a healer in a dungeon context is not actually how much healing they do, can do, because realistically speaking, every single healer can, in low-level content, frankly, roll their face in their keyboard and keep the group alive. You really don't need to have anything special, because if your party member's health is above zero, that's really all that matters, and that is not hard to do. And if somebody dies and you can't stop it, it's usually because they stood in something extremely stupid anyway, and at that point, well, you know, they're probably not worth keeping alive, quite frankly, for dungeon leveling. So... Realistically speaking, when leveling a healer in a dungeon, as we saw at the low levels when I did my Holy Priest run, and the Resto Shaman run, and all that stuff, your damage is actually all that matters. The way that you speed things up is by contributing two damage 
as a healer. And so that is what all of these builds are going to be structured for. And you'll also notice that some healers can't really do that. And that's going to make them a little bit weaker. Uh, hello, Fluke. Good to see you. Not for these runs, but you can. You can't mail yourself. So, Kuan, I could, if I really wanted to, get stuff to random servers. I have a separate account that I have actually used for that. The um, the Beastmaster Hunter speed run a while ago was on the first ever server I played on because I had my original Hunter main that I played way back when in like 2008 or something, and I used that one for the 40 to 60 Beastmaster run. But I didn't really want to transfer that character. So I specifically like kind of funneled stuff onto my second account and then used that second account to trade it to my hunter. It's a really annoying process. They should just enable cross uh, server mail because right now it is actually easier to trade things across accounts than it is to trade things across servers. So that's literally what I did. I traded it to one character um, because trading works cross server. And then I just swapped characters in my main account. And then on my second account, traded all those items then to the character I wanted. It's a little bit weird. Uh, hello, Azro. Good to see you. Hello, James. Um, but yeah, so I'm not going to do that for this run. It also, it doesn't really matter. Like I said, we're just testing generally like the healer kit. Um, and... The thing about dungeon leveling is my individual performance is not really going to make a massive difference, which is kind of one of the reasons why I always say I don't recommend playing a healer unless you absolutely need to. So the most important thing, regardless, is that all of these runs are on an even playing field, so we don't like skew the data. So there, none of them will be using fancy consumables, and I think that is more important. Uh, James said, I took your advice and maxed the Guardian Druid in two days. Awesome. That's pretty good. Yeah, Guardian Druid is definitely a good one to level with. Okay, so build stuff. Uh, obviously, I've leveled Druids in general a million times. You're going to see fairly similar stuff here. So uh, for doing damage as a Resto Druid, technically speaking, if I wanted to, I could Bear Weave, I could Cat Weave, and it is maybe worth considering if you wanted to absolutely min-max your damage, but I've kind of talked about this before, where if you are doing that, it is almost just more worth it to just play a Guardian Druid. So what I'm trying to do here is get a more realistic build for leveling a Resto Druid, as realistic as it can really get, and I'm going with kind of a Boomkin weaving build. I probably won't even be using Boomkin form, I'm just going to be using a lot of the Boomkin abilities and synergies while out of shapeshift forms. That way I can still heal if necessary. So I'll still have the ability to do any emergency heals if needed, but I will have Star Surge, Star Fire, Sun Fire, Moon Fire, blah, 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 all that stuff to at least contribute to damage. And as we get into the bottom section of this tree here, like almost none of this matters, I should note. I'm taking mostly passive healing stuff or things like uh that are like burst healing so nature swiftness allows me to get a free regrowth ysera's gift is passive tricking trickling healing Flo fire and forget basically tranquility if i need a burst of healing i can pop this in a pinch a lot of other passive stuff scenario ward i figure if we're like running between a pole i can preemptively throw this in the tank and a lot of my healing choices as I said before, I'm not looking at maximizing HPS or anything. Specifically, I'm trying to find what is the best passive, non-active like healing setup I can get so that I can focus entirely on doing damage as a Resto Druid and speeding things along. And there really isn't a ton in the midsection here that lets me do damage, but then I can take Adaptive Swarm down here. I will probably next take Convoke the Spirits. And... After taking Convoke, uh, I have a few different options. I think after that, I will probably just take Circle of Life and Death. And then I will take Unbridled Swarm and the Upgrade Scenarius' Guidance. And we're just going all into stuff that increases the damage. Most of these other things are healing. Technically speaking, obviously, all of these are also healing buffs, but because they will at least in some way contribute damage that is what I will be prioritizing in the capstone section. And 
for the bottom thing here, it really, it's nothing we haven't seen before. One more point into Lycara's improved Stampeding Roar. Heart of the Wild will actually be quite nice when I get this. It'll improve all my magic damage. And then probably something like Forest Walk. Uh, I think Ursal's Vortex could be situationally useful, especially because I'm doing dungeons. Uh, Nature's Vigil is like a consideration. I think overall, I will probably get more damage out of a 30% increased magical damage than like my healing turns into damage, especially because there's like a lot of investment here that doesn't do anything. It is maybe possible that Nature's Vigil would have been better. Uh, I will probably go for it the moment I pick up Heart of the Wild, but I think overall, for what I'm building for, this will be stronger in the immediate moment. Uh, you forgot the crossroad mailing is still just for BOAs. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, hello, MS. Good to see you. All right, so that covers everything for Resto Druid. Obviously, I'll be leveling these characters later, but as I said, I usually like to take a bit at the start of the stream just to wait for people to get here and do setup. And since I've already done most of the setup, uh, what I can do here is now just kind of explain all the builds. And then later on, once we start, it'll just be back-to-back you know, hop onto the character, just immediately queue for dungeons, and there won't be any ramp-up time there. Okay, so Holy Priest. This is also the same priest that I did the Speeder and on before. So that same, like, Holy Shadow Priest run, same character. Uh, this is, I, I think I switched to the PTR at, like, 29 or something. So I had a bit more to catch up on on this character, but I got it to 51, and I can clear all this stuff off my bars because I won't be needing it. And the setup that I have here is pretty much the same as what I was running before. So uh, there is a lot more interesting stuff to discuss when it comes to priests because unlike rest of druids, which have basically no buildable damage stuff, as we've already discussed, Holy Priests have so many ways to build for damage. It's one of the reasons why I genuinely think Holy Priest is, like, as good as certain damage specs. Holy Priest actually might be better for leveling. Like, solo leveling questing than Rogues. Because it just has, honestly, good damage and pretty strong survivability. And has really flexible talents. Holy Priest is fun to level as. Uh, what dungeon will I be leveling? Um, I am No, I'm not going to be switching it up with expansions. In fact, I specifically am going to be doing TBC dungeons because in the current speedrun route, you only really do TBC dungeons, realistically, for, uh, like, you know, low-level stuff. So the entire point of this run is testing how good healers are for dungeon leveling, so I want to also test them within the same types of dungeons that you'll be seeing uh, in a traditional speedrun, to keep things accurate. I won't be doing quests on any characters, though, because some of these characters have already done dungeon quests, some have not, so, you know, I'll just not pick up any, not turn in any, etc. Uh, the cross realm trading is something you'd love to see, a bag or something added that you can trade items or gold, but it has a limited amount of space. Um, I, I don't. I think you should just be able to trade across realm. There is absolutely zero reason at this point to have restrictions, especially considering, as I just said, you can literally do the same thing and trade as many items as you want, and it is easier doing it cross accounts than cross server. So, like, it would be completely stupid for Blizzard to design a feature to help you with cross realm mailing or whatever when there's already workarounds that let you do the entire thing with no penalties. I don't think that this is an intentional thing on Blizzard's part, though. I'm not saying, like, ah, Blizzard is preventing us from doing cross-realm mailing, because as far as I remember them saying, it is a technical issue. I think they said some weird thing with the mailbox prevents it, and I'm pretty sure they're going to try and fix it eventually, but right now... For whatever reason, it is easier for them to enable cross-realm trading than it is mailing. But presumably that gets fixed in the future. Uh, that makes sense? Yeah. I figured that people would understand the logic behind that. It makes sense to me. I did initially consider uh, switching up dungeons, and actually, I really wanted to do it. Initially, I was like, oh, I could try different dungeons, like you were suggesting, uh, Phil Lerpe. But then, the more I thought about it, even though I do think that would be more fun... 
we are still at the like it's the very end but we are still doing testing runs i want to make sure that everything is accurate so the moment we're, we're we're like almost at the end here right of like all of it like i started this i've technically been doing on and off testing runs for years now but i started like doing focus testing of every spec back to back back in like june and this is outside of sub rogue which will be in like a week or two the final set of tests it's going to be the final live stream set of tests so you know we can have fun later i have a lot of cool ideas i've kind of talked about them of you know future leveling streams what i can do both for classic and retail but for this one i still want to keep things like somewhat you know at a baseline at a, a comparable level uh what is a fun healing class you want to try but priest isn't your thing so I can only speak to leveling. I am not an endgame healer, which is why I've kind of left this for last. I am absolutely not somebody who plays a healer at endgame, so I I don't know. The only healer that I've played at endgame whatsoever is Miss Weaver Monk, so I can say that I enjoy Miss Weaver, but that is the only one I can say. Uh, but I think, yeah, Miss Weaver, in my opinion, is a pretty fun uh, spec to play for healing. I'm sure a lot of the others are good. I have a lot of friends who absolutely love Resto Druid, but it's not something that I've played a lot. Um, out of all of the healing specs that I have tested so far, Holy Priest is my favorite, and it's not even close. Holy Priest has genuinely become one of my favorite specs in the game to level, period. Uh, not just healers. The rest I was kind of, like, fine with. Like, Resto Shaman is good for leveling, but it's it wasn't, like, super exciting. It's not like spamming Holy Nova. Uh, you don't really want shared inventory bags like Guild Wars 2, you just want cross-realm mailing, it seems like an oversight. Yeah, and in Guild Wars 2, you can do kind of the same thing, but it's, you also have to do kind of extra steps. It's nowhere near as tedious, you just kind of drop stuff in your bank and then switch characters and pull it out. Um, so it's not as bad, but then also, because of that Guild Wars 2, managing storage space can be a little bit annoying because a lot of your storage space is shared. So you have to create basically like mule characters to hold extra items that you you know, don't really need at the moment, and that has its own problems, but I don't know. I, I There's a lot of really nice utility stuff in Guild Wars 2, so I don't want to complain about that too much. Uh, you didn't even play Monk yet? You'll give it a try? Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, if you're trying Monk, I'd recommend trying Brewmaster and Windwalker too, because they are both very fun specs as well. I generally enjoy those two specs more than most others in the game, but Miss Weaver's nice too. Uh, okay, so... Going over the build, if you watched my Priest run a few months ago, you are going to be familiar with a lot of this, because I've talked extensively about Holy Priest. A lot of the same stuff down here. We have some passive things. Holy Nova, of course, is the main source of damage, especially on multi-targets. Rhapsody is ludicrously strong. This is... I mean, this thing is so good that if you remember, I was still using Holy Nova as an AoE burst damage thing with Shadow Priest because of Rhapsody. Like, it was still worth pressing, at least while leveling, when this was at 20 stacks. It is absolutely mental how strong Rhapsody is as a talent. This is also pretty good, so after I cast Power Word Shield, I get a 10% damage increase with Smite and Holy Nova, which is a large chunk of my damage. PI, need I say more, right? Obviously, mobility stuff, CC stuff, I've taken Leech Talents, basically a lot of self-healing things, Shadow Word Pain Damage, because I will be using that. Uh, Twist of Fate is still pretty good. Uh, body and soul gives you movement speed all the shadow things for damage this doesn't give damage this is just utility this is more utility but all this stuff uh tithe evasion while leveling this character up before starting the stream before i picked tithe evasion there were times where i literally one shot myself with touch of death because time walking scaling is so stupid that your ability can scale really high to the point where it's hitting for more than your maximum health. And that is a problem. And it's one of the reasons why I'm not going to be doing time walking for these tests, because time walking is just really fucked when it comes to getting an accurate feel for how classes and specs play. Uh, but other stuff, I'm taking mind games, because obviously mind games is a really nice single target burst. I will probably take manipulation... Maybe Shattered Perceptions, I guess, is there anything else that's even worth using? Um, reflecting Damage is okay. Maybe Halo could be better. I could see taking Halo, actually, as like a stronger AoE burst thing. Hmm. 
I'm pretty sure most of this other stuff isn't worth taking for leveling. Yeah, I think actually after mind gains, I'll probably just pick up Halo and then just go down into all this synergy stuff. And then you would maybe take Crystalline Reflection just for the slight extra reflect damage. Nothing crazy there. Now, on the Holy Tree itself. So I'm taking basically everything that gives me some form of damage. There's a few things I'm not taking. I'm not even taking Circle of Healing. Uh, it's not terrible, but I just, I don't really need it. Um, getting a lot of passive stuff. Guardian Spirit is just, you know, free. If I can, um, you know, throw this in someone who's about to die, I can keep pumping out damage. Uh, I have, obviously, Chastise, Imperial Blaze. This is broken. This button and Burning Vehemence makes Holy Priest damage actually so ridiculous on high target pulls. While I was doing time walking, in some AoE pulls, I was genuinely doing the most damage compared to tanks and DPS. It's actually crazy. So that is a very, very powerful option. A lot of this other stuff doesn't really do anything for damage. Um, yet yeah, none of this stuff does damage. I guess technically, if I wanted to press par Prayer of Mending to get Apotheosis for a very minor, like... It, it, increases like my or reduces the cooldown on holy word chastise which is like slight single target increase it's not worth going down there though so i'm going to take i think it was which is the one that reduces chastise yeah holy fire so holy fire reducing chastise just gives me more single target damage and then here this is nuts divine word will make it so chastise uh will increase my damage and give smite a chance to apply holy fire so that is like a ton of burst damage actually like really 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 nice um and then i think other stuff doesn't really matter this is like increased healing done i'll probably just grab whatever i feel like at that point none of the other stuff here is really important whatsoever uh, just making sure that you get all the chastised burst damage so that is what i'm doing for holy i can switch over to the next healer can just explain that. Uh, Jason the Man, you don't need to worry about, like, you know, spamming or something. As long as you're, at, like, asking questions or whatever and you know, not trolling or anything, I don't care how much you type. I'm always happy to answer more questions. Never feel bad about typing a lot. Don't worry about that at all. Um, but if you want to know what my leveling route is, I, I literally have a guide on my channel uh, and on my website. So I have both a written and video guide. Just check my YouTube channel and you will find my full guide. It's completely free. All that fun stuff. And yeah, it's definitely faster than WAD. I know a lot of people still think spamming WAD stuff is the best way to go. And I can assure you it is not. Uh, Captain Crack said, finally got all the range DPS to level 70. Dream Surges plus Time Walking makes Dragonflight leveling a breeze. Yeah, definitely. Right now, leveling a character to 70 is really fast. It sucks they nerfed the Thaldrasis questline. Dream Surges are still really nuts. The questline was only, like, marginally faster than Azure Spam Dream Surges anyway, and it only worked in, um, in Thaldrasis. But even if you do Dream Surge leveling with Time Walking and stuff like that in Waking Shores or, or Onaran Plains, it's still not that bad. Florian said, good luck, Mr. Waterfall. Do you have any tips for leveling a bunch of alts on a second account? Um, I assume you're saying, like, you are... Yeah, because you said you're doing level 11 Guardian Druid boosts. Not really. I mean, honestly, that's not really something I'm too concerned about. I think you probably got the right idea. If you have a level 11 Guardian Druid twink, especially if you're leveling up multiple characters at once... It might be worth it. I guess if your second account has no heirlooms, no nothing, and you have a fresh account with, uh, or like an established account with, you know, a full best in slot Guardian Druid Twink already, then yeah, I guess you can multi box and boost that way. It's probably faster than trying to level with absolutely no heirlooms completely solo. I don't know exactly how long that would be efficient for, and for Dragonflight, obviously, I don't really think that would work, but I mean, I guess you could always boost your alt through Dragonflight dungeons, though it's a little bit harder to carry on the level of, like, an 11, level 11 Guardian Druid Twink in Dragonflight dungeons, so hard to say. Time walking to, you know, you can't really carry. I mean, if you have a full best-in-slot time walking Twink too, maybe, but that's a lot of effort for something that you could just, you know, kind of 
grind out on your second account anyway. Um, and Troy said you'd say create a macro to follow the twink. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, that is definitely something that you'd want to do if you're doing that. I, I've heard that there are weird restrictions in place. I don't know all the details because, like I said, not really something I'm super interested in, but I'm sure there are resources out there for people who have tried that. Uh, okay, so this character, let me make sure I'm in the right spec. Yeah, I'm in Discipline. So I have two Priest runs, obviously. One Holy, one Disc. Though, realistically speaking, they're going to play fairly similar. So I can just go through, uh, grab all the correct talents. Uh, take Angelic Feather, Void Tendrils, and probably Spell Warding. I don't really need anything special after that. Shadow Repain does reduce damage, grab Power Infusion, Void Shields, Twist of Fate, Throws of Pain, and yeah, Shadow Repain and Purge the Wicked. Because there's. Isn't like Purge the Wicked replaces Shadow Repain, or is that like an older version of Disc? I'm not entirely sure. I right, grab Body and Soul. Uh. What's going on? I definitely want Words of the Pious. Can grab Sanguine Teachings, Sand Lane, and then I need one more point to unlock the bottom section of the tree. What do I want from here? Uh, I feel like this is probably good from Darkness Comes Light. Yeah. There's like a few other options that I could go for there. And then here, pretty straightforward, I take Mind Games. It's this might be the exact same talent setup. I think maybe you're forced to take Prayer of Menting. Yeah, I think that was the one difference. On Holy Priest, you have to take Prayer of Menting. In uh, Shadow Priest, or Discipline Priest, you start with Shadow Fiend. So that's one less point I need to spend so I can throw it on from Darkness Comes Light. Uh, in the Disc Tree, so anything that gives me damage. Okay, yep, that... That get, applies atonement, so when your penance deals damage, definitely going to take schism. This is like your penance increases your healing none, which I don't really care about. Uh, mind Blast gaining an additional charge is good. What does schism do exactly? It increases your spell damage. Okay, well, making it last longer gives me more spell damage. Each Penance Bolt extends the duration of Shadow or Pain and Purge the Wicked. Alright, we'll take that. What does this do? Luminous Barrier, Power Barrier. Okay, I've seen those talents in use. I've just never been sure what it does exactly. Uh, I'll definitely be taking Power Word Solace. What does this stuff do? Alright, don't need that. I can take Make Amends in Path into Power Word Solace, Shadow Covenant. Okay, for 7 seconds, I do 25% increased damage. Say no more. Uh, Jason said, I'll check out that video. You will you might return if you have questions. Yeah, no problem. Um, the main thing is, everything in that video, I obviously spent a ton of time making, so I'm not going to be able to explain it any better than I already have, but if you do have questions after watching that, feel free to ask. I'm sure there's like one or two things uh, that may not be 100% clear. That is a no-brainer. Purge the Wicked. Uh, Purge the Wicked deals more damage. Casting Power Shield increases my haste. That's damage. Castigation is damage. Ooh. Yeah, these are both good options. Uh, do I want increased duration? Or 10% more? How long does this last? For 7 seconds? So this makes it last 15 seconds. So then I have a 50% uptime. And I feel like Having a higher uptime is better than 10% increase? With how nice you are, you've earned my sub. Alright, thank you. Uh, let's go with... Probably that. Okay, so I can't spend any more points in the disc tree now. 
I do know they're taking out Light's Wrath, right? They're changing this to be the... You, like, fly into the air and blast the target or whatever. So, I guess it's a little bit... Uh, It's interesting, though. I feel like it would be weird to take Light's Wrath considering it's being removed. But is there anything else that's better? I feel like, honestly, as much as it sucks that this is... What are they changing it to? Let me find the exact talent changes so I know how you would account for this. Talent calculator, 10.2, discipline. Uh, okay, so it is ch being changed to ultimate penitence. Ascend into the air and unleash a massive barrage of penance bolts, dealing big damage to enemies. Okay. It's a 4-minute cooldown, whereas Light's Wrath is a 1.5-minute cooldown. But this is AoE, and Light's Wrath is single target. Uh, but each Penance Bolt you fire reduces its cooldown by 1 second. And... You explode healing allies around you. Have they moved Wrath Unleashed anywhere? That's kind of what I'm curious about, because... It seems like nothing else in the rest of the tree is getting changed at all. So it's just the bottom section here. This is all exactly the same. A Mindbender is now at the bottom here. So they basically switched Void Summoner and Mindbender positions. And this stuff is the same. Yeah. And this stuff is also the same. Okay. Yeah, that is interesting. I feel like I would have been tempted to take Light's Wrath just because your AoE with Holy Nova is already really good. This actually means Disc Priest will probably be slightly worse with the patch, but just to simulate it a bit more accurately, I probably won't go Light's Wrath just to make sure that I'm not doing anything that won't be possible. Um, it's also a bit weird that Mindbender is getting moved further down. Actually, wait. I just realized that makes no sense. If they are switching those two spells, that must have a new effect. In patch 10.2... Huh? So, okay, according to the patch 2 point, or 10.2 talent tree, Void Summoner still reduces the cooldown of Mindbender... Oh, oh, I see. It would reduce the cooldown of Shadow Fiends because Mindbender... Yeah, okay, that, that makes more sense. Uh, hello, Casey Bonk. Good to see you. Uh, interesting. So... There's a lot of good options here. The one interesting thing, though, is I'm actually curious if Disc will be able to do more damage than Holy. Because while... Disc has, at least while leveling, Disc has more things that increase its damage, but Holy just has so many buttons that do ridiculous damage. Like, Holy Fire, with that Empyrean Blaze thing, hits so hard. I am curious if this will be enough to outweigh it. Hello, Bagheera. Good to see you. Uh... Yeah, there are a lot of really good options here. This I definitely won't take. So that is... it's. I think these talents, well... This is not bad. Because I probably would be using Smite on single target at least a few times. Power Word Solace is like a big damage cooldown, so that's not bad. Um, and it also buffs Penance, which obviously I'm going to be using. Then Penance Bolts increasing the damage of my next Power Word Solace would also be good. The problem is... I don't know if I... Uh, well, I don't want to take Light's Wrath now. Maybe next patch you would take the big, like, fly into the air and do a bunch of burst damage thing, and then you would go down here and take Wheel and Woe. But for now, I'm going to ignore this. Uh, I also definitely don't want this because it does nothing for my damage. Which, you know, technically, Harsh Discipline would increase my damage somewhat. So really, I can only go down one section of the tree, which would be Mindbender next, and then... 
Mind Blaster Shadower Death. It's pretty good. Uh, I also think Twilight Equilibrium is just kind of nuts. Uh, yeah, I'll probably go down here and then Inescapable Torment Void Summoner. If I have the points for that. But I think realistically, next patch, you would probably go the, um, the big burst thing first. Then you would maybe go down to Twilight Equilibrium. Then you would probably go down to Mindbender, which will be down here. I think overall, as long as I ignore Light's Wrath, it should feel fairly comparable to how it'll play out next time. So I will go with this general build. And as for setting up my bars... Um, fade. I have a lot of random garbage that I need to get sorted out here. Uh, Mind Blast, Penance, Smite, those are all going to be on my actual bars. Purify can be there. Shadow Fiend there. Uh, how about this? And then I can put PI there. Uh, I didn't talent into paint sup, right? Yeah, so I can take this off my bars, I can take Rapture off my bars, this, and I- oh, I need Schism, so I'll put P.I. there. Uh, hello, Brellos, good to see you. In the future, if you had some cool leveling idea and recorded a run, uh, I- I don't know what you're talking about, Azero. I'm not sure I fully understand. Um... It really, really heavily depends on the context of what you're asking. Uh, oh shit, I also don't have mind games on my bar, so I'll put that on Shift R. Generally, though, you know, you know my stance on self promotion. I'm a little bit more lenient if I think it's like, you know, innocuous, right? But obviously, I, I need to take a pretty hard line stance to that because you know we've seen the way that some people try to treat it. You know, you give an itch, inch and certain people take a mile, which is why I have pretty set rules on a lot of stuff like that. Like, you know, battle net friend requests is one that I've talked about before where, you know, because a few people decided to be weird with it, I now just have to decline all battle net friend requests in general. So it's just kind of how stuff like that goes. Okay, I think generally speaking, this is good as far as setting up bars goes. I don't have anything special. So, Atonement. Let me just... I played Disc a while ago, but they've changed Disc so many times, so I'm going to refresh my mem memory. Uh, your damage is increased by up to 40%, diminishing for each ally you have affected by your Atonement. So, this definitely means that I will want to be at least healing enough to apply Atonement to people. Which means, um, I actually think I'm going to... Take one point out of borrowed time and put it into a second charge of Power Word Radiance, as I think that will be the easiest way to quickly apply Atonement to people. It says instant cast, it hits everybody with a big burst of healing and applies Atonement. It's not perfect, but this way I can just quickly get the Atonement buff up for Sins of the Many, because as I said at the start, damage is the concern here. Healing doesn't matter. You know, I can press one or two buttons to keep people alive. Yeah. Azra, I would say, if you want to, like, run that by me, you know, in DMs or something, we'll see. Uh, obviously, there are times where if somebody has been like, you have even done that before, you've been like, I found some cool new leveling tech, can I post a clip? And, you know, obviously this is, I assume you're talking about within the Discord, right? Because obviously my Twitch channel, or not Twitch channel, YouTube channel, no. Um, but if you want to post something like that in the Discord, generally speaking, as long as it's like relevant to the discussion and stuff like that, I'm fine with that. Because I don't really view that as self-promotion if it's helping other people. But there is definitely a fine line, and I've had to stop it a few times. So, like, that's one of those things. 
shoot me a message after the stream. Uh, Nismaller said, hello, first ever live, um, but video 100 or something. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you've been really enjoying my videos then, and I'm also glad you were able to make it to the live stream. Okay, so let's look at this. Uh, mastery, I don't need to worry about. Atonement, uh, whenever I have atonement, any damage I do heals anyone affected. Okay, so pretty much the way this is mostly going to go is I power radiance a bunch of people. I like power word shield the tank so that I can get the words the pious buff up, and then I just start blasting. So I schism, that increases uh, my damage to that target. Dark Covenant also makes me do 25% increased damage. And also my other spells become Shadow. Shadow Fiend just, you know, hits the target, does damage. Mind Game, single target nuke. Powered Solace, also single target nuke. And obviously PI. I'm probably going to PI myself because I will most likely be doing more damage than other people. Uh, Holy Nova, this is a no-brainer. In AoE, uh, I will mostly just be spamming this, but... I believe Purge the Wicked spreads up to two nearby enemies when you cast Penance on the target. Okay, so this is kind of like uh, I have Shadow Word, Pain on Holy, and I just dot up everything before I start. So I will be doing Purge the Wicked, then I will Penance that target and spread it to any nearby enemies in the pull, and then I would hit Holy Nova if there's like five plus targets. Otherwise, it would probably just be better to single target them down within a dungeon setting. But in low-level dungeons, honestly, a lot of times you're going to get the most damage just pressing Holy Nova and blasting enemies for, like, a ridiculous amount of damage. Uh, hell, even on single target, at 20 stacks, this thing hits like a truck when you've gotten full Rhapsody stacks. Like, this is, what, uh, 1,700 Holy Damage, and we saw there earlier it's, like, 2,000-something at 20 stacks of Rhapsody. So it is very, very, very strong. Uh, you love them all, and saying that you still have stuff to talk about, I, I mean, it's a very complicated game, what can I say? There are a ton of specs to cover, and I'm not always talking about the game, right? Sometimes I just tell recent stories and stuff. I've definitely exhausted most older, interesting stories, but every now and then there's like some fun new thing that I can talk about. Uh, but okay, I think that, generally speaking, covers it for what I will be doing for Disc Priest, so can move on to setting up or Miss Weaver, which Miss Weaver, this one should be a bit more straightforward because I'm actually somewhat familiar with how Miss Weaver plays. And quite honestly, it's mostly just going to be spamming spinning crane kick and then just healing with whatever I can do very easily. Uh, okay, so for talents, let's just quickly wipe this. Monk tree is going to be pretty much the same as every single monk build that I've ever done. Gonna take uh, Paralysis, grab two Ferocity of Swen. I will take Improved Roll. Uh, there's a few options that I have here. I think because I will actually be using Vivify a lot, I could take Improved Vivify. Uh, I don't know if I'll be using Expel Harm enough to justify that. For now, though, I'm actually going to take... Ooh, it's a tough call. Uh, I think I kind of need to take Improved Paralysis just so I can get Fort Brew, which will be important for a variety of reasons. Obviously, I will have most of this stuff by the end, but I'm just trying to think, like, what order would I do if I was, for whatever reason, leveling up a Miss Weaver? Uh, definitely Dampen Harm here. I would not want to use Touch of Death, or I w would not want to use Improved Touch of Death. It is actually worse. I prefer Chi Torpedo, Fort Brew. Um, I don't really think I'll need anything to improve Fort Brew, so I'll just not do that. Transcendence, Ring of Peace is obviously very good. Um, and probably I'll get some value out of Eye of the Tiger. Now I have three more points to spend here. I think Tiger Tail Sweep later on compared to some of the capstones is not bad. I'm trying to think what I would want here. You know what? I'm thinking about it. Do I actually really care about Fort Brew and Improved Paralysis? For a DPS, not really. Or for a healer, not really. Um, if I was a tank, obviously that's important. But realistically speaking, I shouldn't actually need it. Because this allows me to then take... 
Chi Burst, or a bit of AoE damage, which I think is more important. Here, um, Fatal Touch, and then I would basically go Fatal Touch, one more point, into Resonant Fists, into Summon White Tiger Statue, and we would basically be playing Discount Windwalker, because... Yeah, uh, there it, Mistweaver is one of those specs where there is such little point to actually leveling as it. You know, Disc, Holy, they have merit. Resto has some merit. Um, like, Resto Druid and Mistweaver are one of those where it's like, why? But hey, that's why we're testing this. So even though we are effectively basically doing Windwalker at home, that's the best way to level as a Mistweaver, quite frankly. So that is what I'm going to be building. And this other stuff. So, I'm definitely going to go for Teachings of the Monastery ASAP, because that is, like, the one thing that is, like, good for Misweaver damage. Technically speaking, I think it's ironic that Windwalker actually has this now. It used to be a Misweaver-only thing. And then Thunder Focus T, I, yeah, I can use it on Rising Sun Kick. So I still want to do Thunder Focus T, Rising Sun Kick, and then Rising Sun Kick again. Um, and then, is there anything else up here? Um, Revival. Is probably what I want to use. Just because burst healing when, burst healing, especially on an instant cast ability, is quite good when I want to be mostly focusing on damage. I am not testing Evoker, no. This is specifically for low-level stuff. So the test runs will be from 50 to 60, but for 60 to 70, it gets a little bit different. Quite honestly, all healers are really the same in effectiveness, and I actually have tested Preservation once or twice before for questing, but really, Preservation in Dungeons is no different than a lot of these other healing specs. And it's just, it would be kind of impossible for me to test it on a one-to-one -one playing field, and it will not really be included in my final tier list just because they are not available for leveling in, you know, chromie time. So preservation is not being tested as part of this run. Whenever Blizzard, um, in the Avaloran expansion or whatever, when we get, uh, you know, revamped chromie time slightly as they always do and evokers now have to level up from 10... Then, yes, I will probably go back and test evokers for leveling 10 to 60. But right now, it's just kind of impossible to draw a one-to-one -one comparison. And I guess I literally... This is a really weird opening tree. I don't actually know of any other spec where you can, in your first section, take every single option except one. Because there's just so few to choose from. But, all right. Uh, vivif vivify words. Uh, critical strikes and rising sun kick kicks reduce the cooldown of revival, blah blah blah. This could be okay. I'm looking for anything that does damage. Um, that doesn't do damage. That doesn't do damage. Doesn't do damage. Essence font has a chance to reduce the cooldown of thunder focus T. Well, reducing the cooldown of thunder focus tree words. Thunder Focus T translates into more Rising Sun Kicks on single target. Uh, Zen Pulse is some damage, so I'll take that. It casts on targets with Enveloping Mist. Oh, this is weird. So in order to get the damage bonus on this, I would actually need to be... Hmm. Need to be actively healing. I think at most, um, what I could do is at the very start of a pull, quickly throw Enveloping Mist on the tank and then drop Zen Pulse on them. And then I would get the second pulse. That's probably still a damage increase. Um, TG would also make my next Enveloping Mist free. Invoke Yulon doesn't do any damage. This is... PG supports Fist Weaving, so this actually would mean that by doing damage, I'm healing. It's the traditional Fist Weaving stuff. And... I guess this would... 
maybe help as long as there's no other options that give me damage. So let's go Invigorating Mists just so I can take Rapid Diffusion because this gives me some free healing. Rising Sun Kick will apply Renewing Mist to nearby allies. Cool. So that is stuff that, you know, I can just fire and forget, get free healing, don't need to worry about it. Um, Vivify has a 20% chance to make your next Rising Sun Kick generate one stack of Manatee. I don't really think I need that. Um, I'm probably not going to be spending remotely enough mana to make that worth it. But maybe uh, what else do I want? Hmm. I guess this means that I can just life cocoon in place of an enveloping mist at one point, and that will give me slightly more GCDs to do damage. Uplifted Spirits means that while doing damage, I'm reducing the cooldown on Revival. Probably at least worth doing. I definitely want to take Feline Stomp for damage, so I need to take one of these things. I guess I will be using Thunder Focus T quite a lot, so that is probably worth picking up. Um... Hmm... There are definitely some good options here. Ooh. So I think at this point, I can take a lot of these things. What I want to focus on is what talents am I going to take at the bottom here. I'm definitely going to pick Feline Stomp and Ancient Concordance. That's damage. Your abilities reset Feline Stomp. And while within Feline Stomp, your stuff hits more. That is kind of a no-brainer. Um, interesting. So that has a chance to give me free Rising Sun Kicks. That's single target damage. This is healing. This is just healing. You get free stats. That would be good if it wasn't locked behind pure healing options. Uh, same with Invoker's Delight. That's free stats, but I have to go... St oh, hold up. Man, Xiaohao's lessons would be good if I didn't need to take Sheelan's Gift. Um... I think after I grab this stuff, when I take Awakened Feline, I would want to go Focus Thunder so I get extra free Rising Sun Kicks. And then I think I would take Tea of Plenty to potentially get even more free Rising Sun Kicks. And after that, I guess I could go... With Xiaohao's Lesson, Sheelan's Gift, I probably... This would be like 60 to 70, though. Because um, this gives you decent damage bonuses, so I could see that. In which case, I need to make sure that I have this talent unlocked. And in theory, I would want to have Sheelan's Gift unlocked for much later. So I would go Energized Brew, probably. And... Celestial Harmony is just free healing, so probably that. Now, just to go over the rotation, the one thing I need to remember is... This is, yeah, Tiger Palm builds up your stack. So Teachings of the Monastery... I don't know if this would change with Feline Stomp. Um, this would be... Your Tiger Palm strikes twice. So... Once I get Awakened Feyline, whenever I am inside my Feyline, I would only need to Tiger Palm twice and then Blackout Kick to get Teachings of the Monastery. But normally, I will need to do three Tiger Palms, then Blackout Kick, and then it hits multiple targets. Um, or it hits multiple times, I mean. Strike up to an additional few times. And then within Feyline Stomp, 
that is what makes it hit multiple targets. So that's give that gives me some AOE, uh, at least on low targets. High targets, I will probably just want to spam a spinning crane kick because obviously that still deals a lot of damage if we're talking like five plus. And I guess within my cooldowns, it still gives me some healing. And it'll also probably trigger Resonant Fists quite a lot. So, I want to set up my Miss Weaver bars. Uh, I have Tiger's Lust still, so I can take that. Put that there. Uh, Shift Y. Drop a lot of this stuff off. Spell Harm. Uh, I will probably put Red Crane over there. Touch of Death will be Control 1. And Life Cocoon can be on E. Actually, yeah, Shift R is probably better for that. Put Dispel on F. Unless, oh yeah, I get Spear Hand Strike, I think, because I talented into it. In that case, yeah, put that there, put that there. I always put my racial on G. And transcendence. Transcendence transfer. Uh, what else do I need? So my main rotation is obviously going to be Tiger Palm into Blackout Kick, into Rising Sun Kick, into Spinning Crane Kick. As far as damage is concerned. For... Uh, healing... I should also put Ring of Peace where I normally have it. Dim Harm over there. Uh, I guess if I need to taunt, probably won't want to do that, but it could be situationally useful. Thunder Focus T, I'll put there. Mana T, I'll put Shift T. Revival, put E. Um... I think that's it. Reawaken is my AoE res. And I believe all of my buttons are now on my bars. The only question is, what do I do with Renewing Mist, Essence Font, and the other stuff? So, I think that probably works. Because I'm going to be getting a lot of my... Enveloping Mists for free, right? Because Life Cocoon does that. So I would want to Life Cocoon, throw Zen Pulse, and then just start spinning like that. And also, hold on, I need to fix something real quick. Options, add-ons, Jojo Monk, Dio. Yeah, okay, that's better. Uh, now it actually matches the character name. I'm actually curious to see how Miss Weaver performs damage-wise, because it definitely has potential, but I don't know. I feel like compared to like spamming Holy Nova on a priest, both like Holy and Disc, uh, obviously at low levels you can just spam Spinning Crane Kick and this carries you. But you could do that on Windwalker too. you could do that on Brewmaster too, mostly on Brewmaster, and it works just the same. Here, it's just, the scaling gets much less aggressive later on, so it becomes no longer really quite as worth it to do. Okay, let me switch over to... Just uh, double-checking something. The next character, so I did the Disc Priest, did the Monk, or at least check their builds. Now, the last two characters I'm going to set up before we start these runs are... My Holy Paladin, who is Speedwagon, this was actually, I think it was the third YouTube video I ever created back in 2020. I leveled up this character, this was a 1 to 50, no heirlooms, no special stuff at all speedrun. Just a complete fresh character, and it was miserable. Yes, the chest guy. Yeah, so you've seen that video, Kuan. I figure it was so long ago, and oh man, the editing and general video and audio quality was terrible back then, because I was just getting into uh, making videos, but yeah, this is that character. It has been pretty much untouched ever since. But now we can dust it off. Oh, I don't want 
extra buttons. Uh, passives. Passive. I just want to make sure that I stop getting spammed by the PvP talent thing. It doesn't actually matter. Uh, alright. So. Holy Paladin. Uh, Naomi said, lurking because doing keys. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little about your keybinds? What what do you want to know about my keybinds? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, if you have like specific questions about my keybind, um, keybinds, uh, plural. Like I've, uh, I guess maybe I assume the question is more like why do I put them the way I do, which to a certain degree is just personal preference. But there is a method to the madness. It was possibly my most entertaining video that you've watched. My descent into madness as I find a dozen chests. Yeah, it's one of those where. Something like that, if I had done that today, could have been more interesting, but I kind of, like, the way I edited it at the time, I think the run itself was fun. I, I was happy with the run, I was happy with, like, for the time, how it turned out, but I definitely, you know, I wasn't good at editing back then, so the video itself was rough, right? Uh, but I understand, you know, the content of it, I do agree, was pretty funny. It's one of those where if I had... I'm obviously not going to remake that video because not only is it really old, it's from Shadowlands, but also the audio and video are crap. But if I had a run similar to that, it could be fun to do now, but I would probably do the editing a lot tighter than that. I, I did something like that, a few things similar to that over the um, last few years. It's a little bit hit or miss in terms of how that stuff performs, though. Uh, definitely want to take Crusader Aura. For the Paladin Tree, I mean, I've also leveled a million Paladins, so most of this stuff shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. I'm going to take anything that's, you know, Divine Steed related. I'll even take uh, Passive Speed. And kind of same thing with... Um, same thing with the... Uh, Windwalker builds, we are going to be going with basically discount protection paladin. It's kind of what I'm aiming for here. So anything that gives me damage, which is going to be mostly the exact same thing. Echoing Blessings is good. Um, let's see. Uh, I won't actually be using... I don't think I'll be using Shit of the Righteous. At least not that much. We'll see. I kind of want to use... I want to pick up Crusader's Reprieve, but I'm not going to be taking Blessing of Protection. Like, there's really no use case for this in dungeons. I, I mean, at least in leveling dungeons, half the time. If I need to actually press Blessing of Protection, the pull is fucked anyway. Somebody probably overpulled, and we're just all dead. Uh, that could be useful, so I'll just take this. And what do I want to do for other stuff? I guess I have one spare point, so... Uh, free healing on Consecration, which I'll be pressing anyways. I'm definitely going to take Divine Toll. That much is a no-brainer. But the question is, what's the best way to get to it? And probably Divine Purpose, just because it's only one talent. And it's tough, though, because later on... I think Dawn and Dusk is probably not going to be quite as good, because it's a multiplier. Steel the Crusader also gives me no damage, interestingly enough, for, uh, Holy. Hmm. That's a tough call. Um, either way, I know I'm going for Divine Toll, so I think I honestly just do this, and then maybe even just, like, take two points in the Seal of Might. Uh, Shield of the Righteous doing 10% more damage is actually not terrible either. And maybe I don't even take these Capstones as Holy Paladin. Huh. Uh, did you start or are you reviewing things? And yeah, what Kuan said. So before I start, I'm basically... You have not missed the rest of Druid, no. I, I have gone through every single one of the specs, one by one, and talked about the build that I'm going to be using, like set up my bars, all that stuff. And then once I have reviewed every single spec, then we will be doing the runs back to back. So we're doing all the setup first, all the builds and discussing why I'm taking specific things. So Rest of Druid was, I think, the... I talked about my build at the start, but 
I will probably uh, do them in the same order, at least talking about like the different specs. So we'll be doing the rest of Druid Run first in a little bit. Uh, I think this is probably good. Yeah, we definitely going for Divine Toll. Um, Joel Ramirez said, the mystery that will be revealed in the end time... What? Is you can be a fantasy world class in real life. Joel, I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Um, it seems like a lot of keys also with more at the same time. Oh, I mean, obviously a lot of keys in terms of I need to have a bind for every single thing. I'm not going to click any of my buttons. The only thing I ever click is stuff that I don't need in combat. So, like, out of combat res, I will never bind. Because, you know, if I need to res somebody and there's no, like, pressing need, it doesn't matter if it takes me 0.5 seconds to click on my resurrection button. There's just no reason to have that bound. I also, you know, I don't play a healer, so I usually don't need to do that. But... Any button that I will at any point need to press within combat, that has a keybind because you need to make sure that, you know, in the heat of the moment, you're able to quickly press something. You're not looking for it on your bars and clicking it. Clicking is just bad. You should not be doing clicking if you want to improve at the game. Like if you're completely casual and you just enjoy clicking because it's easier, fine. Um, uh, let me just quickly answer a yes or no question in um, my Discord. There we go. Uh, like, in that case, yeah, totally fine, uh, if you want to click, but if for any sort of performance-oriented stuff, everything needs to be keybound. And obviously, there's only a certain amount of numbers, right? So there's one through zero, really, and it, honestly, by the time you get to, like, nine, my fingers are gonna have, like, a bit of a hard time hitting nine and zero. Usually, I only use zero for something that's, like, a party buff where I'm usually doing it out of combat, but sometimes in an emergency, I might need to buff somebody in combat. So in that case, I can quickly shift my fingers over to zero and press that. But as you start to get further out, like these are buttons that I'm not going to be pressing quite as much. Um, but then of course, because you only have a certain amount of you know space on your bars and buttons to actually press, uh, you use what are called modifiers, right? I also have things like QERT, which are very close. It's right below the numbers. QERT, FHYG, that's also very close. Like, so, um, like, what was it that they called when you were in, like, when you were five years old and you were in typing class, like, home row or whatever, where you have, like, your hands, like, on the, the right or the correct part of the keyboard and stuff? Basically, I have all of the buttons that I need to press in like a general centralized area on my keyboard. It's like right underneath the numbers. Any of these keybinds, if I need to hit one of those buttons, it's a very minor movement for my fingers to make. Just quickly go down from the buttons to hit that. And then I don't want to be pressing L or P as part of my rotation because that's way too far off. You know, right hand is for the mouse, left hand is for the keyboard. So, um... <laughs> Glad you're not home row. <laughs> Interesting uh, wordplay there. Um, but yeah, so then because I don't want to be using random buttons all the way in the opposite side of my keyboard, you use modifiers. So I have shift one. So if I hold down shift and press one, it activates my Minari training amulet. So that way, you know, with my, my little pinky finger, I can just hit shift and then the, uh, like my other fingers hit that button or I hit control. And then other stuff, so you can see here, I have stuff bound to 1, Shift 1, and Control 1. Now, these are not actual binds, this is just, it dumped my abilities in my bars. But normally I would have stuff bound here, I have some stuff bound to um, Control 1 on a few different specs. And then I have a few, the other thing about keybinds is a lot of times I have the same general ability types across different classes in the same binds. So my damage potion will always be on Control 5, no matter what I'm playing. My Bloodlust will usually be on Control 3 or 4, depending. Sometimes I think I have Dampen Harm on my Brewmaster Monk on Control 3. A Mobility ability will always be on Shift E. That way if I'm, like, in a pinch and playing a class I'm not familiar with, and I'm like, ah, I need to move fast, what button should I press to move fast? I instinctively, with my muscle memory, know Shift E. No matter what spec I'm on, this is Divine Steed, this is Death's Advance, this is Tiger's Lust. It is whatever the mobility thing is for my spec. Uh, Shift F similarly is usually a self heal for me. That way I always know it defaults to that. F is always my interrupt. I usually put uh, like crowd control abilities on HY, stuff like that. I always put racial ability on G, something like that. 
Uh, and then major cooldowns, I usually put QERT. That is all personal preference, right? I'm not saying you need to be putting your uh, like major cooldowns on QERT. It's just if I'm using my main damaging ability like Avenging Wrath, if I want to make sure that I have that like same muscle memory of when I'm pressing Avenging Wrath on um, Prop Paladin, if I'm playing my Blood DK, this is Dancing Rune Weapon. On Brewmaster, I forget what I have on R for Brewmaster, actually, off the top of my head. That might be my... This is either, I think it... No, Invoke his ally of somewhere else. One of these buttons, I think it's T, actually. I have Weapons of Order, and then Shift T is Exploding Keg. I have a Tiger Statue up here. Brewmaster has a few weird ones, though. Um... And yeah, so that's generally, I hope that answers most questions, if you have other specific things, but I think that's like a pretty good summary of it. Um, Klinloss, uh Sirdar said, Hi Herldin, not enough on your chat uh, through the last month, but a huge fan of your content. Hope you have, hope you get as much fun as you give. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoy the videos. Uh, you alternate between two bars of the button to the left of one, and you have a lot of utility stuff there. Yeah, I... Generally speaking, don't use the, um, I, I know what you're talking about. I actually, it's not bound right now, but, um, what usually I have shift mouse wheel bound to change bars. Uh, at some point, I guess I, my settings for that got changed. I don't use it for a lot of specs though. Usually I only do shift mouse wheel. I do that for like two different rotations. So I actually did that back when I was playing Miss Weaver. Uh, my Mistweaver bars, as we saw before, I am prioritizing damage and the healing stuff is an afterthought. But obviously, in max level content, the way that I played Mistweaver is I had two separate bars on the bottom, one for damage, one for healing. And if I was healing people, I would have my healing bar and then I would quickly shift mouse wheel up to switch to my damage bar whenever I needed to do damage or something like that. And that is how I handled it. So I have sometimes in rare cases used that second bar, but it is not very frequent. I also, um, obviously this doesn't apply to retail, but in classic, I use that bar for buffs. So in classic, all of my paladin buffs are on the second bar over here, blessing of might, blessing of wisdom, etc. So right before a pull, I just switch to that, apply all the buffs in order to the raid. Obviously pally power takes some of that, but then I just quickly switch back to my actual damage rotation. Um, didn't she used to use the second bar for speedrunning consumables? Uh, you're thinking, wh what we're talking about, Kuan, is if you hit the arrow here, it switches between, um, bars. I do use this second bar for speedrunning consumables, but this is, within the game, I believe this is referred to as bar three. Because this is bar one, bar two is the alternating one, bar three is the one actually above. And yes, you are correct, I do, I still use that for speedrunning consumables whenever I have them. Obviously, for max level stuff, I take that off. Um, the monk isn't played with a keyboard. Monk is played with a piano, especially Windwalker. I mean, hey, especially Brewmaster. Uh, more so than Windwalker, I'd say. But Windwalker definitely has a shit ton of keybinds, too. But yes, monk is very much a piano class. Um... Luke Land said, Hey man, hope you're having a good stream. We'll be watching the video later slash joining in when you can. Awesome. I'm glad you're tuning into the stream. Actually, you know what? That is, that's a good idea because I've, over the years, I've had a few different people ask me about keybinds. I think I'm going to add that to, um, let's see. Let me just add that to my, like, list of potential future videos. So, here, explain keybinds choices. That's the kind of thing, I'm not going to make that anytime soon, right? But it's like, if three months from now, I have absolutely no other pressing videos to record, I've covered all the topics on my schedule, and I'm like, I should make a video, that is the kind of thing where I'll pull up my list and be like, I can make a video explaining my keybind choices, because I think something like that, as like a long-term thing, that way whenever somebody asks, I can just be like, I have a video explaining that, so... Um, with how class homogenization is working, uh, um, with how class homogenization is working, almost all of your alts have the same button set up. Yeah. 
generally speaking, I can have it pretty similar. Healers are a little bit weird, but tanks and DPS tends to be pretty transferable. Uh, okay, so now back to um, you know, Negan said, you're at work right now and your boss caught you watching your screen in retaliation. He told you that you are the biological son of Hogger. Interesting. Um, I... Uh, glad to have you here, though, Negan, even if you are the biological son of Hogger. Uh, okay, so, Holy Paladin Talents. Let's grab this stuff. Uh, obviously, the main difference between, I, I did say before, Holy is basically Protection Light, but I do have Holy Shock, so that's something. And I will be mostly playing into things that are related to Holy Shock, because at least that is allowing me to do some damage, um... Uh, but I uh, can grab other stuff. So, oh, interesting. Aura Mastery. Aura Mastery Crusader Aura with Divine Steed would get me a big speed boost. That is some very weird tech, but I mean, hey, it could work. Uh, what do I want here? Not a lot of this is super impactful. Holy Shock's critical healing is increased. Okay, well, I'm definitely taking Holy Infusion. That is a no-brainer. That is That says, does more damage, so we take that. And... Is there any talent here that I will need to take? This is not useful... Not useful. Not useful. Okay. Uh, what about this? Glimmer of Light can affect five additional targets. Oh. Wait, so how does Glimmer work, then? Holy Shock leaves a Glimmer. When you Holy Shock, targets with Glimmer are damaged. Glimmer of Light's total damage is increased for each target affected. Huh. You may have Glimmer of Light on up to eight targets... Glimmer of Light is dispelled. Its effect is activated. Okay, that's... weird. Uh... Huh. Okay, well, I definitely don't want Blessed Focus, because that will probably mean I will be doing less damage overall. But Glimmer of Light affecting five additional targets. I guess when I get Divine Toll... I might be able to get, like, a ton of Holy Shocks. Maybe? I, the question is, like, this has a regular cap. Oh, this might actually be, you know what? I didn't even think of this. It might be counting. There are some weird things where if you reset your talents, it automatically counts that. So maybe that is actually what's happening here. Um, I'll take that just so I can access illumination easier that said you know what i'm gonna be taking glistening radiance anyways so hmm. let's just take this that's free healing okay we take this glimmer of light can affect five additional targets uh when empowered by infusion of light blah 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 no damage that could be good this deals damage to enemies Ooh. If the beam is aimed at an enemy, it deals damage and radiates healing. If the beam is aimed at a friendly target, it radiates damage. Okay, so this deals either single target healing and AoE damage, or single target damage and AoE healing. And this deals 121 damage to nearby enemies every 2 seconds for 14 seconds. So that's, what, like 850-ish damage? Uh, I don't know if there's a target cap on that. It says... It doesn't have, like, a target cap for enemies. It only, like, displays a target cap for allies. Huh. Um, this is a 20-second cooldown, though. I think Holy Prism might actually be better overall. What else? Ooh. Judgment has a chance to... Wait, the limit on Consecration? So this gives me free Consecrations? Okay, yeah, definitely. That is an easy pick. Uh, reduce cooldown on Aura Mastery? Sure. 
Shield the Righteous deals more damage to the first target hit. Every five Shields of the Righteouses make your next Word of Glory or whatever cost no Holy Power. Yep. Uh, Light of the Martyr. Self damage. Hmm. Right. Increased critical strike chance. Sure. Uh, this is effectively passive healing because this means that I don't need to worry about targets while they have glimmer. Uh, infusion of light. What is infusion of light? Consuming infusion of light reduces the cooldown on holy shock. I don't know what that is. I assume I'll be able to read that passive later though, but anything that reduces the CD and holy shock, that's probably going to be good. I'm not going to be using Glimmer as a healing spell, so that's kind of useless. Increases range of Light of Dawn could be good. Okay, now I want to see what are the damage talents in the bottom section. Are there any prereqs that I need to grab? Uh, Rest of Shaman had you adding more and more keypines to your bars, yeah. Uh, Divine Toll puts five Glimmers, and the node beneath it makes it hit three times over 15 seconds. Yeah, that makes sense, Delios. So in that case, I definitely want to be able to hit uh, up to whatever extra targets. Obviously, until I get Divine Toll, I don't think I'll be able to get a ton of benefit out of this, but Divine Toll is nuts, and I will be able to get it very soon, so this is probably worth it. Are you excited for the new expansion if the leaks turn out to be true, or are you rather disappointed? I have no opinion, to be honest. I... So, the the only leak at the moment that I actually think has a chance of being real, and some people will sit here and debate they think it's fake, I think it looks pretty real. I will be very surprised if it's fake. It is the most believable expansion leak that we've seen this early. So outside of literally the Dragonflight artwork getting leaked like a day or so before the announcement or whatever, this is the one that I believe the most. Uh, it, it, it looks pretty realistic. There is really not much that is um, up to... Uh, there, there is not much that is like up for debate. It, it is entirely possible that somebody took the existing confirmed quote unquote leaks, like Algarian Storm Rider and stuff like that, or the Blizzard design, and in a short period of time, they put together a really amazingly looking mock up of an expansion thing, pulling upon all of the things that we know are true about the next expansion, and they just elaborated on it and put in Avalorin and Kazalgar, which are two things that are already in the lore and we know about, it is possible. I'm not saying that, you know, it, it is 100% confirmed, but I'm going to be real. It, it's one of those things, simplest answer in many cases is the correct one. This is either the best leak we've, the best and most realistic leak we've ever seen, or it it's just an actual leak, right? And I think the biggest telling point for me is the leak is just, it, it's kind of mundane, right? That's not to say it's bad. That's why I have no strong opinion on it. We haven't really seen anything, which makes me believe it more. Because the thing that you see with a lot of fake leaks is they can't resist throwing in all of this unbelievable bullshit, like we're finally going to get ogres as a playable race, or we're going to be going to like some super secret void lord, whatever. And it, it's just like, it has no real connection to like it, what blizzard has been setting up and the leak that appeared on reddit not only fits with generally speaking the way that blizzard advertises the expansions it's pretty mundane and believable and there are multiple hints in game that point exactly towards that not like any super spectacular secret hints it's just yeah it's in a lore book somewhere we know that the algarian storm rider is a thing so it has to be something related to kazalgar that much we know so it's either going to be this exact leak, and this is real, or it is still a Kaz Algar related expansion, except Kaz Algar is something different, right? Like I've seen people saying, oh, it's going to be an underground expansion or whatever, where we unearth the sword of Silithus and, you know, Kaz Algar, you know, it's just there, right? Kaz Algar, actually, it's underground. There's no bearing in the lore for Kazalgar being some underground thing below Silithus, but people know that it's there, and they throw out these crazy speculations of, oh, we're finally going to deal with the Silithus sword. So, that stuff I don't believe, but then a generic, yeah, it's just some new dwarves and some fucking continent to the west of Azeroth, which has already been hinted at in lore books. Is it, like, amazingly 
cool story-wise or the thing that everybody's been wanting, which is Void Lords, finally, to, like, lay that shit to bed. No. Is it exactly the same type of thing that we have in Dragonflight? Yes. So it's probably real. <laughs> and I know people don't want to hear that answer because so many people are, like, people don't want to believe this leak because it is fairly mundane. But you know what? That's why it's the most believable leak. I don't know. I, I think it's stupid that so many people are trying to disprove this. Um, you were correct. Holy Shock is default by three. So eight is with the talent. Gotcha. Yeah, I kind of figured there were some weird things like that with the... Um, when you reset your talents, if you had something in there. So I had whatever the starting build is, and I'm guessing it used this talent, and that's why the tooltip is incorrect. So thank you for confirming that, Delios. You want new undeads? Yeah, like Lightforged Undead could be cool. Um, but yeah, I have no strong opinion on it. I've said before, I do not care about the World of Warcraft story anymore. I'm sorry, I just don't. Um, at this point, it is impossible for me to even remotely give a shit about whatever the writers have cooked up, because it's just nonsense. You know, it, it could be Void Lords, it could be Underground Beneath the Sword of Silithus, it could be generic Avalorian expansion. I personally do not think any of that will be interesting whatsoever from a story perspective. So I'm not concerned at all. And quite frankly, that is the only thing the leak has showed. It showed some new environments, cool. Showed some new races, cool. And we can presume it has some connection to the existing things that we know about Avalorian, Castlegar, blah, blah, blah. None of which I find interesting at all because it's written by the current WoW story team. So I do not care. To me, what matters is what we hear about the gameplay. That is the only thing I give a shit about. And the leaks that I've seen that are believable say nothing about the gameplay. They just talk about the story and whatever. So I have no idea what to expect. Um, if they tell us we're getting another Dragonflight type expansion where we get like, you know, some more talents, no major borrowed power, um, you know, there's no major grinds and they're not overhauling anything stupid for the sake of overhauling something. And we're just getting a normal expansion with new dungeons and new raids and whatever. Cool. That's all I really want. Right. My biggest complaint from Blizzard for a while is that they keep trying to reinvent wheels that do not need to be reinvented. They're just like, what if we completely rework the system that everybody loves and made it into a pile of fucking trash? And they did that all throughout BFA, all throughout Shadowlands, and it sucked. And Dragonflight, they finally said, okay, we'll stop doing that. And guess what? The game's better for it. That's all I want. I just want the, a game to, or I want the game to be fun to play and not fucking tedious, right? Um, so if they do that, I'm fine with it. The only thing at the moment, like, I, I personally, I think Blizzard will be smart enough to do that because, I mean, Dragonflight has gotten a good reception. Now, there's, like, speculation on maybe it's not selling as well, maybe player numbers are down, I don't know. Blizzard doesn't publicly reveal that. You can make speculation on it all you want. All I know for sure, and this is something I think everybody will agree on, is Dragonflight at least has gotten positive reception. And while I have said before I think it is a pretty mid-expansion, I, I don't dislike Dragonflight, I'm still playing it. I still can find fun in Dragonflight, but I do strongly challenge the opinions of people saying that it is as good as like mop or legion or something like that i think those expansions were more fun dragonflight is still good but it is nothing revolutionary groundbreaking it is it's just fine right uh but i'm perfectly okay with that because there hasn't really been a point in dragonflight where i have been actively disliking the game there have been times where i've been slightly bored of world of warcraft and i've started playing classic a lot more or I started playing other games a lot more, and then I came back for the new raid tier, and it didn't tell me to grind anything bullshit, and uh, I was kind of fine with that. So I would much rather be mildly bored of World of Warcraft at certain points than actively despise the game, which I did at numerous points within Shadowlands and BFA. So that's really all I want. Um, as long as they don't fuck up anything tremendously or say anything really concerning with the new announcement, I will probably be kind of fine with it. Uh, the other thing I am honestly more so concerned about is what their plans are for the rest of this expansion. Because obviously there's a lot of concern that they are planning to cut it short and not give us a patch 10.3. I initially was skeptical on that, but I have been definitely swayed more to the side of maybe they are actually going to cut this expansion short. And that concerns me because I think it will be very, very bad and very, very stupid if they do that without a good reason. Um... Because, you know, the, like I said, this expansion, it's not bad. Overall, it's, it's good. 
but it hasn't really done anything spectacular yet. It hasn't really impressed me at all. And I feel especially just cutting it off way before the traditional end of an expansion without any outstanding circumstances like, oh, I don't know, COVID. And like WAD, obviously we all kind of accept that WAD was a bit of a weird situation. Blizzard has said, you know, they were, obviously Legion was amazing, right? And we accepted that WAD got cut short because Legion was really, 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 really good. And they said they were, you know, t trying out a new team and a lot of the people had some onboarding issues. Okay, sure. Not to mention WAD, I've said this before, was a fun expansion. It may not be a good expansion. It had barely any content, right? But it was fun. You know, it, there were wasn't a ton of content, but the content that you had to play through was amazing. I loved WAD because I did challenge modes. I did raids and I had a lot of fun with that. So it was kind of an expansion where you either just were bored of it and you stopped playing or you were like me and you really enjoyed the content and you played WAD more than like a lot of other expansions. Um, and I, like I said before, I would rather have periods of time where even in wad yeah i was bored every now and then but then i just stopped playing played something else and then like when tanan jungle came out i played more again did more challenge modes so i would much rather the expansion be lacking content a little bit and be slightly boring than actively bad and terrible like shadowlands and bfa so i actually enjoyed wad um but i think you can accept that being cut short shadowlands was of course the worst expansion ever made it's not even close and that was partially because it was shorter than a regular expansion, but also because the content within it was absolutely terrible. And now I get that they made a lot of really poor design decisions, kind, kind of coming off BFA and Legion. They were very arrogant. They didn't understand what the player base actually wanted, and they refused to listen to feedback until it was too late. And now they are finally listening to feedback in Dragonflight. Cool. Um, but Shadowlands, of course, suffered because of that. And of course, COVID-19 hurt their development cycle, blah, 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 blah. So it makes sense why those two expansions got cut short. Wad, I don't even really fully blame them because it was still fun. Shadowlands obviously was a complete disaster, but you get it. It happens as long as they learn their lesson and bounce back from that. Cool. Seems like they mostly have within Dragonflight. So I've seen people trying to cite those two expansions as examples of why it is okay for them to not make a 10.3 and that is complete horseshit it is not okay to just not do 10.3 because they did it before in what is widely considered to be the two worst expansions ever <laughs> that is not an argument to make oh well if the expansions that were widely widely regarded as the worst ever and nearly killing world of warcraft they also didn't do a final patch great yeah okay so are you saying that dragonflight is going to potentially kill world of warcraft again and Admittedly, it has had nowhere near as troubled a development cycle, as far as I know, compared to the other stuff, so I don't think it would have nearly as bad of an impact, but it would still be a really bad look if they cut Dragonflight short. Now, personally, I do not think they will. I am at least mentioning this because it is a popular topic of discussion. I personally feel that what they will end up doing is we will still get a 10.3. The main thing that kind of swayed me and a lot of other people is the Augment Rune, but also there's technically nothing about the Augment Rune that says they can't add it this patch, right? Who's to say they don't add it this patch and then we just have it to use next patch too, right? Um, there are a few other arguments that in a vacuum I don't find very convincing. It is a little bit hard to ignore it when all of it is put side by side, but I do think there has been no smoking gun that has absolutely 100% confirmed, yes, there will not be a patch 10.3. Blizzard has not really given a definitive answer. So while I think right now there is a strong possibility, they have not yet confirmed it. So we are still very much in a world where we could get a patch 10.3. And I hope we do. And I think especially it is more possible now than in other expansions, given how fast Blizzard's patch cadence has been. Because they are already updating the PTR for patch 10.2.5. So presumably, let's look at like a hypothetical schedule, right? Patch 10.2.5 comes out in, I don't know, let's say January, February. And with their usual pace, I would say maybe a patch 10.3 could come out in um, like May, June or something like that. And then we get like a 10.3.5 a in August or September, and we get like a Christmas release for the next expansion. That would actually track pretty well 
with what Blizzard has done in the past. The only thing that people are a little bit skeptical on is, well, last uh, patch they did um, 10.2.5 or whatever it was, which brought Season 4. And in Season 4 of Shadowlands, we had uh, not a new raid tier, but obviously the whole like recycling raids and stuff like that. And I've seen people thinking that that is going to be the norm. And initially, I thought that would be the norm as well. I thought what they do is, you know, three major content patches and then a bonus end of the expansion season where they cycle through Vault of the Incarnates, um, Aberus, etc. But honestly, you don't really need to have that because that was very much a testing ground for like bringing back the old dungeons and stuff like that anyways. Honestly, the raids were not super well received. Most people I know hated Faded Raids and thought it was absolutely miserable. Uh, people liked the new dungeons, and they carried that over into Dragonflight with the whole dungeon rotation, which they've been doing instead of, you know, the regular stuff. So that has been going on throughout the entire expansion. The only thing new we might get is a faded raid season like we had in Shadowlands. But also, if we have a really good patch cadence and we have the full amount of content in a regular expansion, who's to say they just don't do a faded season? And if they don't do a faded season then actually there is more than enough time to have a patch 10.3 before the next expansion. Uh, hell, they could even do an accelerated faded season for like a month or two right at the end before the new expansion as just a way to, you know, kind of hype up, you know, the end of Dragonflight. Like, you know, it's the last two months, go all out, you know, uh, get your, like all your portals and whatever. And I don't even think you need a full entire patch's worth of time for that. And... I really don't think there is any chance that the patch releases before at least, like, September of next year. That is, like, the most aggressive release date you could possibly have. More realistically, it'll probably be out around Christmas, because obviously that is when Blizzard usually tries to launch expansions. Like, if we look at, um, let's see, Dragonflight launch date was November 28th. You know, right around end of November, uh, start of December for Christmas sales. Uh, Shadowlands launch date. I already know this, but I'm just doing it for effect. November 23rd, almost the exact same time. Battle for Azeroth launch date. That one was actually August 14th. So BFA um, launched fairly early compared to other stuff. Uh, I think Legion actually launched a little bit early. Legion launch date was also, I believe, August or... Oh, Legion... Warcraft Legion launch date. August 29th. Yeah, late August... Um, I, I, the more you get Warlords of Draenor, that was November, though. Warlords of Draenor release date was November 13th. Um, Mists of Pandaria, I think that was at a weird time. Release date was September 25th. So, most WoW expansions in recent time have launched either late August, early September, or late November, early December. So it is one of those two brackets, right? But no matter how you slice it, it is going to come out around one of those times, and there's still more than enough time for a full content patch in the middle of all that stuff. The only difference, I think, is if they go for a September release, we would be jumping right from the final raid tier into the new expansion. If they go for a December release, there would actually probably be enough time to do an accelerated faded season before the release of the new expansion. So, personally, I believe that both of those are possibilities, but there is, of course, a chance that Blizzard just completely cuts that short. And we just don't get a final patch at all, which, in my opinion, would make absolutely no sense. But I, I think um, that is, like, the main thing I am curious to hear from BlizzCon. Not so much the expansion, because the expansion is going to be whatever. They're going to show us new zones, show us new whatever. And the reality of new expansion announcements is we are going to get very little meat of what we are actually expecting until much later. Because... Think back to, like, all of the other expansion announcements. In Shadowlands, all they said was Covenants. Nobody really knew what it meant, just that you would be able to join a Covenant with one of these, uh, like, random undead factions we've never seen before. And they didn't really tell us more about what that was, and, and people didn't see the problems with it until much later when we started testing it on Alpha and Beta. Same with um, Battle for Azeroth. They said Island Expeditions ended up being a terrible feature. Warfronts ended up being a terrible terrible feature. Allied Races, fine, but honestly kind of lackluster compared to what they were advertised as. So a lot of the expansion stuff, it's like, ooh, ah, and then I'm like, I'll just wait for the blog posts in like a month or two to elaborate more on what to actually expect from this content. Even Dragon Riding, like I, 
I was very reserved in my opinions on dragon riding until I saw more, and I was pleasantly surprised in many cases, but uh, you don't really see a lot from all that stuff. So, like I said, mostly curious to hear about the next patch, not so much the new expansion. Anyways, um, let me read the messages I missed. Every time, or every glimmer deals damage or healing every time you plush, press shock. Yeah, that much I know. Um, you're back. You watched my leveling video on four times speed. Your question is, what classes are fun to tank with? Other than DK or Druid, since you have level, level 70s of both. Honestly, I like all tanks. My least favorite tank is actually DK, which you said you already have. Um, so yeah, I, I would actually say my favorite tanks are the ones you haven't played yet. Uh, I would say avoid Vengeance Demon Hunter right now because the rework is going to make it absolutely dog shit. But whenever Vengeance is fun, I enjoy it. It's unfortunate that Blizzard doesn't let it be fun at very many times, which uh, is not great. Uh, you want new undead? Yeah, that would be... Uh, you want your... You want to fix your undead warlocks back. Upright undead. Yeah, that would be cool. You'll be honest, Dragonflight had way too much traveling around. You know the whole dragon flying is the whole gimmick, but still it was really boring. I honestly don't feel it had that much more than previous expansions. I think the only difference is now you were expected to travel places on your own, whereas a lot of other expansions had a lot of traveling, but on forced roleplay things. So, I mean, think back to the amount of times you got picked up by, like, a Kyrian and Bastion, or Revendreth, you had to, like, ride that stupid carriage, or, like, around to different little subzones, or you'd get picked up by the little flying gargoyle dudes, or uh, Ardenweald. There were there were so many times in Ardenweald where you had to, like, follow, like, the procession with Ysera's seed down, like, one of the main roads, and, like, BFA, uh, the whole Dolly and Dot are my best friends, you had to ride on the, you know, carriage all over the place... There's a lot of, like, forced transportation in the main stories in a lot of older expansions, whereas I think they didn't do that quite as much in Dragonflight because you were just expected to fly around on your own. In fact, the only thing that I can really think of right now is the Major Domo Solistra RP flight and the Sendrax escort quests at the start, all of which come directly before you get dragon riding. Pretty much everything after that, it's just go to this position on your mount, and then you can turn in that stuff. And honestly, I think that's much better, because I hate stuff that I can't skip. I hate when I have to sit in the stupid slow RP flight, and I have, like, faster ways to get there on my own. So that is actually one of the only things I like about dragon riding, you know, in terms of how it interacts with the story. The mobility around the zones feels a lot tighter in, like, a speedrunning context, because you are purely in control of the movement. You don't need to wait on any, like, forced RP stuff. Uh, you feel like Dragonflight didn't get negative reception, which is a positive for the game. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you quite enjoyed Shadowlands for what it was. It was entertaining. I mean, so I, mind you, I played BFA. I played Shadowlands. I played WAD, right? Yeah, WAD had very good rating. Exactly. Um, WAD, th that's why I will always put WAD ahead of, definitely ahead of Shadowlands. I think BFA... I would almost tie BFA and WAD. I think overall BFA was a worse expansion in terms of like how it felt to play, but the highs of BFA were probably higher than the highs of WAD. But while WAD was lacking content, I think overall the feel to play it throughout the entire thing was still good. It's a little bit boring at the start, but the raids were really strong, much stronger than the BFA raids, I feel. Challenge modes were amazing. Uh, BFA dungeons were fucking awful, especially in the context of it. I understand people liked individual BFA dungeons, but running Mythic Plus in BFA was a chore because of the seasonal affixes were most of the time terrible, except for Nihilotha, which is why BFA is like Nihilotha as a whole patch hard carries that expansion. And when so many people talk about, oh, BFA was good because Nihilotha fixed XYZ thing. And if you came back in Nihilotha, and you only played BFA and Nihilotha, it probably would have seemed like a pretty good expansion. But as somebody who played every single patch in BFA a lot, I played the entire way through. The only raid I didn't finish was Ashara's Eternal Palace, but I played that patch like extensively within the first three weeks before I'm like, this is garbage, and I dropped it. But I still played it more than enough to know the raid. I got, you know, AOTC, I got the first few Mythic bosses, did a decent amount of Mythic Plus, I did, like, basically I 100%ed Nashatar. I grinded the shit out of that. Um, so, I am familiar with every patch of BFA and how it played at the time. And BFA felt horrible. 
for its entire life cycle up until Nashatar, or uh, up until Nihilotha, at which point they did a massive turnaround and then went back in most of that in Shadowlands, which also kind of sours it for me. Um, if they had learned their lesson in Nihilotha and Shadowlands was good, then maybe it would have been different, but Shadowlands was terrible. Uh, and Shadowlands, kind of by contrast, was only really good in season four sepulcher like patch 9.2 improved some stuff but not everything a lot of things were still really really not great and i did not have a lot of fun in early sepulcher luckily that transition period into season four actually didn't last for that long because sepulcher was a very rushed raid and credit where to do as a raid sepulcher was my personal favorite of Shadowlands. Nathria was good, but I enjoyed Sepulchre as a whole more, and it had Halandris, which was my favorite boss of the expansion, so I liked Serith Mortis, and I liked the raid, but the expansion was still not in an amazing spot, even though it had some changes, like, you know, you could switch covenants and some stuff, but it, Shadowlands didn't become an okay, in my opinion, expansion until Season 4, at which point, yeah, End of Shadowlands, actually pretty fun. I actually think I enjoyed Season 4 of Shadowlands more than I did Nihilotha patch in BFA. Because Corruptions were still a bitch and a half to manage, and they ruined tanks because Twilight Devastation was fucking stupid. But I think I had more fun in Season 4 of Shadowlands, even though Nihilotha had a lot going for it. Um, but I don't know. I still think both expansions overall. I had less fun across the entirety of it, like averaged out compared to how I did in BFA. BFA... I was doing Blackrock Foundry, doing High Mall, doing Hellfire Citadel. I enjoyed all three raids, um, playing primarily with like my group of friends who unfortunately largely quit in Legion. Um, so I was having a lot of fun playing with, you know, a lot of my friends that I'd known for the entirety of the game. I'm still, you know, I still have friends now and I, I, I enjoy the people I play with, to be clear. But it, it is like it has a place of nostalgia for me because WAD was kind of the last time that I played with like my main friend group that I had from like Cataclysm up to mid Legion and mid Legion is when a lot of my friends either like burnt out on the game and stopped playing it quite as much or, you know, moved on because of life stuff. And since then I've kind of been like bouncing around from guild to guild and I've made a lot of really good new friends, but it's been, it's been definitely a journey ever since the end of uh wad for me. So that like, I, I really had a lot of fun there playing with uh, those friends kind of for the last time ever since um and challenge modes were a blast i love doing challenge modes so that was a highlight for me i, I really had fun in wad anyways talked about that a lot uh class design in wad was amazing yeah it, infinitely better than legion and onwards there were individual points where i think like certain class designs have been good class design in dragonflight is honestly in my opinion a lot stronger than in the last few expansions uh the only class design that i liked more in legion than in dragonflight is uh vengeance demon hunter vengeance peaked in legion and it's been downhill ever since and like in terms of how it felt to play it's been stronger but it has still felt like shit to play compared to the legion version legion vengeance demon hunter was fucking art i loved it it was amazing uh it's been garbage ever since um avarice was the closest we came to a return to that and now they are gutting it again because they don't know what the fuck they want to do with the spec but i'm not going to complain about that for the 20th time uh but yeah wad class design was amazing wad brewmaster well chef's kiss wad blood decay was the only time in the last however many years that blood decay has actually felt good to play blood decay is a dog shit fucking tank right now I will probably have to play it at least a little bit this ex or this tier and i'm not really looking forward to it it could be worse. I'm looking forward to it at least a little bit more than I was in Shadowlands, but man, I fucking hate modern Blood Decay. Wad Blood Decay was the last time that spec actually felt good. Um, Wad Blood Decay was breath. I assume you meant to type uh, Blood Decay there, Jesper, because but yes, Wad Blood Decay is when they had Breath of Sindragosa. I mean, honestly, Breath of Sindragosa build was amazing. Like that felt so good to play. But even without Breath of Sindragosa, like just traditional Blood Decay without Breath of Sindragosa build felt amazing in Missa Pandaria and Wad. Easily the best that that spec has ever felt to play. God, it was so good. I mained Blood Decay back then, and I loved it. I absolutely loved Blood Decay, the way it played in Mop and Wad. And then in Legion, they just said fucking Bone Shield. Uh, yeah, oh, you did mean Frost Decay. I mean, Frost Decay has always had Breath of Sindragosa. 
that was the problem. Like, yeah, Breath of Sinjagosa was good for both Frost and Blood back then. It, Legion is when they made Breath of Sinjagosa only for Frost DKs, and Frost has run it on and off ever since. Sometimes it's not meta, but... Um, the main thing that I liked is Blood DK also had Breath of Sinjagosa, and I thought that the Blood Breath or Breath of Sinjagosa build was infinitely more fun than even the DPS specs. I loved Blood DK Breath of Sinjagosa build. It was so good. I just, I don't understand why they don't bring that back, because I have yet to talk to a Blood DK that, who played actively during that era of WoW, who doesn't agree with me that it was infinitely better. Like, I've talked to people who don't agree with me that Blood DK is horrible right now. I think it feels like ass to play. I've talked to people who are like, I loved Blood DK back then, but I don't mind it now. And that's a fair opinion. But I don't know of a single person who was like, yeah, Breath of Sinjagosa, Death Strike scaling off attack power? That, that was garbage. I Bring me more Bone Shield synergy. Like, fucking stacking up charges and then just getting, like, passive cost reductions. Ugh. Just talking about modern Blood DK, just so disgusting. Feels terrible. Um, You missed BFA because you could print gold. Fair enough. Uh, you'll get so much flack for this. Dragonflight and BFA are not as good as Shadowlands. Um, I mean, like that. Yeah, that's just a wrong opinion. It's fine. You're you're welcome to have your own opinion, but it is wrong. Um, I I mean I I'm not gonna say that I think the questing experience and all of them was kind of mid. So I I don't really think you can judge the entire expansion just by the questing experience. But uh, definitely, if we're talking the expansion as a whole. That is wrong. <laughs> um, you want Frost DK to have a blit be at least equal or preferably better than Breath. Yeah, I know a lot of Frost DKs who share that opinion, for sure. Uh, people are no longer forced into BFA, Jason the Man. They uh, changed that recently. Uh, now you can play in whatever expansion you want, even on fresh accounts. So, yeah, that is... I will agree with you, right? Forcing people into BFA was a terrible decision that they never should have made, but they have actually gone back on that decision, thankfully. So, you know, um, there's something. It's better than nothing. Uh, hold up. Let me let me just finish at least getting my Holy Paladin stuff set up so I can... Like, a lot of this discussion we can also have within the run itself. Uh, what do I want... Reclamation seems like it would be good damage. So, yeah, definitely having more more healing or damage, but that's going to be damage in most cases. Uh, your Holy Shock, blah, blah, blah. Extend the duration of Tears Deliverance on yourself. Probably not really great. Uh, Relentless Inquisitor gives me some damage stuff. This is... I guess this is, my damage gives me free healing, so that's not horrible. Oh, but I definitely take this. Avenging Wrath might. I think. Increases Judgment, Crusader, Strike, and Auto Attack damage. Wait, so I either get 15% crit or 30%. Okay, I definitely take Avenging Crusader then. That's just better? Pretty sure. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I just take that. Uh, Blessing of Summer is probably good, actually. Just because it gives me damage. Reducing Holy Shock's cooldown. Okay, well, I def I almost certainly take this unless it Awakening is broken. Your next judgment will deal damage. We'll always... Wait, okay, that that's actually really good, too. Hold up. Uh, both of these are strong. So I either get a 20% Holy Shock CDR, or my spenders give me Awakening, and then I get free Avenging Wrath, which then gives me more damage with Avenging Crusader. Actually, there's a lot of good shit here, huh? Uh, Hammer of Wrath heals. Eh. Crusader Strike reducing the cooldown on Holy Shock is really good. And Holy Shack is a chance to refund a charge. That's good, too. Your next... Fucking hell. Your next three Holy Shocks cast two additional times. There's actually a lot of pretty good options. Uh, the problem is, this stuff doesn't give me any damage. 
So I would have to spend two points to get Rising Sunlight, which is not bad. And Crusader's Might, while not terrible, would require me to take Hammer of Wrath Heals Me. Oh, but actually, wait, that resets... Okay, never mind. Veneration is good. I didn't notice the reset the cooldown. Uh, you don't have to play BFA anymore. You're going to make a monk? Yeah. You can follow my regular route, no matter whether you're a new player or not. It's really, really nice. Okay, I think, in this case, I need to spend three more points. I'll take Tower of Radiance, Commanding Light, and... Probably Overflowing Light, just because that's Glimmer value. And then I'm going to go with Avenging Crusader, Blessing of Summer, Awakening, Glorious Dawn, Veneration, Crusader's Might. Focus on that. And then, I mean, later on at higher levels, you could always take um, Reclamation. Reclamation could be good, but I feel like the other stuff will translate to more damage. And then, I don't know if you'd have the talent points to grab Rising Sunlight on top of all of that, but... Uh, at least for leveling, this would give you the most damage. So let's see how I'm going to organize my bars based on this. Uh, oh, the only new ability I got was Holy Prism, and I can take off some utility stuff. Let's see if my bars are missing anything, though. Um, Intercession, that's my combat res, so I'll put that there. End of Reckoning Taunt, probably won't need it, but can't hurt uh where's my aoe res would be a, oh under holy that is absolution there we go uh sense undead doesn't give me any damage word of glory right there judgment that on two um H. Oh, which one should I put? You know what? I'm actually going to put that there. Kick. Uh, flash heal or Beacon of Light, I'll put on G. Uh, actually, never mind. Will to survive, I'll put there. I normally put racial in there, but that's going to be more impactful. Shift R. It's fine. Is this the first spec you're testing? Uh, yes and no. The Before we start any of the runs, I'm setting up every single healing spec and discussing the build that I'll be running and all that stuff. And then after I've done or finished basically setting up everything and explaining my build, then I will be starting the actual runs. We'll just be doing them back to back to back. Uh, this is the second to last spec I'll be setting up. I still need to set up Resto Shaman, and then I'll actually be starting with Resto Druid for the actual leveling process, which will be soon-ish. Uh, what else do I need? I think I have most of my buttons on my bars. Oh, I'm missing Aura Mastery. I forgot about that stuff. Uh, Divine Protection. I also don't have Shield of the Righteous. So that I should be doing. It's actually, yeah, put that there. That all seems good. And... Yeah, Shield of the Righteous I'll probably be using. This is like a Holy Power Spender. So I'll take a look once I've gotten everything. Oh, I also don't have Holy Prism. There, I can put that on T. So I think on, on boss fights, pure single target, I use this on the enemy. On AoE, I use this on the tank. And I heal them and splash damage. Yeah, Shield of the Righteous is the damage vendor. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I think that's everything. As far as... I'm actually yeah, I'm going to switch that around. That makes more sense. And then Mastery Lightbringer is the closer you are, so I want to be in melee. I do more healing. Uh, okay, I think that is everything that I want to put on my bars. And then Divine Toll, I'll put on Shift-T when I get that. Am I getting any other abilities? 
I don't believe so. Because I think Avenging Crusader just buffs Avenging Wrath. Oh yeah, Blessing of Summer. I'll be picking that up. That's a new ability. Blessing of Summer I can put on Control T. Divine Till I put on Shift T. And that should be the only new abilities I get. And I have very easy to place spots for them. There's a talent that makes your mastery work with Beacon. Yeah. I remember that being a thing, generally. Um... Honestly, I think I'm going to put Beacon on myself, just to make it easier, because I will... Any, like, main heals, I'll just be targeting the tank with, and that way I just don't need to worry about self-healing. And I should be able to just passively keep myself alive, and I can just focus on keeping everybody else alive. And general rotation, obviously, uh, Aura Mastery right now is going to be a... I'm actually going to switch this around, because this is more of a utility spell. Um, this is Aura Mastery... I can buff Devo Aura, so this would make it give the raid 15 or Raider Party 15% damage reduction. Uh, I wonder what it does for Ret Aura. Increases healing received. Interesting. Uh, I'm mostly going to be using Aura Mastery actually with Crusader Aura. So I do this, and then I just get a really fast horse for the duration of Divine Steed. And honestly, that is going to be the best use case for it, at least within the context of like leveling up a character. Not meaning to backseat you have some experience with Paladin healing? Yeah, I appreciate it. The only thing is, like, leveling a healer in dungeons is going to be different than, like, endgame. Just because, as you can see, we are building for damage. That is just kind of what you prioritize at lower levels, so it's a little bit weird. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that is basically everything that I will need. Uh, Avenging Wrath obviously used this as a damage cooldown, nothing changes there. I already explained how many be using Holy Prism. For healing, if I need healing emergency in a pinch, I have Flash Heal, Holy Light, I have Word of Glory on a single target. I probably won't need that, I'll have enough single target healing. And Light of Dawn if I need, like, emergency spender, um, AoE healing. But generally speaking, these are my generators, so... Uh, judgment deals more damage, so I definitely want to be using this as much as possible, even though it only generates one Holy Power. I want to keep uh, Crusader Strike and this on cooldown. Holy Shock is definitely the biggest one, also a generator, and it has like all the Glimmer synergy, so I'll be making sure this is always recharging, then prioritizing Judgment over Crusader Strike, and then spending most of my Holy Power with Shield of the Righteous to just do damage. It doesn't do a ton, but it is AoE. And it'll also mean Crusader Strike comes back up, which then, you know, feedback loop. And then, of course, keep up Consecration. And an AoE Hammer of Wrath will do, uh, yeah, more damage than Judgment, it looks like. Oh, I actually misread that. Crusader Strike does more damage. Uh, I was looking at the preventing damage dealt by the target. Okay, so then Crusader Strike's definitely cryo then. Uh, that seems pretty straightforward, though. Just generate... Build up Glimmers. When I get a Divine Toll, obviously press Divine Toll on cooldown, and it does big damage and healing, and then gives me a bunch of free Glimmers. Uh, okay, so swapping over to Resto Shaman for the final uh, setup. Also, usual stream reminder that, you know, if you're enjoying the stream or you enjoy, like, my videos in general, I'd appreciate it if you could like this video, as that always helps with algorithm-related stuff. So would definitely appreciate it. Uh, if anybody is able to do that, if you have not done so already. So Resto Shaman is another one that I've already done some runs with, so most of this should be familiar. I think the only the only healing specs that I've actually done like partial speed runs on is Resto Shaman and Holy Priest, I believe, unless I'm forgetting something. I think just those two, yeah. Because everything else, it's like you have either a tank spec or... So I think everything else, yeah, it literally is you just have a tank spec, so there's no reason to level as a healer. Uh, but those two, obviously, there's no shaman tank, unfortunately, and there's definitely no priest tank, so gotta work with what we have. So, talent builds. Uh, I don't remember exactly what I ran the last time, but I'm sure it won't take me too long to figure it out. Uh, increases all damage you deal. Kick, we're definitely gonna need. Um... I'm definitely going to want Chain Lightning, obviously. Each stack of Maelstrom Weapon reduces the cast time of your next damage or healing spell. Yep, that's obviously good. Uh, Flurry, I don't really think I'm going to be hitting things with my staff, so that's probably not super important. Imagine if Avenger, Avenger Shield took your Shield Transmog, you'd use Bulwark of Azanoth just for that. Yeah, that would be sick. 
Uh, I don't remember if I need Frost Shock for the damage rotation. For now, I'm not going to take it. I can always change that. Um, interesting. So you have regular Purge, and then you hit two of them, but it has a 12-second cooldown. Uh, I don't think I want to take any of these for dungeons unless I have spare points. Definitely want Astral Shift. Um... Thunderous Pause. Huh, that's actually neat. I don't remember if I had that when I did Shaman last time. Might have been a minor tweak. Uh, and let's see. I'd rather have more damage reduction, especially for dungeons, than more frequent usage. Because if I need to press Astral Shift in a dungeon, it's probably, you know, shit's hit in the fan. Definitely Nature's Fury, two points. Definitely wins a Valak here, two points. Uh, Spirit Walk, no brainer. Hmm. Ancestral Defense seems good. Windrush Totem is more mobility. Emergency Healing. That's a knockback. Totemic Focus is good. And are there any other good damage options that I'm missing? Technically, I'm not really going to be using Lightning Shield, so this doesn't actually matter. Uh... Hold up. Let me, let me take two points out of Totemic Focus, because that's not super important. What am I going to be running for the bottom section here? What gives me damage? Uh, not seeing anything. Lightning Lasso. Oh, that is really huge. I definitely need that, which means I am forced to take Thunderstorm. Okay, I did not realize Lightning Lasso was... Has this always been on the class tree, or is this new? I could have sworn this was not here. Maybe I just didn't look into it for Resto Shaman, because we only did Resto up to level 30 anyway. The Lightning Lasso is massive. I know it used to be a PvP talent. I'm asking if it if it is recently added to the class tree. Has this always been here since the start of Dragonflight, or is this a new thing that you can now pick up Lightning Lasso? Because that's nuts. I don't remember that being a thing, but I maybe just missed it. That's been there forever? Interesting. Yeah, I did not know about that. Hmm... Uh, you believe since the start of 10.0. Gotcha. That's definitely pretty cool then. Everything else in the bottom section is kind of whatever. Um, ancestral Guidance is like... Nice, I guess, but not super important. I guess Graceful Spirit will kind of help, so what can I take for that? Uh, I need to path down here. Is there anything I can drop? Hmm. I guess I would have to drop something up here. I can drop um, Astral Shift CDR so that I can take Elemental Warding Spirit Walker's Grace, and then I would take Lightning Lasso. It's actually really nice as a pickup. Hmm. Okay, and after this, I'm just going to take Ancestral Guidance, I will take Graceful Spirit, and uh, probably Nature's... Oh no, after... Yeah, I'll take Ancestral Guidance, then I will take Go With The Flow, and then I will take Graceful Spirit, and then I will take Nature's Swiftness, and I think that will cover everything. If not, I just, I don't know, take like Totemic Surge, or whatever. Some passive effect that just gives me generic benefits uh stormkeeper i definitely take uh acid rain no brainer anything that buffs healing rain now is effectively a damage buff any of this stuff good at all 
Targets you heal gain 10% increased health. This is... Oh. Okay, well, I... Ugh, crap. In that case, I kind of need to go down here for Master of the Elements. So I definitely need Healing Stream Totem, Tidal Waves. And do I need this stuff? Cloudburst Totem. Um... Summons a totem that collects all power from your healing spells, blah blah blah. Imbue your weapon, your stuff has a chance to heal, additional, whatever. Uh, so, picking either of these points doesn't make a difference. Consuming tidal waves reduces the cooldown of your healing stream, cloudburst, manatide, and poison cleansing totems, or reduces the cast time of your next heal. Oh, wait, this is... never mind. This is one point, so I take that just because it's a talent I get to use later. Definitely take Master of the Elements, that's damage. Grants Mana Regen. This is... Chain Heal bounces an additional time. Both of these make Chain Heal bounce an additional time. Consuming Riptide. Riptide's my hot. Uh, okay, Healing Wave, Healing Search, Chain Heal, or Reptide. Yeah, I don't need that. Your Direct Heal Criticals. Refund a percentage of your maximum mana. Spirit Link Totem is not really going to be great. Oh, fucking Christ. But it's required to take Lava Surge. So... Um... In that case, it is actually more cost-effective to put two points into Flash Flood, because that way I can access Master of the Elements without taking Water Totem Mastery, and I don't need to get Ancestral Vigor. And I can take Spirit Link Totem to get Lava Surge. Definitely get an extra charge of Lava Burst. Healing Tide Totem, does that give me anything good? Unleash Life gives me... Healing Rain affects two additional targets. That is... Probably worth getting just because of the Acid Rain benefits. Assuming this... Yeah, assuming this affects Acid Rain, it deals damage to six enemies, so would this make Acid Rain hit eight targets? I'm assuming if somebody happens to know Resto Shaman and that's not how it works, let me know. Uh, I will probably take Wave Speaker's Blessing to get to this. And what else do I want? I think, um, yeah, Primordial Wave. I knew I wanted that one eventually, but I already have access to it. And if you critically heal, you summon a blah blah thing that does healing. Ascendance. That's just healing. Downpour, that's just healing. Increases healing. 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 Every mana you spend gives you healing. 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 Uh, okay, well, I definitely go for Mortal Waves because that is the only good damage capstone for Resto Shaman. It is interesting how Resto Shaman works, right? Like, you have so many damage talents in the top section of your tree and none at the bottom which honestly is good because the best time to play a healer is at lower levels so that is i would say one of the reasons why resto shaman is considered to be one of the best healers for low level dungeons because you have so many damage talents early on whereas like resto druids basically get nothing until their capstones um any plans for speed leveling videos for classic wrath or era uh none for era at least no, like, speed leveling stuff. I will finish up my uh, Druid Hardcore run at some point. Druid's still sitting at 45. I haven't touched it. One of my friends is actually 56. So, you know, in a, a really, it, like, interesting case of if you keep at it, you'll eventually get it. I've talked, like, when I was doing the Hardcore streams, I talked about how there was that uh, healer in my guild who was playing a Hunter on Classic Hardcore. And, wait. Primordial Wave won't do damage for Resto in 10.2? What the fuck? Really? 
That's actually super lame if that's the case. I guess may maybe it helps them in endgame, in which case, cool. Let me check the 10.2 PTR. Blast your target apply and healing them. Wow. Yeah, you're right. That's so lame. I, well, I'm sure that there is a reason for that. I'm sure Rester Shamans probably wanted that for XYZ reason. Um, that means that Rester Shaman will fall off hard. Crap. That, well, okay. I'm glad you pointed that out because kind of similar to what I am doing with like Disc Priest where I'm not taking Light's Wrath because it's leaving. In that case, I I don't want to run Primordial Wave then. Even though this is really good, it would be inaccurate to test a very strong damage talent when you're not going to be able to use it anymore. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kuan. That is very useful information. Uh, I'll have to think of something then. Um, but yeah, so uh, what I was saying before, though, is the healer in my guild who was leveling a hunter and he died six times on a hunter, he started leveling a mage, and obviously mage is really broken, but still, after dying six times, his mage is now level 56 on hardcore. So he's almost there. It's going to be hilarious if he somehow fucks up and dies. I would never let him forget it, but... Honestly, I think he needs a win because the other week uh, I've talked before about how my guilds, my guild plays poker a lot on like Fridays and weekends and stuff. And the other week, that same healer, the one who died six times on a hunter, for anybody who knows poker, he folded a royal flush and he has been agonizing over it ever since. So he has had... A rough couple of months, just in general. You know, first the hardcore stuff, then, you know, folding a royal flush in poker. Uh, and he... <laughs> it's... The, the best thing is, though, like, I can't believe all of this happens to the same person. And, of course, we mercilessly make fun of him for it. It's... It is, like, it's so perfect. But, yeah, like, if he makes it to 60, I'll be very impressed with him. Because, you know, coming back from six deaths, like... I haven't died a single time in Classic Hardcore, but if I lose my Druid when I try to get it up to 60 again, I'm probably done. I don't think I'm making a new character. So at some point, I will probably try to finish that up. But if, if I die, I die. If I make it to 60, awesome. Um, Sam Mulvey said, just joining the stream now. What have you missed? Uh, just been going over the setups for all the healers. And once we're done setting up Resto Shaman, I'm going to switch back to Resto Druid and we'll start all of the runs in order. So you haven't actually missed any of the leveling runs. Um, but yeah, I mean, if he dies, obviously, yeah, Troy, I think then he will quit. But I think at this point, he's playing safe enough that he'll probably survive it. Um, so that's my only plan for Classic Era. I honestly, it's not that I don't have any interest in Classic Era. I enjoy playing hardcore and, you know, I'll gladly get to 60. But I have no real interest in doing anything at level 60 in hardcore. I thought about it before, but the more I, definitely not on hardcore... I thought about doing dungeons, but, like, if I get to 60 and I have a few other friends who happen to get to 60, I might be down to try hardcore dungeons, just because that sounds like a fun thing to do. Like, tanking that could be interesting. I did a few uh, dungeons while leveling my druid, but I'm not going to pug that shit. Fuck that. I uh, would only want to do it with friends as, like, a fun challenge. But outside of that, I don't really want to do raids in hardcore. That sounds like too much effort. And... I honestly have no interest in just regular Classic Era. I played it in the 2019 re-release. That was cool. That's enough for me. Now, if they do a Season of Mastery, which there is a good chance that they will announce whatever the next Season of Mastery is at BlizzCon, maybe I will check that out if it sounds interesting. I dabbled with the first Season of Mastery a little bit, but I didn't find it interesting enough to stick around. But there were some endgame changes that, like, if I had had the time and interest in it to level, would have been you know, more than keen on trying that stuff out. I had a friend uh, who played around with uh, Endgame Season of Mastery stuff. So if they do a cool new Season of Mastery for Classic Era where there's like faster leveling speeds and stuff, maybe I will check that out. But that is entirely dependent on how interested I am in the changes they are proposing. Regular Classic Era at this point, I'm not interested in. Talked about it before, but while I think the leveling experience and stuff is fun, I've already done it a few times now, and... I don't really want to do speedruns for that. 
you know, I respect the people who are able to like sit through that and grind, but the reality is it's, I don't find the speedrun element of that to be fun because I, the thing I like about leveling in classic era is quite frankly, the opposite of speedrunning. It is taking my time, leveling my professions, going at my own pace and literally doing anything but speedrunning because speedrunning is fun in like a short burst. But when it gets to be like a marathon and you have to literally spend days doing that, it also, I mean, it leads to degenerative gameplay where you're encouraged to basically account share and do shit to actually be able to keep up like at real, real like what words, realistic times. You either do like a split speed run where you do it in like different segments. If you're doing it all in one setting, which is, as I've said, how I like to do speed runs, it just becomes miserable. And I don't really have any interest in doing like a split speed run. And I definitely don't have interest in staying up for three days nonstop, which realistically speaking, most of those people account share anyway. We all know that the, the world first hardcore guy, 100% account shared. Um, so that's not something that I have any interest in. However, all that to say, talked about this a lot before, so I'm not going to go into super big detail. I 100% plan on doing Wrath speedruns. 1 to 80 Wrath Classic speedruns, absolutely something that I am planning on. Not just that, I'm already working on it. As in, I have, like, most of the heirlooms collected, all the heirlooms I will need for the speedrun, and I'm slowly, like, collecting items and things that I think I will need to put together, like, a fancy Wrath Classic speedrun like I do for retail. It is going to be a long process, of course. It is a completely different game. It's like, imagine the amount of times it would take me to build up my, or the amount of time it would take me to rebuild my heirloom collection and all that stuff collection on uh, retail. All that time, it would be an immense effort. And while it is slightly reduced on Wrath Classic, doing that from scratch is still a lot. And yes, Jesper, I do have the Dread Pirate Ring. Um, I have, I've already put in a lot of effort towards Wrath Classic speedruns. That's all I'll say for now, because I've talked about it a bit on streams in the past. I've showed some of my plans and, you know, ideas that I have for, like, you know, setting up those speedruns. So it is absolutely very much in the works, but that will not be, at the very least, for, like, another two, three months. That is, like, patch 10.2 is already completely settled down. I'm done with all of those videos, and it's, like, around Christmas time, and I have nothing major to work on, and then I start, you know, doing practice runs. And of course, I'm going to need to do a million different practice runs before I do a real speed run attempt. Because that is another thing that I need. Practice with the zones themselves. I've leveled characters before, but leveling characters casually is very different than leveling characters in a speed run format. So, uh, we'll see. But it is 100% something that I will be doing. The only question is, will I just be speed leveling for fun or will i be able to like get an actual amazing perfect world record run fuck i dropped my water bottle one second um yeah sucks i'll have to later on um yeah at the moment i have no idea if i will be able to get like a world record or anything crazy like what i do in retail i'm definitely going to try but it is a massive undertaking and i've said before my main focus is cataclysm Cataclysm, I am going to be doing the whole kit and caboodle, the usual like stuff I do for retail, full leveling guide, detailed routes. Maybe I'll even have my add-on finished by then and I'll be able to get it working for both retail and classic. That is more of a stretch goal. But Cataclysm, I definitely plan on optimizing the shit out of that and having like, you know, super fancy speed runs. Um, like I said, full leveling guide, written and video. So the entire reason I'm doing this stuff on Wrath Classic is as a like a test for all of this. I think it would be a lot of fun and I'm really interested in trying it, but at best, I get like a Wrath Classic world record, same as retail. At the absolute worst, I get a lot of really fun speed runs that are interesting to watch still, and that will inform my eventual Cataclysm Classic speed runs and guide so that I could get ridiculously good times for those. But regardless, it is something I will do. It's just a question of when and how much of it I will do. Uh, but it won't be for a little while. <laughs> when you get to Grizzly Hills, turn off sound effects and dialogue and just leave the music. Yeah, love the Grizzly Hill stuff. Okay, uh, let me just blitz through the end here because we're almost done setting up everything and then we can start the actual runs and then uh, I'll, it'll be more chill. Uh, okay, so if I'm not taking Primordial Wave, unfortunately, what can I take then? None of these are good for damage, so I can just focus on healing. In fact, in that case... I want whatever gives me the most burst healing. Um, I 
I guess Healing Tide Totem is a nice emergency cooldown, so that's okay. You're saying the cooldown could be fine. Summons a totem, uh, which redirects damage. Don't need APT. Uh, if I take Torrent, then I can't really path into this stuff anyways. But I don't really care about this a lot. Immediately healing... Okay. I guess Ascendance could be nice as, like... The problem is, I don't have Earth Shield. And I don't really want to take Earth Shield. So... Um... That is kind of funny that, like, because Earth Shield is on here, it is theoretically possible to just not take it. And then you just can't even get your capstone set up. That is, I didn't even think of that. I'm still not going to take it. That just means I can't take Ascendance. Um, and Deeply Rooted Elements is honestly not bad, but then the question is, what do I drop for it? Am I just not able to take Healing Tide Totem? Uh... Yeah, this is tricky pathing. Uh, what, what do I want? Is this stuff any good? I guess Tidebringer is not bad, though. This gives me, like, in a pinch, emergency, like, massive chain heals. And you critically heal with a lot of other stuff. Yeah, I guess this stuff's fine, too. And then what would I take here? Every four casts of Riptide also apply another free Riptide. So in that case, like, this stuff still has decent Riptide synergy. So I probably still want to take two points into Torrent. Then I would go down here, take Primal Tide Core. And then I could take, I guess, Earth Living Weapon. Even though, I the question is, do I have... I don't know what other weapon imbuements I have. If there's one that gives me damage, that's what I'm running. So I can take all this stuff off my bars. Uh, hello, owner. Good to see you. What would you say is currently top three leveling speed specs? Uh, you just got your first 10 to 60 under four hours. Nice. Um, I would say it is... Uh, I have it in my uh, class description, or my uh, stream description. Druid Monk and then... the Druid and Monk are the top two, 100%. Uh, I'm curious if you used one of those. I would imagine those are the easiest to get it on, uh, because they are definitely the fastest. And then after that, it's it's a bit of a split. I would say Mage, Paladin, Warrior are all roughly equivalent. Like they, I it's hard to say. I think maybe I'd say Prop Paladin, Arcane Mage, and Fury Warrior are like the three fastest ish. Fury not so much at low levels though. So maybe like Prop Warrior. Slightly faster than Fury. But then, like, all of the other mage specs are close, other than Frost. Um, Rep Paladin is also very close. Arms Warrior is definitely pretty good, too. So, it's hard to say. And then, slightly behind those are Hunter and DK. They're not bad, either. Uh, Hunter, though, very much depends on your spec. Survival, it, it, like, really gets more... Survival Hunter is behind them. And then... Death Knight is, like, a bit behind the rest. But Death Knight, you kind of need to play all three, depending on the level. And Hunter, if you're playing BM or MM, it falls behind a decent bit, but they're still fine. You did it on your Arcane Mage? Yeah, there you go. Like I said, Arcane is... I would probably put Arcane either third or fourth as, like, the best leveling spec. Uh, it's up there. It is one of the strongest, so that checks out. But yeah, definitely a very good time there. Not a lot of people have managed to get uh, sub four hours, 10 to 60. It's like a lot of times when people are like first getting into this, the times they see are like in the four to four and a half hour range when they're still learning it. Sub four hours is definitely a very good time. Definitely be proud of that. Okay, so I've got in this all set up. 
I don't need Astral Recall. I'm just going to take that off my bars completely. And I can get all of this stuff set up. So, Lame Tongue Weapon. Does this only proc off melee hits? If so, it's probably not worth using. I'd imagine it does. In which case, I'm probably free to use other things. Uh, Ancestral Vision, this is my AoE res. Row Unleash Life in my bars. Spirit Link Totem on my bars. And I'll just throw... Put everything down here. Lightning Lasso. Water Walking, I'll put on there. It doesn't really matter. This is... Thunderstorm is like very much a utility thing. And rush to them too. Um, definitely not going to be using Primal Strike at all. That much I know for sure. And Farsight I won't need. Chain Lightning I definitely need. And everything else is on here somewhere. It's just a case of where do I put it. Right. Uh... I think one of the things, though, with weapon imbuements is obviously it doesn't really matter for the test I'm doing now, because in these tests, I'm not using any consumables. However, it is important to note that we were we tested that weapon imbuements will overwrite any weapon oils you have. So at level 50 to 60, Shadow Core oil is just a better thing to use. At level 60 to 70, at least for, like, leveling, right? At max level, it's different, of course. But uh, while leveling, your consumables are going to scale much harder than your actual abilities, which is one of the reasons we use them. And then 60 to 70, you're going to want to use your... Uh, what's it called? Your runes, buzzing, uh, hissing, etc. And then at very low levels, uh, for casters you have the uh, wizard oil, or whatever it's called, which is going to be much better than this stuff. Fling Tongue Weapon for Enhancement, I think at low levels, is actually decent. And there's no low-level uh, weapon imbuements. I think Sharpening Stones technically work, but are not ever really worth using. Same with Weight Stones. Uh, there is, like, a few good Weight Stones, but they are currently also suffering from the low item level bug where you can't actually apply them because the requirements and the minimum item level are at conflict. But uh, I guess I can at least put this on here just so I can throw Flame Tongue because I'm not using any of that stuff. So it doesn't really matter. And all my other shields are on my bars. Okay, good. So let me get this sorted real quick. Earthbinds I'll put there for my shields. Also... Dark Iron Racial, Fire Blood I'll put there. Uh, Mole Machine I'll put somewhere over here. And... Yeah. What do you think are some of the weirdest race class combos that currently exist? I Well, yeah, at, at the moment, obviously you named a bunch. There's a million completely lore inconsistent race class combos that they've added in the recent, you know, few patches and quite honestly i don't think it matters like a lot of people are losing their minds over it and i think since they've gone with the approach of we want to give every race to every class uh eventually i think that's fine i don't understand why a lot of people are freaking out about it but i agree that those are some good examples let's put spirit link there put a wind rush totem there too I think Unleash Life on T is probably a good spot for it. An astral Shift there. Uh, what do I want as a good self-healing option? For my shields, I think I want Water Shield, right? Yeah, you just get MP5. I If I'm getting hit with Lightning Shields in a dungeon, there's a bigger problem. So I'll just take Water Shields. Uh, what else? Purify Spirits. Let's do Shift H. Shift F, I want. Healing Surge, like an emergency heal. Healing Stream Totem, I'll put on Shift T. Stormkeeper could be Control T. Am I going to get any extra buttons? I guess eventually I'll get Ancestral Guidance, which is a two minute. Unleash Life, I'll put on my bar. Stormkeeper, I'll put there. Yeah, that makes sense. 
And then eventually I will get Ancestral Guidance and put it on Control T. And what else? All this stuff is just passive, so I don't need to worry. I would have put Primordial Wave somewhere over there, but alas, it's getting gutted, at least for leveling purposes. It's getting gutted. I have Heroism over there. And then we can actually set things up. So put Lightning Bolt there. Put Lava Burst there. Um, I'm going to do this. And then... I'm mostly going to be spamming Chain Lightning, because realistically speaking... That's all I'm going to need it for. Uh... Let's do that. That's probably fine for leveling stuff. I. Yeah. Tar and Rogue seems weird, not lore wise, just the idea of a silent cow is funny. Yeah, I mean, there were jokes about the potential of Tar and Rogues for quite a while. I'm glad they, on they added it, honestly. I think it's neat. Oh, I completely forgot about Healing Tide Totem. Uh, where do I put this? This is definitely a major cooldown. I could take, uh, let's put Ghost Wolf on six, honestly. Put this, um, do I want or there we go. I think that's better. Um, Okay. So, healing-wise, one of the nice things about Wrestler Shaman is you get, like, a pretty good amount of healing out of Healing Rain. And because Healing Rain also deals damage with Acid Rain, it is absolutely worth it to keep this up 100% of the time if you want to be efficient in dungeons. Uh, Wrestler Shaman Burst at low levels is unmatched? Yeah, absolutely. So, one thing that you'll notice with some of the other healing specs is I will be playing very greedy for damage, and that will make it a little bit tricky if, like, things start to go south. But for Resto Shaman, you're kind of safe, because, you know, Unleash Life, this does what? Um, healing Rain affects two additional targets, right? I think that's the only thing you really want to do, so I can do Unleash Life on a single target, and then Healing Rain over here. And that's going to do a pretty nice amount of passive healing, especially for the purposes of, like, a leveling dungeon. And it's also going to be doing ticking damage, acid rain, etc. Um, now, Flame Shock obviously does a ton of dot damage over time. But on AoE, I'm mostly just going to be spamming Chain Lightning. But this is, on single target, very good. Uh, obviously, Lava Burst is huge if the target is affected by Flame Shock. So, single target, the rotation is pretty straightforward. You know, Flame Shock, then use all of your Lava Burst charges, and then Lightning Bolt as a filler. A Lightning Bolt is really only used as a single target filler, whereas Chain Lightning spamming this in AoE is still pretty good. Uh, Stormkeeper, for cooldowns, makes my next two casts instant and deal 150% more damage. Now, this is going to be better to be used on a large AoE pull with Chain Lightning. If I happen to have it up for a boss, and I know there's not going to be any major pulls lately, or like after the fact, I can then use Stormkeeper and do Lightning Bolt, but usually I'm going to want to be using this with Chain Lightning for like a massive AoE nuke. And then finally, Lightning Lasso. Obviously, this does massive single target damage. I will still want to make sure that I use it after I get Lava Burst rolling. But if I do Flame Shock, Lava Burst, Lava Burst, and then Lightning Lasso, that is like pretty much the ideal thing for single target. And then obviously use any charges, um, keep the dot up for Flame Shock over 18 seconds. Uh, if it's multi-target, reapply it to a different target. Uh, but then pretty much just spam Lightning Bolt and single target and spam Chain Lightning on AoE. Uh, Tarn should only be Shaman or Hunters, otherwise it's weird. Maybe worries. Eh, I think a lot of stuff works for Tarn. Um, I, honestly, I like Tarn Paladins as a concept. I think thematically it works perfectly fine. But, you know, to each their own, I suppose. Uh, the other thing I wanted to quickly look at is double-checking. I think Lava Surge... Yeah, Flame Shock has a chance to reset the remaining cooldown on Lava Burst and cause it to be instant. So, 
in like funnel situations, it'll definitely be good to apply flame shock to like multiple targets. Even if like it's an insignificant target, I still want to flame shock them just so I can funnel more instant cast lava bursts bursts into the boss. Words. Um and then Master of the Elements means that I want to use Lava Burst first before... I guess, honestly, that would work really well for Lightning Lasso, right? Because that's, yeah, nature damage. So I can do Flame Shock, double Lava Burst. Why is my phone going off? I literally muted my phone before starting the stream, and it's still going off for whatever stupid reason. Hold on. Let me apparently find the secret way to mute my phone for real this time, because this stupid thing... Yeah, it's muted. Is it one of those... Yeah, there's a dumb thing where there is... Randomly, multiple types of volumes. Love that. Hold on. Stupid. That annoys me. I hate when my phone does that. Just like, I turn the volume all the way down to the lowest possible setting, and it's like, no. There, there are multiple different volumes that you don't get to see unless you find the slider, and... <laughs> okay. What else? I uh, just want to make sure I'm not missing anything for damage rotation stuff. Um, healing wave, blah, blah, blah. Heals for an additional amount. Think really, it's just, yeah, exactly what I said. I don't think I'm missing anything. The only thing that I need to remember is to Lava Burst before Lightning Lasso. Well, Flame Shock before Lava Burst, Lava Burst before Lightning Lasso, in that order. And then always Unleash Life before I do Healing Rain. Because that is pretty much the only thing that I'm going to want to use my Unleash Life on while leveling, at least. And for healing stuff, if I think the tank is, like, taking a crap ton of damage, I can throw Riptide on them as an emergency. And then I'm pretty sure the only heal I will actually be pressing if I really, 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 really need it is Chain Heal. Because I've gone heavily into anything Chain Heal related. And if I need more than Chain Heal to keep a group alive in a BC dungeon... As I've said before, there is a bigger problem there than anything else. Okay. So, I finished setting up every single spec. I'm going to go back and in the same order do all of them. So I'm going to start on Rester Druid and Holy Priest. Uh, let's actually, you know what, let's start in Holy Priest. Because Holy Priest is the one that I have played the most. It is the one that I think most people are familiar with. Uh, with having watched my videos because I showcased that Holy Priest is the strongest priest spec at low levels. It is ludicrous how much damage it does. And I honestly think that with all of the new stuff, it overtakes uh, Resto at later levels. Resto's good, especially early on, because as we pointed out, it gets a lot of its strong stuff later. But Holy still gets a lot of really powerful talents even later in the leveling process. So I think it is pretty strong. So, okay, I think I haven't picked a Chromie time yet, so go ahead and select a different timeline, portal to Outlands. Great, it's doing this bug again. All right, Chromie, let me select Outland, please. Okay, I'd like to return to the present timeline. Now can I select Outland? Piece of crap game. Uh, all right, now... Random Burning Crusade Dungeon. There we go. I have no idea how long these queue times are going to take. Depending on how long it is, it could be a little bit annoying. It's probably not going to be like tank queues, where it's really fast. And the thing about this is, I uh, can't really do anything to speed it up in the meantime, because the entire thing we're trying to test is how these healers perform in a dungeon setting. Uh, it's not showing me up on there, though. Yeah, it says one tank, one DPS, zero healers, even though I am a healer. So yeah, the updating thing has always been a little bit jank. Um, let me double check while I'm at it, check my Discord. Uh, something I can talk about. Um, are there anything that I missed earlier?
Always tricky. Oh, here's something fun. I can talk about while I wait for this stupid cue to pop. Hopefully it shouldn't be too long. Uh, so I've talked a little bit about Warcraft Rumble. I should also note, as far as videos go, I've pinned it in the stream chat. But if you are curious about items from uh, Shadow or from um, Dragonflight Season 2 that you should be farming before next season, I have linked that. That was a video I posted last night. It admittedly is not doing as well as I hoped, but, you know, not every video uh, really hits the way you think it's going to. So is what it is. Um, I'll probably just kind of eat the loss and just accept the fact that I spent way too much time on a topic that clearly not as many people are interested in. So be it. Uh, but overall, for video plans, within the next, like, two or three days, I will be posting my review for Warcraft... I, I keep thinking it's Arclight Rumble because they changed the name Blatant Development. Warcraft Rumble. And I've talked about that fairly extensively. But one thing that I will kind of be focusing on in that review, more so than a lot of other complaints that I brought up in the past, and I think it is like the clear worst part of the game, is the fact that you don't really get a choice over the rewards that you get. So I played through it on Twitch a little bit. I played through it at the end of uh, Thursday's live stream, actually. And... I discussed a lot of the problems with it, and one of the biggest issues by far was that the way the reward structure works, you have to spend your currency on things that you don't want at all in order to basically make the shop recycle itself to get a chance at being able to see things that you want. And what I've done is on my main accounts, which is like a bit further along, I have way more currency on that stuff, I went through like i i bought a bunch of random shit in the shop to try and get it to recycle over and over and over and over and what i noticed is there was a unit that i had that i was using actively in my army that i had one point away from being able to upgrade it to like the next level the way that it has like this whole garbage gotcha sh system i explained it in you know when i was going through the game and of course before i get to this part of the review i will explain it again and in that system you need to basically get duplicates of a unit or like buy duplicate copies of a unit. Uh, and you need like at first three of them to reach uncommon rarity. And then you need 10 of them to reach rare rarity, 25 to get to epic. And I, there is apparently a legendary thing, but I don't even have a single epic unit despite playing the game for a while because it is absurdly pay to win and grindy. So... We'll see uh, when I get there. But I would presume for Legendary, it's probably like 100 duplicates. And of course, it doesn't carry over, right? So you spend like the 25 to get, you know, Epic, and then you would have to refarm 100 additional duplicates to get it up to Legendary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it does have actual tangible, just stat scaling shit that makes the game infinitely easier. So it is crucial to being able to progress further. And right now... One of my most used units in my army is at 9 out of 10 duplicates to reach the next rarity tier. And you know what? This search is taking a while. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and wait just for TBC dungeons. I wouldn't do that during a leveling run either, so fuck it. If it makes it faster. Um, Yeah, so my unit is one duplicate away from being able to let me upgrade it. And yet, it does not appear in the store. Now, I checked every single disclaimer text, you know, in like Blizzard explaining the odds and whatever. And I'm not sure if they've hidden away some information really deep into like, you know, the manual for this fucking mobile game or whatever. But pretty much every single, you know, mobile game I've seen. They, I'm pretty sure, required by law in certain countries to fully publish the drop chances for certain things. I cannot find any detailed information on that for Warcraft Rumble. And I know a few people told me that apparently the game is like banned in certain countries because I think they didn't comply with the random like loot box chance rules. And maybe this is what it's for? Oh, okay. Well, I got, uh, apparently... <laughs> 
a TBC dungeon anyways, even though I clicked Q for other stuff. Uh, but yeah, so I cannot find any information whatsoever on where what the drop chances are for all of these different uh, items. But all I know is that I cycled through the store multiple times. The unit that I want to get a duplicate of to upgrade will not appear. And yet the same unit that I have no interest in buying has appeared three, four, five times. It just keeps reappearing the more I cycle the store. It'll like disappear for a little bit. And then I buy like two more things. And then suddenly, oh, wow, that unit I don't want is back. And it's like the same recurring pool of like a handful of units. And as I started then buying those units that I don't want upgrades for, suddenly it starts giving me different options. So what I have realized, and, and this is only my speculative guess because it seems Blizzard has not actually posted the drop chance stuff anywhere, that in order to basically, oh, this guy's getting clapped. Uh, in order to get the items you want, you need to spend an excessive amount of money on the things that you don't want, which is absolutely terrible, terrible, terrible design. And the reason that, like, I knew that this was kind of bad, right? Where I obviously knew this felt bad, and it was one of those things where I, I knew something about the way the store works. They call it the grid, right? Within Warcraft Rumble, that's the name of their store. They try to make it all fancy. It's like the entire game reeks of, like, you know, this is what kids like of, like, goofy little humor and stuff. And part of that is, yeah, that guy can suck a dick trying to, I don't know what he died to, but I don't even know where he was. Um, but the entire game reeks of like that. It's kind of like Fortnite humor, I think is the best way to describe it. Where it's it's like the he hello fellow kids type of thing of like everything is like goofy. This It's not a store, it's a grid and you have to buy items to recycle the grid, which like I said is just you know, basically getting you to spend more money, but with extra steps. And they, they paint it as like, you know, oh, it's a fun way to get like rotating different items when really it's just, it, it is a fancier loot box, but is it, it's a fancier loot box that tricks you into thinking that, oh, if I keep spending money on these different items in the store, eventually the thing that I want will appear. When I've, like I said, I, I tested this and no, it won't appear. You can spend an infinite amount of money on random crap and the thing that you want won't appear until you've spent you know just an egregious amount of cash on blizzard's game i'm i'm not going to dump hundreds of dollars just to find what the limit is i assume that it's just infinite right the game will force you to upgrade literally every single unit in the entire game before it lets you actually progress on the stuff you want which is terrible absolutely terrible and the worst thing about this is I, I was talking to my dad, and my dad plays this game, it's like Forza Horizon something, some sort of racing game. And it's like, it actually has like gotcha game elements, where he talks about how they have like these rotating, effectively it's like banners, right, for, you know, like I, I've mentioned before, I play Honkai Star Rail. And I think Honkai Star Rail is infinitely more fair and generous when it comes to all this, like, monetization shit as far as, like, gotchas go. Uh, this guy's getting spanked. Um, but oh, the way a lot of those games work is, and, and unfortunately, Warcraft Rumble has now implemented this system in the worst way possible. Uh, they have a limited time thing where it's like there's a character like in Honkai Star Rail, it's called a limited character, right? You know, if there's a special thing that you can use your, your pulls for, and if you use it on this special banner in this limited time, you can get like a special character that only drops off that banner. And then once the banner goes away, you have to wait until it comes back to get the character. Traditional like mobile game, gotcha game shit. So... My dad plays a, like I said, a game where instead of, you know, collecting uh, anime girls, he collects cars. And he's actually been playing this game for a very long time. Because I remember back in, back when I was in high school, which at this point was, how many years ago was that? It's been, because it wasn't on my last year of high school when he started playing. He started playing it even before then. So, graduated high school seven eight years ago and my dad was playing that game for at least one year 
I remember before the end of my high school, because I remember he got me to try it at the time. So he's been playing this game on and off for a very, very long time. And he told me there's a system like the one I described for, you know, gotcha games where there is like a limited car. And, you know, if you there's like challenges that you need to complete and completing the challenges in that game gives you like paid currency or something. And my dad likes to do the challenges, but he said usually it's not enough to be able to um, get the uh, like the paid limited car. So what my dad likes to do is he's com a complete free to play player in this like car racing game that he's been playing for eight something years. And he will do all the challenges for fun. And then like every now and then, like, you know, every half a year or so, if he sees like a limited car that he really wants and he's like, that's pretty cool. He just uses all the stuff he saved up and he gets that car. And, you know, that works for him because he doesn't need all the cars. He's not like a big collector. He has like the handful of cars in this racing game that he likes to use. And that's all that matters to him. I'm going to re queue on the off tank or off chance this tank wants to go again. If uh, this button will work. Hello? You guys can see the button is getting pushed. And for whatever reason, what is going on? What the fuck is wrong with this garbage game sometimes? I'm literally spam clicking the button. Nothing is happening. Don't understand. Okay, the tank's requeuing. Cool. He must have been a low level, right? Yeah, level 13. He was probably level 10 or 11 at the start of this dungeon because he was just one-shotting everything. And that's the reality of like leveling as a healer. You can see I didn't really do a whole lot. I contributed a little bit with Holy Fire, Shadow, or Death. Uh, but the Guardian Druid just kind of did most of it. You're not always going to get a level 10 Guardian Druid that one-shots things with Thrash, but you will a lot of the time. And that's why leveling as a healer, like, they're all kind of the same, which is kind of the, the thesis of this video. But, you know, we're doing the tests anyways, just to demonstrate that. It's all well and good for me to say this is how something works, but if I haven't at least done the test once, then, you know, it's kind of pointless. So this way, at least I, I will have evidence to back that claim up. And Troy said, when you say cycle, you mean like, or uh, yeah, I meant the grid. Yeah. Um, it's not loot boxy. Like they aren't trying to post the percent. Yeah. But the thing is the percent is very important there because like the chance of what are, what are your chances of this item appearing in the grid? And I think maybe that's why they think they can get away with it of like not posting it. But at the same time, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if somebody wants to look this up, I will probably at least double check this fact before making my video on the subject because I want to be accurate. And I think that is important information. If it is banned in certain countries, as people have told me it is, then that would actually go a long way towards explaining why it is banned in certain countries, because that is pretty egregious. Um, this week is Wrath of the Lich King time walking. You may want to choose Lich King Chromie time for quick dungeon queues. Uh, well, I picked... TBC to simulate what a real run would be like if you were doing dungeons, but um, I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? Lich King Crummy Time doesn't overlap with time walking, they're completely separate queue pools. So, unless you're saying I should queue time walking, which I am intentionally not queuing time walking, that's something I, I did say before. Uh, crap, actually, almost died there. Did not expect to rip threat that quickly. I think it was Flash of Brilliance that ripped Threat there. Because so I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm not going to be doing that much damage just yet. Then I level up, I rip <laughs> Threat on all the mobs at the level of Explosion, and suddenly I'm getting blasted. Uh, not exactly how I intended for that to go, but I lived, so worked out. I kind of, I panicked there and I almost forgot to like press half my buttons. Uh, this is a good example of like a really big AOE pull though. And, oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm still not going to be doing as much damage as these other people who are lower level, but you can see Holy Fire and Burning Vehemence and Holy Nova all do a ton of damage. Um, try to top this guy up. Just prayer of healing. Make sure everybody's topped. Get rid of that. Uh, have I, will I consider going to BlizzCon in the future? Nope, not really. No interest in BlizzCon whatsoever. Do not expect me to ever go to BlizzCon. I'm definitely not going this year. Um, and I have really no plans to go to BlizzCon in the future.
I just don't really think it's interesting. Uh, I'll gladly watch it at home, right? Like, I'll still... I, I don't care about the event itself, is what I'm saying. Like, the news from BlizzCon, sure, cool. Uh, and, like, I have friends who like going to BlizzCon, you know, more power to them, but I it is just not something I am interested in whatsoever. Conventions in general really just aren't my scene. You know, if there's information I'm interested in, I will read about it online, and that's as much as I, I care for. Silence here is really annoying. Uh, and Troy said, in concept, it's basically a loot box, but it's probably Blizzard trying to make it past the store, uh, make it pass not as a store to avoid regulations. Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. I, I agree with that assessment. I think that's exactly what they're trying to do. Because there are things in the store that, like, very clearly give you um, rewards, but a lot of the stuff that you can directly buy, there are, like, daily offers, right, with a lot of those mobile games. But a lot of the daily offers in Warcraft Rumble are like currency offers or experience offers or things like that. Like you can get upgrade currency for however much gold slash money, etc. Um, this is problematic. Uh, I'm silenced. Good luck, everybody. Okay, I'm going to try to do a big burst of healing here. Uh, all of like the units and stuff that you actually have to upgrade outside of like a handful of exceptions are almost all gotten randomly through the grid or something like that, or random upgrades rewards for completing certain missions. Basically, the entire reward structure in the game is random. Being able to upgrade your units, which is crucial to progressing in the mission, it's all random. You can't really do any targeted farming. And that is one of those things that really annoys me. Like, I am fine if character acquisition is random. If, if you want this particular character, you know... Yeah, it comes out of a loot box or whatever. Do I want that for gaming in general? No, but I will accept that that is the way that a lot of mobile games are going. Like, it, I, I tolerate it for Honkai Star Rail. I like that game as a whole. I think it is extremely fair. The fact that certain characters can only be randomly gotten from the banners. Is it amazing? Do I wish that there were easier ways to get it? Of course. But is it at least fine? Yeah, I, th I think it's fine. It has never really bugged me so far in my, at this point, multiple months playing the game. But in Warcraft Rumble, the problem is it's not just character acquisition that's random. It is just being able to get them to the level you want. So like, if I get a character in Honkai Star Rail that I want to play more of, well, I now that I have it, all I need to do is just click on it, press level up, and then I have resources that give characters experience. I press level up this character with my resources, and bam, that character is now a higher level. If I want to do more challenges with it, cool. It's now at the appropriate level for whatever challenge I wanted to do. Everything about that is completely deterministic. I choose where I want my upgrades to go. If I want to get armor for a certain character, you know, the exact stats of that armor may be like random because you have to farm like little dungeons for it, like with any rpg quite frankly uh but i can choose exactly which dungeons i want to run you know which items i want to farm and i can choose to say i want to equip this gear onto this character which gives it x increase in stats and generally speaking once you have a character in that game getting it like prepared for end game content is not at all hard it's just it's a little bit of grinding but a lot of that stuff you can also do ahead of time if I want to farm the materials that I will need for this character before it even comes out, um, that way the moment I actually manage to get it, I can just quickly apply that stuff, boom, and I'm done. You can do that. Because it's just, it's a basic currency system where you choose where your shit goes. Um, which, kind of my entire point here is that's important. It's important to have control. And like the entire thing where, like I said, when I talked to my dad, it was enlightening enlightening or what should we call it my dad said the reason he doesn't mind the fact that his racing game has multiple different like limited time cars and stuff where you can only get it is he's a completely free-to-play player he can still beat all the racing challenges in that game with his free-to-play unlocked cars he has never once hit a wall where he's just not able to do this one thing um it might be a little bit harder for him but he doesn't mind that and whenever there is something that he wants, he can use his free-to-play unlocked currency to get that thing. And that is true for, uh, like I said, you know, other mobile games I played. It is not true for Warcraft Rumble. And I think that is kind of the biggest point that I'm going to 
fixate on in my review because I could sit at length and talk about like you know uh, on on my Twitch stream like we joked about like the mythic value packs where it's like what was it fifty cents is mythic value or something like that according to Blizzard that's how they advertise it like the typical Diablo Immortal bullshit. And, you know, they use funny wording to describe why this is a great deal and you should totally spend your money on it right now. Like, that stuff is obviously scummy as fuck. But Blizzard being greedy and wanting to get more of your money, that is, um, that's nothing new. But I think the big reason to completely avoid Warcraft Rumble is the fact that it is grossly unfriendly to casual players. Like, if you are a free-to-play player, the game actively kneecaps you. And encourages you to spend money in multiple different ways. And um, so Dennis P said in Honkai, idol on levels are cringe. Yeah, I agree. That is definitely my least favorite part of the game by far. I get why they do it. Um, I'm not going to sit here and defend it, but it is one of those things where let's be real though. A lot of times you don't even need it. Like generally speaking, a character is at close to their maximum potential uh, without a single idol on. And getting it is like a marginal upgrade where it's like if you want to spend two thousand dollars to make a character like 50 percent stronger okay but realistically speaking you don't need to and also the game is not tuned around that uh at least i have been able to fully clear all of the hardest content in that game and i have not spent thousands and thousands of dollars on getting an idol on six five star or anything like that so I don't, it doesn't really bother me. The difference, of course, being that in Warcraft Rumble, uh, basically, if you don't even spend a minimum amount of money, you will hit a wall and you will be forced to grind to even be able to complete the basic campaign. Uh, so, very big difference there. You still prefer Eidolons to superimposing light cones? I agree. Yeah. I think the thing that I like about Eidolons, like, I, I disagree, I, I, or words, I agree it is not the best system in general. The reason why I don't mind it in some cases is because certain Eidolons, especially for four stars, where I have multiple E6 four star characters already, because it's not too hard to get over time. Um, getting a specific one can be a little bit annoying. Like, there's still a, a few that I'm missing. Uh, it took me forever to get uh, E6 Chingcha, which I really wanted because I really like Chingcha. And I that was annoying because obviously Chingcha plays very differently at high item levels than at low. It, it's one of the. The few cases where Eidolons really, really, really make a difference. Uh, but generally speaking, they have like interesting changes in terms of the gameplay. It may not be like numerically a major increase, but it's like some quality of life stuff. There are obviously massive power spikes like E6 Chengcha, which admittedly is a four star, so it's, in my opinion, much less egregious. Um, are, is like a very, 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 very sizable upgrade to the point where she fundamentally changes her role and becomes like really good as a support DPS and not just like a hyper carry. That obviously a little bit of a different example there. For a lot of characters, you can still use them at E0 perfectly fine. And their like E4 or something is the only thing that's a major power spike. And it's just like a slightly higher damage multiplier, that type of thing. Uh, when are you going to beat your world record 10 to 70? I'm not. <laughs> There's a reason why I said it's the perfect speed run. Um, I, I'm, I have no plans to even try to beat that world record. It, it was a really good world record. I don't even know if I could beat it. So I have absolutely no interest in slamming my head into multiple runs like that just to potentially get a slightly faster time when, if anything, it would be a marginal increase at best. It would not change the route whatsoever. And it would... um. I don't know, it just doesn't seem fun. I'd much rather do stuff like this, where I test different specs that I haven't played before and, you know, see how fast they can level. Because we already know I can level really quickly as a Guardian Druid. It's not fun for me, really. Uh, I've already beaten that challenge. There's no reason to do it again, but slightly better. Uh, the world record was done with the 50% bonus, but there's going to be more 50% bonuses again. And I also, I've done a run without the 50% bonus, so I still have a perfectly fast speed run with and without the bonus, which is kind of my point, right? I've already done multiple different tests. The only thing that I might do again is, uh, you met, you've done a 10 to 70? Yeah. 
it's at this point like one of my more viewed videos. It's actually been doing very well, especially recently in the algorithm. My current 10 to 70 world record. That was a few months ago. Uh, but yeah, the only thing that I might do is specifically 60 to 70. I might do a, a run faster than my Fury Warrior run. Because the only thing that I haven't done is since Dream Surges came out, I haven't done a sub two hour 60 to 70 run that is faster than the 60 to 70 portion of my current world record. I don't think overall I'm going to be able to beat that run. May It's one of those things where maybe if I waited for another 50% buff to come around again, which it almost certainly will at some point, Blizzard likes to do that towards like the end of a patch to, you know, get people to come back and level characters, etc. So we'll almost certainly get one at some point. I don't know when that might potentially be, though. Um, but I could do that with Dream Surges now, and maybe if I got perfect RNG again and a really good setup and Dream Surges, mind you, Dream Surges in the context of a 60 to 70 run or a 10 to 70 run are really, 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 really RNG heavy. Because you can argue that, like, let me mind games this. The tank fell off, so it's kind of just up to me now to actually kill this mob, and this means it's a little bit scary. Alright, I got it, though. Uh, yeah, Dream Surges are ridiculous. So, the amount of RNG and, like, perfect luck it would take me to beat that record, even with another 50% buff, it's astronomical. I, I have no interest in trying that again. The only thing I do think I could meaningfully improve is specifically in a concentrated, uh, like, run, the uh, 60 to 70 portion. So I might do test runs for that later in November, whenever Azure Span Dream Surge rolls around again. Uh, basically, right before I release my full Dream Surge 60 to 70 leveling guide. That I might do. Full 10 to 70 run? No plans at all. I will not do one until pretty much the next expansion. Because there's just no point. I've already got in a really good one for right now. Uh, let's see. Just make sure I, I read every message. Um, yeah. I, oh, and so what uh, Oxara said, though, is I agree superimposing light cones is kind of lame just because that is purely a stat increase. Which, yeah. But the thing is, though, superimposing um, light cones is also, because it is a stat increase, extremely minor where I don't even think it's worth doing, right? Like, it, it, as far as spending your money. Like, if you happen to get one, cool. It's, you know, it's a nice free stat bonus. But it is not a significant bonus even remotely. So, other than, like, a few minor breakpoints, like, there's a few four-star light cones for Harmony, where at a very specific breakpoint for specific characters at, like, superimposition three or four... This allows them to ultimate after uh, every three auto attacks guaranteed um, if they don't get hit at all by enemy attacks. But even then, it's like it is a super minor rotation increase if you get bad RNG. And that is like the only notable difference at like light cone superimposition levels I've actually seen as to like how it impacts your game play outside of like you get slightly increased stats, which really who gives a shit if you can already clear the content. This guy is going to fucking die. Yeah, I, I don't know why he did that. Um, I even, I tried to fucking heal him, but he was out of range. And he's just sitting there face tanking. And when he sees that he's low health, he doesn't even make an effort to kite. Like, if he had kited and I had time to use Holy Word Serenity on him, I probably would have been able to save him. But instead, he just sat there and ate the mob's auto attacks. So, rip Bozo. Um... Let me see. Uh, yeah, the way it's pronounced is... Uh, I, I don't know if that's exactly how you pronounce it, but it's something like that. It, it is, at least the English pronunciation in the game, is something like that. It, it's like, they say it with an accent, so it's not like Chingsha, it's like Chingsha or something like that. I, I I don't have, you know, the, the right accent to pronounce it correctly, and I, I'm not an expert at pronouncing Chinese names, so I'm not even going to try. But it is something like that. It's also like, you know, Fu Shuen is pronounced like that, where it's like, it sounds like Swen in World of Warcraft, where even though it's an X, it's pronounced with like a sh sound, like, you know, S in English. 
So yeah, the pronunciations aren't entirely intuitive like for English speakers like myself, but that's roughly how it's supposed to be pronounced according to the game. So that's how I've been pronouncing it. Um, hold on. Yeah, this is a little bit annoying. There we go. What level am I? 56. Yeah, so only a handful more dungeons. This will work. There we go. Um, Nizala said, How does the loot box stuff in Honkai work? You generally avoid loot box games because you fundamentally disagree with the concept of paying for random rewards. Yeah, I mean, Nizal, I agree with you. I generally dislike it. I think in Honkai Star Rail, it's, you know, a lot more generous, is all I'll say, than uh, in a lot of other games I've seen. Especially, you know, compared to Warcraft Rumble. It, it is a gotcha game, right? And, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, MiHoYo is giving out shit for free. It definitely is one of those where if you are completely free to play, you're not going to be able to get everything, right? It's just, it's designed like that. But it's like, the main thing, though is the only thing you're really getting out of the loot box is, like, uh, you will always get something, uh, either, like, you know, a light cone, which is basically this thing. That it's kind of like a talent, in a sense. Um, and Or you will always get, uh, like, a character. It may not be the character you want. That part is random. That is, I would say, for anybody who doesn't like loot box shit, the biggest pain point. Um, you can specifically target the characters you want, so they're like they have all of like the random number stuff published where it's like you know after i forget exactly what number it is i think after like 90 pulls you're guaranteed one of the characters or like a, a high level character and then it could either be the one like that is featured on the specific banner you're pulling on or it's like a 50 percent chance to be just another one of the main five-star characters but then you were always guaranteed to get it on your second attempt so it like the the numbers are clearly published there uh you know exactly how long the maximum amount of time it would take you to get a character is i think it pretty sure it works the same way for genshin impact but don't quote me on that because i don't really play that game i tried it like once a few years ago and i don't know much about it um but I think it feels a lot better because while it is very much a, if you are a free-to-play player, you will need to save up for that stuff um, and you will not be able to get everything. So it's not a perfect system. The game clearly tells you the odds. There is literally an information thing. It says these are the numbers, like even down to the percent chances and stuff like that. And it feels pretty good, right? Like I, so far, I think I have gotten luckier than average um, based on what I have seen, like by the numbers. But I have really never been disappointed when, like, you know, uh, using my, my currency for, like, the, the loot box stuff, I've never gotten garbage. I'm usually like, okay, you know, this may not have been the thing I wanted, but I can find a use for this. Um, it's not like where I said Warcraft Rumble, the problem is there are things where it will force me to spend money on things that I literally do not want at all. If I even want a chance at being able to get the thing that I want, which is the biggest problem that I have. Uh, and... Because a lot of the stuff, like I said, in this game is based on you you pull for specific characters. Uh, if you do not have any interest in this one particular character, you just you save up your stuff. And you just, just don't need to spend any of your currency on that character. And you can just wait until a character that you want rolls around. That is how a lot of gacha games work. That is, of course, not how Blizzard's game works. Because they need to be even greedier than the traditional gacha games, which a lot of people would already consider to be pretty greedy. Uh, so... Good on Blizzard for uh, taking it one step further and living up to their reputation, man. It's hilarious. Um, oh yeah, I forgot that light cones are even easier to get. Which, I mean, makes sense, right? They know that most people probably don't care as much about light cones compared to characters, so the odds are even more in your favor to get the thing that you want. So, yeah. Uh, oh boy, yeah. We, we've been talking a while about this, uh, Rhea, but Rumble, Rumble has so many problems. Um, the main, honestly, all this to say, the entire reason I'm even discussing this and the entire reason I've decided to make my video on it, because initially I'm like, you know what, it's just, it's going to be a game that shit, it comes out, it sucks, and maybe some people wail on it, but whatever. The problem that I have with it, the more I, I look into the changes that they've made to the monetization system, 
with the recent, like, you know, soft release or the changes that are going to be present in the launch version of the game that were not present on beta. Maybe suspiciously, like, m my suspicion is that they knew that they were going to do this shit all along, and they just decided to not include it in the beta so that people wouldn't notice as much. And they made the game seem very generous in the beta, only to rip all of that away at the last second so that they could, you know, sneak, like, a really, really egregious microtransaction in at launch without people calling them out for it. Uh, but the biggest problem I have is the fact that I keep hearing people saying, I'm going to play it, and when I hit a wall or stop having fun, I will stop. And you hit that wall early. Very, very, very early. But not only that, as you are hitting that wall, they are shoving microtransaction shit down your throat of, like, buy this if you want to have any chance of progressing in the game without spending literal days grinding just for a chance at continuing the main story. Wait, it, it, not even a main story. I call it main story. There is no story. Completing the main campaign, which is just a bunch of slightly more challenging involved min, uh, missions, like, back-to-back, -back, um, which is not nearly enough to warrant the level of grind that they've included to make you play. And that's the problem. You have to grind for everything. Because you can't just grind, like, one or two characters and then, you know, okay, well, the army that I want to use is complete. No, you are expected to level up your entire collection, and uh, you are supposed to do that at random. And then later on, in order to progress, you need to have a, a team for every single faction leveled up at a very high level to even stand a chance of being able to do the hardest content in the game. It is insane. None of, like, this is, the other thing that I'm going to show is how even if you, like, play for a while and spend money on it, it doesn't really get that much better. It is just slightly less dog shit. It is to the point where even if you spend money, it is still, like, an impossible grind that would require you to literally spend hundreds of hours mindlessly farming the same uh, tedious missions over and over to even see the later parts of the game. And if you don't spend money, you are just fucked. There is nothing you can do. The game is not made for you. You're just basically pushed out the door. Um, so that is kind of the misconception that I keep seeing, that it, it will have even remotely an appealing gameplay uh, process for people who aren't willing to shell out shit tons of money. And, of course, the other thing is, well, I'm sure that some of my friends who are going to try it are able to go in there with, like, you know, strong financial you know mindsets and stuff and be like okay w when i realize this game sucks i'm not going to spend any money on it not everybody is like that there's a reason that these games exist there's a reason that blizzard is making these predatory microtransactions because the game sucks ass right it had some fun elements but it's not even nearly good enough to justify spending ten dollars on much less the thousands that you were expected to sh like wail on if you want to even have a chance at seeing the end game right so it's clear that they are trying to, like, manipulate people into spending money, which is what a lot of these games do. So then, like, at that point, when it gets that egregious, I haven't really seen anybody talking about this game. And I'm not saying that I'm going to be able to reach, like, a super large audience, but if I can even get, like, a handful of people to not blow a ridiculous amount of money on what is clearly a predatory game, I'll consider that a win, and I'll consider this to be a review video worth making. Because holy fuck, it is bad. Um, yeah, they're like uh, Sterling. Um, I also watched uh, like Josh Strife Hayes and stuff. Like a lot of larger YouTubers made a lot of videos covering Diablo Immortal, and because it had the Diablo name on it, I think a lot more people were watching and paying attention to the game and talking about like how bad it was. And in that case, yeah, there was a lot of outroar. There was a lot of you know people pissed off at how absolutely garbage the design of Diablo Immortal was. And Warcraft Rumble is worse. It is genuinely worse than Diablo Immortal, because at least Diablo Immortal, I tried it, and I never hit any major walls. It was one of those things where I'm sure if I had kept playing for even longer, I would have, uh, you know, probably hit a wall where, like, I felt like I needed to spend money to continue. I had Obviously, like, microtransaction bullshit shoved in my face the entire time. I didn't spend a dime on it because I just didn't find it very interesting. And I stopped playing because I just got bored. Because the gameplay was mind-numbingly boring, and I assume at the end game it was going to turn into literally just spend money to continue. And by all accounts, I've heard that's literally all it is. It's you get to the end game and there is, like, 
endlessly scaling greater rifts or whatever, just like regular Diablo, where you're expected to buy all of the uber expensive garbage to be able to push ranks and stuff like that. Um, and that is kind of where I think Warcraft Rumble is just, it is almost like a baffling design on Blizzard's end, because one of the main problems with Diablo Immortal is that it is by and large a PvP game. So it is like, like another reason I should note that like games like Honkai Star Rail don't feel nearly as bad is because there is no PvP at all. It is completely single player. So it's like, if you want to spend thousands of dollars on making a character 30% stronger by getting all of their min maxi super duper, like, like difficult to obtain upgrades, um, by wailing a shit ton of money, you can do that, but you don't need to because I've literally been in the game without doing that. So who cares? But in a game like Diablo Immortal, where it is pay to win, because it's PvP, well, then suddenly it changes the dynamic. Suddenly, if you want to actually engage with the main content of the game, you're basically forced to spend money because everybody else is. And Warcraft Rumble almost would have been the perfect situation to implement that in, because Warcraft Rumble has PvP. And guess what? I probably don't even need to say this, but it's grossly pay to win, like by a fucking mile. But you know what? That would be okay, because Warcraft Rumble has a PvE mode, and you can just play the PvE mode, and, you know, it. oh, well, if there's no microtransactions and forced, like, pay-to-win in the PvE mode, then a lot of people would just play that and ignore PvP entirely. Except, they somehow managed to make PvE pay-to-win. Like, why you would do that? I don't know, like, people are already going to wail to win at PvP because, like, a lot of the people that wail do so so they can beat other players. But then it's like, you could have just made this one, uh, like, the main core part of the game not pay to win, not, like, ridiculously grindy and garbage, and then a lot of people honestly probably would have played it, had fun, and then paid money to pay to win in PvP. Instead, they just made the entire game pay to win to the point where nothing is fun. Because nothing feels earned. Because one of the things that I will clearly demonstrate in my video is on my main account, which has like, you know, at this point, a decent amount of hours put into it and stuff. I can completely steamroll every single mission to the point where it's not even remotely interesting or a challenge. But on a free-to-play account, where you're a brand new player, you haven't spent any money whatsoever, it's just like absolutely impossible to beat some of these missions. Unless you're grinding for hours on end. So there is no sense of reward or, you know, difficulty or whatever, because you either feel like, okay, I can't beat this mission because it is mathematically impossible, or okay, I beat this mission because I A, spent money, or B, wasted a shit ton of time increasing my unit stats so it became mathematically possible. And there is, like, a sweet spot in there. That is why it's such a shame. There is a sweet spot in there where Warcraft Rumble actually feels like a somewhat engaging strategy game. Not amazing. I've played a lot of better ones. But I at least enjoyed it in the beta when things felt a little bit more balanced. But now, because the missions are very much designed to force you to spend money, that sweet spot, you basically never hit it. You are always above it or below it. There is no in-between. And it is so easy to change that, but they're not going to, because the way that they could change it wouldn't make them money. Because then you wouldn't feel basically forced to spend money on the game. Now, personally, I think, I don't know, could call me crazy that from a business perspective, it would have been better to make a game that is just fun and appealing to players that has ways to wail on it. That way you still get a lot of the money, but you don't get all of the money and destroy your game. But what they're going for is we're going to get all of the money and completely murder our entire casual player base to the point where this game is just doomed to die out the moment the whales lose interest. And honestly, the PvP is fucking garbage. Uh, that, that is admittedly a bit of like a personal opinion thing. I think the PvP is atrociously designed. It's not even fun in the slightest. Whereas like the only thing interesting I find is some of the mission designs are kind of cool. But... Maybe some people will enjoy it. I can't speak for everybody, but I personally think the strong part of the game is that it has some cool thematic mechanics with its missions that like harken back to vanilla era World, World of Warcraft. And that would be a cool nostalgia thing for a lot of people if they weren't forced to spend hundreds of dollars to experience it. So 
I don't know. I just, I think it's a terrible game and I have a lot to say about it, but I don't want to make like an hour long review. So I'm probably going to make like a 15, 20 minute review that hits upon a lot of these major pain points and um, like, you know, maybe says like, uh, maybe I'll post like in a, a follow-up video showcasing some of my gameplay where I talk about a lot of this stuff. In like the description in an unlisted video like hey if you want to learn more about why it's so bad check out like my unlisted gameplay footage or something like that that way people have the option but i want to make the review a bit more snappier to clearly highlight like the key issues with it so i don't end up ranting about it for hours like i'm doing literally right now uh hold on this paladin honestly is it's good they're pulling really aggressively but it means i need to try really hard to keep them alive and the best way i can keep them alive right now is by killing everything because holy priest is bonkers look at that damage look at that fucking damage god holy fucking smacks i don't know i think it's like well i'm still gonna get all of this holy nova damage on disc because it's like a class talent i really don't know if anything in disc is discs kit can uh compare to imperial blaze this is such a broken button. It's so fucking good. Well, that combined with the talent that makes Holy Fire AoE. It is just actually fucking absurd. So I think when I did my um my Holy Priest run, or is the Holy Shadow Priest run, I talked about how I'm pretty sure that Holy Priest falls off at higher levels, but with Imperial Blaze, like right as Holy Nova stops being like, you know, a one button kill everything, you know, spell. Imperial Blaze and the other, like, Holy Fire talent turn Holy Fire into a ridiculous kill everything button along with Holy Nova. So, I actually think that Holy Priest may be, I don't know if I'd say one of the strongest leveling specs in the game, but, like, strongly above average. Like, this is stronger than Outlaw Rogue, and it's not even close. Like, anybody who watched the Outlaw Rogue speedrun, this is, like, night and day. Outlaw literally only has AoE during Blade Flurry, and even then it's pitiful. And Holy Priest, a fucking healer, who has really good survivability because you can just, like, heal yourself, literally, uh, also has the ability to AoE nuke everything on a one-minute cooldown. I mean, what's not to like here? I still think Shadow is probably better if you're playing it correctly, but this is still damn good. This may actually be the only healing spec I put in A tier on my tier list, because... Like, what is Holy Priest's weakness? Single target damage? I mean, you have Holy Fire, you have Shadow or Death. Honestly, Smite Spam still deals incredible single target damage. You have Chastise. Like, you get Mind Games at higher levels, which is an insane single target nuke. There is genuinely no weakness to this spec, despite being a healer. Which, from like a design perspective, makes no sense. But, hey... I, I won't complain. It means that priest leveling has been overall infinitely more enjoyable than I ever thought it would be. Anyways, um, let me read chat because I missed uh, a lot of messages there. Uh, you hate dream surges with a passion. You view them as a 25% bonus. Yeah, I mean, for leveling casually, I also view it as a 25% bonus. Unfortunately, I can't do that for actual speedruns, which is... Why I agree with you, I hate them. How are you going to compare healers? Uh, DPS meter, subjective dungeon efficiency. I mean, it is very much more of a feely thing, but we can also clearly see that Holy Priest is broken, right? Like, I don't need to tell you that Holy Priest is ridiculously overpowered. Um, the main thing, though, is none of this matters. And also, I should be clear... I'm not really going to be heavily weighing a healer's dungeon performance for healing into their final rankings. I, that is something I will be very clear on. The final tier list will 100% be in a solo leveling context, right? I will give at least a small level of leeway for if you are solo queuing for dungeons, how well does each spec do? But the reality is every single healer spec does fine at solo leveling dungeons, which we will see. Some are going to be stronger than others. Not every single healing spec is going to be able to do what Holy Priest is doing here. This is obviously ludicrous. But, like, Disc Priest will probably be pretty comparable. Resto Shaman will be pretty comparable. They're both pretty solid. 
Um, but I do think like you'll see Holy Paladins will not be doing quite as much damage. You're not going to see me topping damage on a pull as a Holy Paladin because Holy Paladins don't have Imperial Blaze, right? Um, Resto Shamans do have a lot of stuff comparable to Imperial Blaze, so they will probably be up there as well. But I don't know. Like this, this is just a broken fucking button. Um, and Holy Nova in general, it, we've already established it is like. What if the most overpowered spamble AoE abilities in the entire game, not even just for healers, but just for everybody. So that obviously gives it a lot of points. Like obviously there's this hunter's what, like, yeah, level 14. Low level hunter, one shotting everything, not a surprise. So for dungeons, a lot of times it doesn't really matter. But there are situations like the fact that Holy Priest is able to, on certain pulls, be the top damage by nuking everything with Imperial Blaze. That is something that, like, I won't be able to do as a Holy Paladin, as we'll see. And it does lose points for that. There is, of course, the fact, uh, which is worth noting, that I should spend points here. Um, we'll spend two on Harmonious Appetite and... Divine Word, and sure, Light of the Naru. Uh, put that on. Okay, I guess if the tank wants to requeue, they're the only person left. I mean, even though they are a tank, they're still going to have a faster queue if they stick with me. So hopefully they're smart enough to requeue. Uh, but at this point, if they're not going to, then I'm probably going to be even better off just leaving and requeuing again. I'm only one level away anyway. Yeah, they're not responding, so I'm just gonna... I'll leave then. Um, but yeah, I think the healer's dungeon performance is somewhat subjective, but there are certain ways where we can clearly look at it and be like, okay, yeah, that's broken. Um... It is one of those things where, like, if a healer can meaningfully contribute on damage, if they can easily keep their group alive, every single healer can easily keep their group alive, so that one is a given. And I've, like, I've already said that Holy and, uh, whatchamacallit, Holy and Resto Shaman are the two stronger healers, up with Disc. Disc is just, like, a slightly weaker version of Holy, but it's still good, as we'll see. Um, but... Really, this is more just because whenever I talk about healers, people will ask, but what about dungeon healing? So this is like getting that out of the way. That way I can say, hey, if you're curious about dungeon leveling, go watch this video. Like I talk about all the shit you need to know um, just so I don't need to hear the end of it in the YouTube comments section. And I can at least say that I have been thorough with testing everything so people don't give me shit. Uh, but realistically speaking, I don't think it matters that much. This is more for, like, completionist's sake of making sure we've actually fully tested everything. Anyways, let me scroll up again. Uh, hello, Stain. Good to see you. Uh, my day has been good so far. You want a single spec that's really good in Mythic Plus raid and PvP? That's a tall ask. Oxara, have you heard of Augmentation Evoker? <laughs> I know that you were responding to a question, which it looks like they deleted for some reason. Um... But yeah, I mean, Aug Evoker is unironically just the best spec in the game, period, at everything. So, yeah. Um, at 90 pulls, you get a 5-star character, at which point you have a 50-50 for the featured character. If you fail the 50-50, the next one is 100% chance. Yeah, exactly. Um, you have a 75% chance for the Lake Cone. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely much more generous. And the best part is, all of that is completely communicated. Like, if you look at Honkai Star Rail and you're like, I do not like this monetization system, well, at least the game tells you exactly what it is. Now, it is still a gotcha game. It still has, like, you know, monetization elements that you could argue are predatory because some people are more susceptible to that than others. But the one thing I will defend that game on is it very clearly shows all the odds. It clearly shows what your chances are of getting any item it is words um you know what i mean right it's that is one of my biggest issues with warcraft rumble it's the fucking deception the manipulation bullshit uh, uh to, if you want to argue that to a certain degree every gotcha game is manipulative i would not even really disagree with you but i think there are varying degrees and warcraft rumble is all the way to the extreme end of the worst degree which is my problem 
It's like how Overwatch 2 took a generous loot box system and then went with the Fortnite route, but even more expensive. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it is kind of amusing how a lot of people I know did not like Overwatch uh, loot boxes, and then almost all of them were like, I want it back after they saw Overwatch 2. I mean, Overwatch 2 is just a travesty of a game in general, unfortunately. So. Ah, it just is what it is. second let me uh just make sure that everybody's alive yeah i actually i ended up doing a pretty sizable chunk of damage in that pull how much does halo do um not as much as spamming holy nova is this even worth pressing it does as much damage as like two holy novas so i guess it's is it, I don't even know if this is worth the 1.3 second cast. Because, like, in the time that you're pressing Halo, you could just be pressing another Holy Nova if you just want AoE. This may actually be kind of a worthless talent. I don't know. It does... I guess if you're doing f pulls higher than five targets, maybe because Holy Nova doesn't go beyond that, Halo could be good. But... Yeah. Uh, you're against loot boxes so much you believe regulation should be put in place. I agree. Yeah, some countries have, but I completely agree that the pay-to-win shit like that needs to be regulated, or loot boxes in general need to be regulated. Uh, regulation over games, uh, monetization would force the game companies to make better games too. Completely agree. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where everybody agrees with that, but we obviously know how fucked things are, especially like in the US government with like lobbyists and shit like that. It's it's just an unfortunate reality of the world we live in. I completely agree with you that I hope one day something changes, but I'm not crossing my fingers that anything happens anytime soon. I'm a little bit jaded on a lot of stuff like that, though. So, yeah. Uh, okay, let me... I kind of want the tank to pull here so I don't get blasted. As long as he gets the threat, then I can get away with opening with the mind games and then Shadow or Death. Yeah, and you can see there, obviously a lot of people didn't even start attacking, but I was still able to put in like a ridiculous amount of burst damage. And keep in mind, this is at high levels. Right? This is at high levels when scaling is the absolute worst, with no consumables. So, in an actual speedrun setting, if this was, like, equivalent to what I do for a lot of other specs, I would be even stronger, relatively speaking. Because this would be the weakest part of the run. And obviously, stuff in uh, the open world is nowhere near as difficult to kill as stuff in dungeons. Uh, let's see... It's why these games should be considered dangerous and regulated. PvP will make it more exploitative too, because you know how people are. Yeah. Where is this druid going, dude? What is he... He picking up all the little food crates? It's not hard to do that along the way. I'm surprised it so long. I mean, he is a guardian druid, so like... At least he's killing things quickly just by nature of scaling, but he's pulling very slowly. Um... Maybe you should make an hour-long review who needs a life, am I right? I mean, here's the thing. I could absolutely fill enough stuff about Warcraft Rumble to make an hour-long review. I've already streamed it for hours, ranting the entire time about how bad the design is. So it's not that I couldn't do that. I already have more than enough footage to potentially do that. It's just by nature of that type of thing. There is absolutely no way, like physically speaking, there's no time to edit together like in a good way an hour-long video like that like even if i spent every waking moment editing videos that long are really 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 tough uh, so while i would love to spend a ton of time talking about that i don't really think i want to also the other thing is if i spend an hour talking about um warcraft rumble Oh my god! 
<laughs> I almost died. I ripped threat there. That was spooky. Actually, I don't even know how I didn't die. My health was so low there. Um, I'm pretty sure Aug is also broken in PvP, yes, Oxara. I also know basically nothing about PvP, but I know some of my PvP friends were complaining about Aug. This was a while ago. I don't know. Like, Aug has been massively nerfed since it came out. I have no idea if, since the nerfs, it has no longer become ridiculously broken in PvP, but considering it's still extremely strong in the rest of the game, I have a feeling that not a whole lot has changed. But, uh, like I said, I can't speak to that for sure. But I do know when it first came out, yes, it was the strongest spec in the game for PvP as well. According to all of my friends who PvP. Maybe they were wrong too, but I suspect they were not. Um, we got WoW toys and WoW was kind enough to remind us on every character's mail about those toys. Yeah, I did finally suck it up and collect the Warcraft Rumble shit just because like admittedly the toy box is like one of the few things where I actually do like collecting. I've been slacking off for quite a while. Where? Brother, the dungeon's not over yet. Why are you going to the quest givers? What? I guess he's a demon hunter, so maybe he can, like, get back up on that ramp, but, I mean, that, still, there's literally no point. You have two pages of that male bullshit in retail? Oh yeah, no, trust me, I am absolutely going to make, like, a short quip about that in my review, of, like, how, I, I don't know what I'll say exactly, like, I'm totally not jaded about like, getting spammed by Mizzen for the past, like, fucking week with Warcraft Rumble promotion shit. Uh, I'll probably joke about how, like, to some degree, the mail spam motivated me to make this video. Because, like, honestly, it's not entirely wrong. Like, I... I the mail spam tilted the shit out of me because it's... the It's very clearly, like, a bug that Blizzard knows about and refuses to fix because it's giving them more promotion. They can basically pretend, whoops, we didn't realize that the mail thing was being spammed to people. Ah, uh, I guess it, it sucks that you're getting reminded about our new mobile game every single time you log in. Silly us. It's very obvious that they are not fixing it because they want to increase promotion to their game. Because whenever there's a bug that benefits the players, they fix it immediately. Like, this is not news. So... The fact that Blizzard has not fixed this bug whatsoever goes to show where their priorities are. They were probably told, eh, fucking leave it. Now, the, like, super duper, uh, like, conspiracy theory idea is that Blizzard intentionally bugged it so that um, it would constantly remind the player and stuff like that. Personally, I am of the opinion that it was an accident on the original implementation, but I 100% firmly believe that the reason it still works like that is because Blizzard just doesn't give a shit because it gives them free promotion. So yes, that pisses me off because it is clearly an attempt by them to get people to play their garbage microtransaction filled game, and that makes me angry. Um, and as for what Dreamer Magister said, I'm, I'm not going to talk more about Holy Priest just because like, I already talked about it a shit ton, but just to touch upon that, I would imagine Holy Priest still keeps up 60 to 70. I mean, honestly, every single spec is pretty good, 60 to 70. Holy Priest gets so many good tools. That is, it's just a good spec, right? It is ridiculously broken. I never even got to a high enough level to realize how broken Imperial Blaze is. And we've already seen how broken it is at low levels without it. And now we've seen how broken it is at high levels with Imperial Blaze. Holy Priest is just absolutely bonkers. Uh, and now, Random Burning Crusade Dungeon on Disc Priest. So I'm I'm not doing them in the exact like order that I explained everything. I figured disc makes the most logical sense to demonstrate after holy because a lot of it is going to be overlap and then we can do stuff like um what's it called? Uh Resto Druid, etc. Imperial Blaze is amazing. Single-handedly makes up most of your DPS and keys on a one-minute CD. Exactly, yeah. One-minute cooldown for something that powerful is just actually correct. I don't want to get you nerfed, but, like, <laughs> it's it's a little bit too powerful. Um, but anyways. 
Uh, and as for uh, dungeon healing, the reality of the thing that we will see here, Dreamer Magister, is that healing most, I mean, every spec can really do the same. Because if you're keeping your party member's health above zero, that's all that matters. So at that point, that's why I build for damage with all this shit, because that's really all you care about. Um, you always love the idea of a healer that sacrifices healing in order to damage sort of a support role. I mean, that's that's literally, like, that's meant to be Disc Priest and Fist Weaving Monk. Though, it has worked like that in the past. And they just, um, have changed it because people didn't really like it. Ah, oh, Mechanar. Okay. I like Mechanar. Uh, Interface... colors there we go okay so i apply power word radiance to everybody i do holy nova when it is when there's a lot of targets like this here just spam holy nova honestly i could um i think yeah i should probably at least purge the wicked into uh, into penance just to spread the dot around, but on really high target pulls, just press Holy Nova. So here, here's just better to do to purge the wicked. Do purge the wicked again. Is penance worth pressing on a single target? This does 2,000 damage to an enemy. Mind blast is 1,500. So mind blast is worse than penance, and smite is the weakest. Out of all of them. And I'm going to Penance here. Powered Radiance. And then now we just spam Holy Nova. I should also Schism before I do it. I mean, Dispriest Damage is also pretty good too. Uh, I should do Mind Games. Mind Blast. Uh, I think this... It's like a mini boss. It's probably worth doing this. Then do my Holy Nova, Dark Reprimand, Howard Solace. Okay, you know what? God damn! That's some single target damage right there. That is a little bit crazy. So maybe I think what it might end up turning into is that Holy Priest is the king of multi-target, which admittedly is largely more useful while leveling. But Disc Priest single target, that was way more than I was doing on Holy. That was kind of crazy. Now in this situation, though, this is just a spam Holy Nova type thing. Also, the one advantage of Disc is, like, right there, I was able to just do pretty much the exact same rotation I would have wanted to for damage. Like, look at my damage here. We're still just spamming Holy Nova, but I was able to actually keep everybody alive just because it fits Disc's playstyle for healing. So that is definitely a strength. Yeah, uh, I have my full Rhapsody Holy Nova built up. Let's do Schism, do my big Holy Nova, Dark Reprimand, Solace, now Mind Blast. Oh, I, fuck, I haven't pressed Mind Games yet. Definitely want to do that. Another Dark Reprimand, Shadow or Death, and then just Holy Nova while moving. That wasn't the boss damage, no. Where is, um... Why is details not splitting? Jesus Christ, what is hitting me? The damage in this dungeon is a little bit fucking insane. Oh, this is fun. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I mean, hey, I was still able to do a shit ton of damage while... Okay, yeah, this was the boss damage, right? No. Where was the boss... 
the details just not there's details literally lost the boss damage segment hello okay so i can't see how much damage i did to the first boss i've actually i don't think i've ever seen that happen on details before where it just completely loses track of an entire fight that is not good I think it's because the warrior pulls really fast, but still shouldn't happen. Uh, but yeah, that healing felt pretty good. Uh, how quickly did the Rebels quest line get fixed after your video? A few days at most is how long Warcraft Rumble has been going on exactly. It, yeah. It's, uh... Really annoying that they do shit like that. Okay. Let's do... You know what? I'm gonna be honest. I think maybe disc is actually better. This is kind of crazy. I thought Imperial Blaze was broken. This is fucking cracked. I'm actually just cranking damage as a healer. This makes no fucking sense. This should not be a thing that can even happen. And this is at a high level when scaling is the worst. What the fuck is this damage? <laughs> this is stupid. Holy shit. Yeah, the Rebels quest got fixed in like days. Blizzard was on that shit. If it ever helps the players, they fix that shit immediately. Which is why I said it's bad that, you know, they just leave this shit not, or like the mail thing still bugs because we all know that they can fix it if they wanted to because they do that shit immediately all the time they kind of like shoot themselves in the foot with that like if they were to whenever like something got discovered like the secret quest line thing if they didn't try to fix it literally immediately then maybe players would give them some leeway in these cases and be like oh maybe blizzard just doesn't really know about it yet but we've seen what they do when there's a bug that benefits players. We know that they are right on top of that shit. So obviously, when they don't fix something, it's blatantly obvious that, okay, yeah, they just don't care at all. They can maybe, like, do themselves a favor by not fucking over players at every chance they get. Uh... Yeah, what's funny, though, is, like, in both specs, it doesn't matter whether I'm playing, like, Holy or uh, Disc. Holy Nova is still, like, my top damage in all situations. <laughs> it's actually fucking stupid how much this button does. Oh, fuck. Yeah, Purge the Wicked and Penance do, like, a decent amount, though. I fuck, I forgot to put up Purge the Wicked. <laughs> I should also, honestly, at this point, I should be PAing myself. Like, I haven't really been using PI in general because, like, I don't really think it would have made a huge difference, but, like, holy fuck. That is some damage. Oh, the tank left. Never mind. Fuck you. Do you have the the double PI? Uh, I mean, I could take double PI. Like, that is technically speaking something I could do. But at the same time, fuck everybody else. Like, I'm just going to PI myself. Now, what are they going to do with 100% increased haste? Are they going to do as much damage as the fucking disc priest? Apparently not. Because goddamn, this spec cooks. 
Don't let them know Holy Nova is that broken. I mean, I already made a video on it months ago. Thankfully, they haven't changed it. Um, does Mole Machine unlock account wide? No, unfortunately, Mole Machine Mole Machine unlocks for Dark Irons are character based, so there's you only have the starting ones. Uh, Star Rail also gives a good amount of jades for free. Overwatch Two also has power in their battle pass, which you just get, which you pay to get weeks quicker. So. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know a ton about Overwatch 2, so I, I definitely can't comment on that much. Um, they should fix the whole achievement bug thing. You always get confused after the second buck, uh, boss in Ramparts 2. Yeah. Um, what achievement thing on Alana? I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> you paid not to have advertising in this game? Exactly. Uh, Jesper said, I don't think they would do it like that. It just makes players hate the game and they haven't even tried it. I mean, yeah, like I said, I don't personally believe that they intentionally did that. But I will say there is absolutely no question that they know about the bug and they are intentionally not fixing it. That is not even a question. Because as we've said, if they want a bug to be fixed, they will fix that bug. Or they will address it, right? People have been asking them, or like at least making posts about it where Blizzard can read it multiple times over the last week saying, hey, Blizzard, you know that we're getting spammed in the mail, right? This is really annoying. Can you please fix this? So if they didn't see it happening within their own game, which obviously they did, they would have seen it happening when people brought it to their attention multiple times, which I'm sure they did. And yet we have seen no post addressing it. We, I, I think... I haven't noticed it happening quite as much lately, so maybe within the last few days they fixed it, but it went on for over a week, easily, where they didn't fix it. There's literally one reason why they would not fix it, and it's because they think it's a good thing. They don't want to change it because they're like, hey, free advertising for our game. And I'm sure you could argue that like some people will hate it just because of that. I don't really think that holds up. Uh, unfortunately, I think if anything, it would draw more attention and more like mental bandwidth to their game because more people are going to be thinking about it because they see it every time they, they open their mailbox. And I'm sure they are banking on a lot of World of Warcraft players downloading Rumble and trying it because of the nostalgia factor. It heavily plays into classic WoW nostalgia, which isn't a bad thing, at least when the game is good, uh, but it obviously isn't. So I absolutely do think it is intentional that they did not fix it. Do I think it is intentional that the bug was in there in the first place? No. But I do think there was very much a case of, eh, don't fix it. It doesn't really matter. Let's put that bug at the bottom of the pile, right? I think that's kind of how it went. And I don't really think that is a very controversial opinion, given their traditional stance towards fixing things. Um... Let's see. Uh, IQ Water said, BlizzCon Ipe. Uh, also, hey, how's it going? It's going well. I'm glad you're excited for BlizzCon. And what else did I miss? Uh, how quickly? Oh, yeah, I read that already. There's no way they fix issues with Warcraft Rumble because those issues aren't issues for people selling the game. It's a money printer. Yeah, I mean, I was more referring to the, um, the bug present with like the mail, but you're also correct that obviously they're not going to fix issues with Warcraft Rumble because those are not issues. Those are intentional design features, right? The fact that the game is ridiculously grindy and kneecaps free to play players is not a problem in Blizzard's eyes. That is a feature. So, yeah. Uh, this is going to be a quick take, but you don't even bother with dots and leveling these days. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm wondering if it's worth it, because technically speaking, Purge the Wicked, over its duration, but it's a 20 second duration. I actually did not realize it was that long. That is a lot. That actually, yeah, might not be worth it. Uh, if it was faster, I would say it would probably be worth using. But I think in this case, like, yeah, it's just, it doesn't do nearly enough to justify using it. I don't even think... I think, like, on a boss, right, it's probably worth pressing just because, like, a boss is probably going to live long enough to get the full 2,000 damage. And, you know, it's perfectly fine to apply it as I'm running towards the mob. But, yeah, it, I don't think it'll... 
be that good. Here, just Holy Nova. Penance also deals decent single target, but it's kind of impossible for me to do anything because this, yeah, level 13 Guardian Druid. I mean, hey, won't complain. But that's what you're going to see in a lot of these <laughs> dungeons where my contribution doesn't really even matter. Uh, you know, at low level characters, though, just, you know, scaling is broken. We already know this. We've seen it a million times. The other thing that is nice about both pre-specs, though, is they have a lot of instant cast abilities. So even if I'm not contributing a ton of damage, I can just hold W and press Holy Nova. And like, sure, I'm only doing like a fraction of those two players' damage, but I'm able to do that while moving, so I'm keeping up with the group. A lot of other specs, especially like Resto Shaman, that's kind of one of the issues it faces. Chain Lightning, unless you have Stormkeeper, is something that you need to sit down and actually cast. Same with Lava Burst. So a lot of times in a dungeon like this, whereas I am going to be doing like a fraction of my normal healing, like, or normal damage. Like I did basically none of that on the boss. Okay, happens. And on AoE pulls, I'm going to be doing maybe a quarter of the damage that I could theoretically hit if things weren't dying immediately. But while I can hit a quarter of that damage, and even then it doesn't matter because the reason I'm only hitting a quarter is because the Guardian Druid's one-shotting anything, at least I'm maybe saving like 10 seconds in this run. Marginal amount, but it is still something. Whereas on a Shaman, I would be doing proportionally less of my damage because I would have to spend a lot of my time just holding W instead of actually sitting still and casting. Whenever there's a large AoE pull, Shaman could also just press Stormkeeper and Double Chain Lightning, and that would contribute a lot. So Shaman is definitely up there. But I think what we'll see with like Resto Druid is while they can keep up Sunfire and Moonfire, it wouldn't be nearly as much as like spamming Holy Nova while kiting along with the group. Same with, um, I guess, Miss Weaver Monk has some stuff. Miss Weaver Monk would probably just be spamming Spinning Crane Kick, which would do comparatively less than Holy Nova, but still a decent amount. Uh, I'll spend talent points after this. Have you tried using Dominate Minds on any of the trash? Nah, I that I'm not going to bother with. There's absolutely no way I'd want to do that. I don't really think it would actually help. Um, it's not a bad idea. There definitely are some like trash mobs in certain dungeons that have like ridiculously broken abilities, but generally speaking, I think the amount of damage I would get by doing that would not even remotely be worth it. I should um. At the very least, be using Power Word Shield, just because that gives me a 10% damage bonus. So that is probably still worth pressing in addition to just hitting Holy Nova. Let's see, how much single target damage can I do? We're going to put up Mindbender, Schism, I'm going to do Mind Games. Ah! Uh... Oh, the, that's not... This is, okay, yeah, actually not that much. Um, yeah. It, it is interesting, though, how when you're allowed to get, like, your full ramp going, Disc actually does a lot. But in a lot of dungeons, it doesn't have time to get the full ramp going. I do think, like, if you were to do this in a questing environment, it would be pretty good. Like... Disc Priest, I feel, would make Mince Meat out of Yetimus, because you would be able to kill him by the time your ramp is over. So, I think that would be perfectly fine. You wonder how HPAL will do? I don't think HPAL will be bad, but I think one of the problems with HPAL, for sure, is that there is absolutely no way that HPAL will be even remotely as good as, um, as Ret or Prot, which are both very strong for leveling. Now, admittedly, Disc and Holy are both kind of cracked as far as healers are concerned. I think these are going to be the two strongest healers by far, which I think is a, one of the reasons why I decided to start with them.
also because we've seen it before, so we kind of know this already. But the other reason why they are so nice is it means priests, generally speaking, have a lot of good options to choose from. Because even though you don't have a tank spec, your healer specs are you're just kind of broken. And Shadow's good. You know, already did the Shadow Priest run. It wasn't bad at all. But for dungeons, this is definitely the way to go because it's still crazy damage and you're getting healer cues. So there's just uh, no reason to do anything else. Um... Do you have the... Oh, I, I read that already. Uh, it gives you the achievement and tells you the dungeon is finished for killing the second boss. Oh, you mean the... Yeah, the ramparts thing being bugged. Yeah, I guess... I, I don't know if that's a bug, because that has technically always been in the game. So it's... It is intended behavior, because the achievement is literally just to kill Omor the Unscarred. So where is... Hellfire Ramparts. That's the only thing the achievement is for. So, it's not a bug. Also, interesting, I did Hellfire Ramparts back in 2015. I, I don't remember. When when did I play this character? I must have done TBC Dungeons on it. Because I've clearly done some of these dungeons before. But, I, I don't know. This is... I had this priest a very, 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 very long time ago. I I think I made this character in Wad. It's been a hot minute. Um, this was actually the I used the name Larice on this character before I ever created my monk, or rather before I race changed my monk and made Larice that character. So I always I I had the name Larice on one of my alts and I liked it and I named this priest that, but I don't play priest. So then when I decided to race change my monk in Tomb of Sargeras. I decided to use Larice as like a blood elf and the name because I liked it. And that's what my monk has been ever since. But technically this version of Larice existed um, well before my uh, monk version of Larice. At least I think so. I don't know. It's It's been a while. Um, if BlizzCon had a live Q&A, one of the questions would absolutely be, why are players getting bombarded with mail spam? Yeah, that would be amusing. Are you excited for BlizzCon? Um, define excited. Uh, I, I kind of talked about this earlier, but no, not really. I don't really have any major expectations i think like yeah like dreamer said um you have almost no expectations no hype yeah kind of that's my same thing i'm not like i don't hate the fact that there's a blizzcon like i'm not upset about it or anything it's just it's kind of like what you said i have literally zero excitement whatsoever for blizzcon if anything i am yeah Jesus, Naomi, stop completing my sentences. I, I am actually more nervous for the potential announcement of no patch 10.3 than like anything else. So literally exactly what Naomi said. I'm more scared of BlizzCon than excited for it. I don't think I'm going to be massively impressed by any new expansion news. We're obviously going to get a new expansion announcement. Cool. But as I said before earlier in the stream, which I don't think you were here for, but... um. Generally speaking, like in new uh, expansion announcements, they focus more on like the world and stuff. They give a cursory overview of any mechanical changes. So I don't really think we're going to get much meat on that. So I, I don't know. I'm not terribly excited. I don't really care where we go. I'm more concerned with like the mechanical stuff. And I don't really think we're going to get much info on that. So the only meaningful information I think we might get out of BlizzCon is what the plan is for the rest of Dragonflight. And if that's good, cool. But if they say that they're not doing a patch 10.3, then I am very concerned for the future of the game and the future of the content that they plan on designing. But I don't know. I, it's I, I guess like at worst, I will be content or 
At best, I should say. At best, I will be content with BlizzCon. At worst, I will be very concerned for the future of the game. I'm not saying the game is dead if they don't make a final patch, but I'm saying if they announce that there's no final patch and they don't give a very, 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 very good reason for it, then I will be very concerned about where they may be going. Uh, I think that's a good way to, to describe it. Um... Let's see. In a single target, uh, Purge the Wicked might make sense, or with Expatiation or Penance Spread. Yeah, what was the Expatiation again? Um, yeah, this one. Uh, yeah. That, that makes sense. I could see that. I think I will probably take that now, actually. That, uh, makes sense to do here. But honestly... This is definitely a weird situation where when a Guardian Druid is just one-shotting everything, there is absolutely no point in me trying to put up dots at all. Dots here would be a complete waste. So, a little bit hard to evaluate. I'm just going to get as much upfront damage as I possibly can. Yeah, Bear Go Burr. <laughs> it is funny how you can never escape Guardian Druid, right? Even in a completely unrelated run, you get to see how Guardian Druid is, yes, the most broken leveling spec in the entire game. Even when I am not the one playing it, Guardian Druids will still be hard carrying on damage. Because that is just how broken their scaling is. Moonfire hits like a truck, Thrash hits like a truck, everything Guardian Druid does hits like a truck. And it's completely spammable and has really... Hi, uh, words really high range and uh they also have really good survivability there is just no downside to guardian druid whatsoever it is a ridiculously overpowered leveling spec and that is a good thing and i hope blizzard doesn't change that uh when set up properly disc doesn't make a lot of trade-offs between stuff yeah i think that is definitely a good strength for it though it definitely like it doesn't feel bad you know I think in this exact situation, Holy Priest might be doing slightly more damage just because Imperial Blaze would get, be giving you marginally more upfront damage. But it's like, do we even really count this? I think we've already seen through that Mechanar run that when you don't have people carrying the rest of the damage, Disc Priest is perfectly able to carry the damage on their own. So for like a single target, uh, or what do you call it, a solo questing experience... I think they would be perfectly viable. I'm not going to do an entire run with them because it, we've already done a priest run and they're all going to play fairly similar, right? So we already know Holy can do it. All this confirms is that Disc can also do it in addition to the other specs. Um, your guess is that you're getting a new season for Classic. Yeah. Uh, I expect, so personally, I don't think that there's they're going to skip the final patch. I think we are getting a final patch. So they've already said that there's going to be a lot of Warcraft news at BlizzCon and quite frankly, not much else. So I think what they're going to try to do is they're going to try and shove Warcraft Rumble down our throats a little bit. And then as far as actual news, we're going to get the new World of Warcraft expansion. And I think we're going to get cursory information on it. No nothing major. We are going to get information on 10.3, a bit more concrete stuff, especially since 10.2.5 uh, will be available pretty much right after BlizzCon, according to WoWhead's current data mining. And we will also get a new classic season. Classic Plus does not exist. Um, oh yeah, we're also going to get Cataclysm Classic, obviously. Announcement, at least. So, I fully expect that the only one that is a bit up in the air is next patch. They might just scrap the final patch and go into the next expansion. We already know we're getting a new expansion. Uh, we already know we are getting a Season of Mastery, and we already know we're getting Cla or Cataclysm Classic. That All three things are guaranteed. The only thing that is technically not 100% guaranteed is the next patch, but I suspect that that is still coming, and... If it is, they are almost certainly going to give us some information about it. Uh, just spamming Holy Nova is 100% not the most optimal. What I mean, Naomi, is I, I agree that, like, in theory, it's not the most optimal. 
I genuinely think right now it is the most optimal because if we are talking about like my personal damage contribution here, I don't know if like maybe if I penance the single target right at the very end of the pull to get like a tiny bit of extra damage, realistically speaking, with this Guardian Druid doing all that he's doing, I am going to speed up the dungeon infinitely more just by spamming Holy Nova than by trying to do an actual rotation because I will be basically ramping and then before my ramp is complete, everything will be dead because of the Guardian Druid. So when I said that spamming Holy Nova is the most efficient thing, I meant specifically in this one niche case. Things like Divine Star, but like Divine Star does, um, I, I don't really think it would. Divine Star does 830 damage. Holy Nova, with zero stacks, does 663 damage, so it does marginally less damage for one cast than Divine Star. Maybe replacing a single Holy Nova with Divine Star would be worth it, but does Divine Star have a cast time? Okay, it is instant cast. Maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And I guess Divine Star does hit twice. Yeah, Divine Star is two damage instances, but you also have to consider, are we benefiting from that second damage instance? So, I think Mind Games is better in theory, because, right, if we have Holy Nova to carry AoE, then Mind Games in single target is stronger than Divine Star is in AoE, relatively speaking. Now, obviously, in this particular case, you could argue that I barely get the chance to even use mind games because there's so few situations like this where I can even press it before things are dead. But there definitely are some situations like here. So I think speeding up this boss fight with mind games actually makes a lot more sense than taking Divine Star and maybe speeding up trash by a non-noticeable amount. You personally hate mind games? That's fair enough. Um, what about next time you play a tank and I play a healer and see what's going on? You play 99% of healers. Uh, I mean, I do all my love links solo. Uh, in rare cases, if I'm playing a pure DPS spec, I will sometimes, and, it, and it's only for testing runs. If it's a solo speed run, then that's all it is. It's a solo speed run. At most, I will do random dungeon queues, completely solo. If I am doing a 40 to 60 testing run, where I'm specifically trying to test how the spec functions at a higher level, and it's not a complete speedrun. On pure DPS specs, I have sometimes accepted 10 queues, specifically because those queues will take forever, and at that point, I value the watchability of the stream slash run more than um, the... Uh, more than, like, the slight advantage I will have by queuing with a tank. But for anything else, I do not... Uh, queue with tanks. I would prefer to uh, do it on my own because I feel like that's a more accurate test. Um, let me see. You want to see what's next, but you're also bummed about there not being any extra panels from what you can tell. Yeah, I mean, I am kind of surprised at how little information they seem to be giving out. Like, there is a a what's next and a deep dive. Is there even... What, what is... Hold on. Let me, let me find the exact schedule. Because it is apparently very lacking from what I'm... I remember there being at BlizzCon in the past. Let's do this. It's decent single target, honestly. <laughs> Hilarious that on single target, my hardest hitting spell is Holy Nova. <laughs> that makes no fucking sense. Why is that doing so much damage? I, I genuinely cannot understand how Holy Nova hits as hard as it does. Actually fucking stupid. <sighs> um. Oh, wait, this guy is almost dead. Oh. Well, he pressed Frenzied Regen and then his health went up, so. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I... See, that's the problem. I try to press buttons that aren't Holy Nova, and then the mob is just dead before I can even channel Penance. 
Is it? Well, oh, no, it is. I Goose Comics, you are correct. It is 100% because of the talent. I like, so I am like sarcastic. I, I understand why it is happening. I'm not saying I don't understand why it's doing that much damage. I'm just saying that it should not be doing that much damage. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm happy that it is because it's fun to press one button and have it hit like a fucking truck. But the fact that Holy Nova, an AoE ability, is able to be my top single target hit because of that talent. It, I think that talent might be a little bit too overtuned. Just saying, that that was kind of more my point there. Yeah, honestly, I even that time Shadow or Death fucking blasted. So, oh, is the tank leaving? He just said, thanks all. So I'm not sure if that means that he's done for now. Oh, no, he's rethinking. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mind Games is a dope ability. Yeah, personally, I think Mind Games is fine. Um, you're surprised at how little info they're giving out. Still more content in, Blizzger, in BlizzCon than most of their games. Yeah, for sure. It is kind of surprising that we're getting so little. Okay, here we go. BlizzCon 2023 broadcast schedule. So opening ceremony, WoW, what's next? WoW Classic, what's next? And then they have Warcraft Rumble uh, later on in the day. And then there is no WoW Classic Deep Dive. So we're getting a WoW Deep Dive. I think, or at least I assume based on what this means, uh, WoW Classic, we're, we're not getting a Season of Mastery, right? Or we're, words. We're not getting Classic Plus. So there's not really much to talk about. I think they have like one hour to talk about Cataclysm Classic and the new Season of Mastery or whatever it is. Yeah, that's probably more than enough time to cover that stuff. Um, I really don't see that taking an extremely long time to discuss. Because, like, Cataclysm, we generally know what to expect. Obviously, it's an older expansion being brought back. It's the same thing they've always done with Classic. The only thing really to discuss is potential changes they're making. And I suspect they will probably make a fair few changes. And considering their time is most likely going to be split 50-50, talking about both uh, Classic plus in the sense of Season of Mastery and Cataclysm probably makes sense. But yeah, I mean, if you were hoping for confirmation on there being Classic Plus coming, it's pretty clear there's not, considering there is no Classic Deep Dive, which makes sense. Um, but that seems like more than sufficient to discuss the new stuff. Uh, as for World of Warcraft, I would imagine they're probably going to spend like talk about like in the opening ceremony a bit more about the expansion they will probably spend my my thinking is that the what's next will focus more on the next patch like the end of dragonflight and then it'll touch a little bit on the new expansion and then the deep dive on november 4th will most certainly be about the new expansion which is why i think if they have an entire deep dive planned that is almost definitely going to be new expansion stuff, so they're probably going to spend more time talking about the next patch, the end of Dragonflight, etc. within the what's next section on the third. That is at least how I think they're going to be doing it. Of course, that is speculation. I could be wrong. Wow, classic mobile hardcore. Oh man, that would be a good way to piss off the entire classic player base. Um... They're 100% removing the gold guild perks. Yeah. There are definitely some things like that where, like, in hindsight, I can understand why they wouldn't want that to happen. Um, the guild perks in general, I kind of hope get revamped. The guild perks, I think they were a neat idea when they were introduced. Personally, I honestly think we should just get... Oh, I'm not in a guild right now on this character. I think we should just get, like, a modernized version of the guild perks. I think still keep some of the, the fun things like have group will travel, uh, mass resurrection. I get why they removed that, but it is still an iconic part of, like, Cataclysm, 
So I think like removing that stuff would kind of suck. But uh, almost certainly they remove the, the perk. I honestly, I kind of hope that they just make it so the experience stuff is baked in baseline. And like everybody gets that automatically and you don't need to like earn it because having to like join a guild to get faster leveling and stuff, that was always a little bit annoying. So I think unlocking the utility things like mobile banking, etc., that's fine. But I do really hope that they just either make all the other stuff unlocked all at once so you don't need to get like different ranks of it or remove it entirely in the case of the gold thing, which is what I suspect they will do. Yeah, we're definitely talking about cataclysm, not the um not the retail ones for sure. The retail guild perks I think are fun. And I think a lot of the stuff that got removed over the years, it makes sense why they removed it. Um But I think even some of the stuff that may not be super healthy for the game in the long term, it's iconic for cataclysm, specifically the mass summon. Like I have fond memories of doing dumb shit with, like, Mass Summon, which, you know, have group will travel. Uh, I think even though, yes, it was unhealthy for the game in the long term, it's Cataclysm Classic. Who gives a shit? Just bring it back. Like, if they want to remove it in later versions of Classic, sure. Uh, you want to use XP Flag, but your guild does not have that? Yeah, I mean, th that's different. I'm talking about something completely different than the XP Flag. Uh, you forgot there were even guild perks in retail. Mass summon was fucking hilarious. Yeah, I remember doing, um, like, mass summoning an entire raid into the Deep Run Tram and then raiding Iron Forge and just zerging them out of, like, the gnome area. Made it really easy to do those achievements because all you needed to do is have one rogue stealth into Iron Forge or Stormwind, get into the Deep Run Tram, and then have the entire raid uh, stealth in or get summoned in and then run out and completely nuked the mob made it basically impossible to detect to detect incoming raids what level am i 57 still a little bit of a go uh i can take shattered perceptions expatiation twilight equilibrium Uh, this also means I should be alternating, I should be alternating holy and shadow spells. Huh. If only I had shadow or pain, so I could alternate between that and holy nova. I would imagine purge the wicked counts as a holy spell, not a shadow spell. Because it does radiant damage. Um, yeah, the only problem is, uh, yeah, I did talent into that. It, um, Purge does, can I just, like, talent out of Purge the Wicked? Hilariously, that might actually be stronger. See, here's the thing, I, I'm well aware that, like, you don't need to play around... Um, Twilight Equilibrium. But right now, if all of my damage is coming from Holy Nova, it would genuinely be a damage increase to do... Uh, okay, hold on. Let me make sure this guy doesn't die. I think it would genuinely be better for me to drop Purge the Wicked entirely, take Shadow Word Pain, and just keep alternating Shadow Word Pain, Holy Nova. Shadow Word Pain, Holy Nova. I think that would result in more damage overall. Yeah, but like, I can't... So obviously I could use Shadow Covenant Divine Star. I'm aware of that. Thing is, I don't really want to rely on Shadow Covenant. That is definitely an option, though. But then I still think outside of Shadow Covenant Divine Star, because that won't be up all the time, I would still want to be spamming uh, Shadow Word Pain in between. So actually... I can't do this in combat. Okay. I, I guess I'll do this at the end of the dungeon if I remember. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me scroll up. A lot of messages came in really quick.
Uh, let's see. Procking Nature's Guardian on a Shaman and then turning it into damage. Oh, wow, this guy got blasted. I look away for one second and suddenly he's stunned and taking a crap load of damage. Could have been very scary there. Uh, let's see. I mean, hey, at this point, as long as I keep pressing Holy Nova, at least he's getting some healing, and I'm helping with damage. In the key you did with Mode Mode a couple weeks ago, he was at 80k DPS overall, and a uh, Bracken Hide 24 as a disc, with 60% of his damage being Holy Nova. Yeah. Uh, in that case, yeah, I don't even think it is low-level scaling. Oh my god, this guy got one shot. Um. All right. Well, that's, uh, not much I can do about that one. Woo! What is even hitting me? I think I lagged or something? I was getting meleeed while kiting. So... All right, that eh, this game sucks sometimes. Ah, uh, let's see. Blizz just put a twelve-month sub reward. You're waiting for BlizzCon new expansion marketing to. Are you waiting for BlizzCon new expansion announcement to re renew? You wonder if uh, you'll sub again if they skip ten point three. And make you wait a year for the next expansion. Yeah, that would definitely be a bad move on Blizzard's part, for sure. Next season of Classic would be their best bet. That's what you're hoping for. They might just do the obvious boring stuff. I mean, like, okay. I guess we technically are not guaranteed to get a new season of Classic at BlizzCon. It is happening, though. That is, like, the reason I say it's guaranteed is because we know for sure that we are getting a new season of Classic at some point, eventually, unclear exactly when. Now, I would assume they have been talking about it for almost a year now, that they are going to do it eventually. And uh, Wowhead has already shown that there is a data mined uh, locked 1.14 or something like that in the WoW Classic client. So I would say it is nearly guaranteed that we are going to get classic or a new classic season at blizzcon but we know it is happening right like that is not even a question it it's just like are we getting it as at blizzcon or are we getting it at some point soon tm at this point it has been soon tm for such a long time that if they don't announce it at blizzcon i don't know when the fuck they would announce it because they have been teasing this for the longest time that they're going to do another season of mastery it's been kind of wild so we know for a fact that we're getting Cataclysm Classic. We know for a fact that we're getting a new expansion. The things that are not 100% confirmed but still likely are the patch and uh, the Classic Season, but I would say there is a good chance that we are getting both of those things. Um, let's see. Petri Flasks are... Bought for real money, though. Yeah, true. And if that they had WoW Classic Mobile Hardcore, definitely they would have Petri Flasks as a microtransaction. Though knowing Blizzard, you would probably need to buy randomized consumables to have a chance of being able to purchase a Petri Flask. The good old Warcraft Rumble approach. Uh, let's see... You're new to healing, and you started a Disc Priest. You love the playstyle, but you can't wait for them to call a few keybinds. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a Disc Priest player, so... I can't speak to how it feels at endgame, but... Um... I'm gonna be honest, compared to a lot of specs I've leveled, this is definitely lower on the keybind ends. So... I... would say they're probably not going to change much. Given that, if they're going to remove buttons from some spec, it is... It's not going to be this one. Because this still feels way lower than... Um, like Brewmaster, Windwalker, a lot of a lot of other stuff out there. 
Uh, and Naomi said Miss Weaver. Yeah, I haven't played Miss Weaver in a while, so I can't speak to uh, how many keybinds it has these days, but I could definitely see that being a bit much. Uh, I feel like, honestly, playing around Twilight Equilibrium is giving me a lot of damage. I didn't play it perfectly there, I tried to pay a bit more attention towards the end, but yeah, that felt pretty good. Um, let's see. Wouldn't be more effective to go after level 30 to do four time walking dungeons? This is not a speedrun, we are testing. I am specifically doing Burning Crusade dungeons because that is what you do for dungeons in an actual speedrun. So we are just kind of testing like a similar format, right? Obviously, if uh, you can handle healing and doing damage in any of these uh, Burning Crusade dungeons, well, this is what you'll be encountering in a realistic environment. So that is why I'm doing testing here. Let me do this. I think, yeah, Holy Nova was just barely in range there. Ah, that, that is some good damage, especially now that the Guardian Druid is already level 21. You know, his one-shot scaling is starting to fall off a little bit. So, what level am I? 58? Well, I could do more dungeons. And I can still turn in these quests. Uh, if Shadowward Pain is going to increase damage more than another Holy Cast, um, that's fair. Yeah, I think maybe just spamming Holy Nova would be better. And I already have enough tools to enable it on... Uh, what's it called? I have enough tools to enable me to do, like, good damage in general. Shattered Halls? Okay, you don't see this one too often. I think I actually just got Shattered Halls fairly recently. Which run was it? I think it was the Rogue speedrun. Not the Assassination, but the Outlaw run, I think I got Shattered Halls. I forget exactly. I should also be applying Atonements, because that gives me damage. Um, but... Oh well. And here, I'll, I'll pick up Divine Star, since people keep mentioning it. So we'll get this, we'll get Divine Star. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ, Brambles hits like a fucking truck. No, wait, is, uh, is Holy Nova applying Atonement? I didn't even consider that. Um, no, it's only direct healing spells or things like Radiance. So I should be keeping Atonement up because it's like... When I have Atonement... Which, which is it? Yeah, I can get up to 40% increased damage. So considering that's also making it easier to keep people alive... Probably worth doing. I'm gonna Radiance here. I'm gonna Mind Games. Mind Blast. do this. I'm uh, just going to spam this for a little bit, then Divine Star. 
this castigation or not castigation penance. Yeah, damage wise, this feels good. I mean, it, it's all just funneling more into Holy Nova. Hey, if it works, it works. We don't have a rogue, so there's no way to get through there. Yeah, I don't know. Divine Star, definitely, it, you know, it did some damage there. I guess there's technically two Divine Stars on that list, so it's not... It's a little bit higher than this breakdown at a glance would seem to indicate. But... Um, Holy Nova spam is definitely still ridiculous. It is interesting, though, because I had assumed that Holy Priest would be stronger with Holy Nova spam. And they are both really good. I, I don't know which one's better. It is actually tough to say. Because the thing about Holy Priest is Imperial Blaze makes up for a lot of your damage as well. But... Shadow Priest has a million different ways to modify your um, your Holy Nova damage. Okay. This Holy Nova. Oh shit, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm gonna do Shadower Death, Holy Nova, Shadower Death. Nova. Um, I have to interact with something, right? There's like a quest item. What do I do again? This thing. Yeah, retrieve fell ember. Alright, this should be more than enough to get me to 60. The rest of this dungeon plus the uh, quests would be enough. Um, and yeah, Holy Nova even on pretty much a single target is still nuts. So I think building that into your single target rotation is definitely worth doing. Uh, you may be thinking too much of Endgame and not this degen leveling setup. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely... Um, on how to how do I you have a quest item in your bags use it near the fire um as a priest player it's not worth trying to go between it happens if you play naturally yes. So I, I know what you're saying. I'm well aware that the way that you're supposed to play it at max level is you just go between naturally. What I am specifically talking about is because while leveling, Holy Nova makes up a disproportionately large portion of my damage, right? This is not normal, right? You're not supposed to be using Holy Nova on every other GCD, obviously. So, and also I'm pretty sure, right, this is, um, which one? Yeah, damaging shadow spells. So, like, I, this is going to be something that, like, when I am, you know, doing raid bosses or something like that, it, it's a little bit different. Uh, but I'm specifically trying to see how much can I amplify Holy Nova. That was the entire point of considering that. Uh, here, while I wait, I'm just reading chat. 15% of a Holy Nova plus one Shadow Word Pain versus 100% of a Holy Nova. Yeah. It, like, if the Shadow Word Pain is contributing, like, a significant amount of damage, maybe, but I think in realistic settings, that would only be on single target. And on single target, as we've seen, I have other ways to trigger it. 
so it's not quite as much. Pulled it right out of that. I think, yeah, I have... Okay, I got some of them with that Twilight Equilibrium. Go Shadow Divine Star. Dark Reprimand. Cancel it so I can get the buff. Yeah, so like here, I'm just, I'm like using, for instance, my... Uh, Dark Reprimand, just one tick of it, literally just to enable uh, the increased damage on Holy Nova. Because at that point, it's not like, I, I don't know, it may be, I, I, I have no idea if that's worth it or not. It feels like it's worth it. The other thing you need to consider, though, is, well, I don't know if that necessarily makes up for it. Spamming only um, Holy Nova you're never really going to get a ton of Rhapsody stacks. So in the time it takes me to get that 15% bonus, I'm also gaining a stacking bonus on Holy Nova because I'm not really losing damage, right? Now, as for whether, like, what the exact amount is that makes it worth it, I honestly, I could not tell you. But... I still think it is worth noting that this stuff is a little bit weird and not 100% intuitive. We go Dark Reprimand. On single target, it's definitely worth doing, though. I do Smite this. I should probably do, in this case, Purge the Wicked. And then this, Holy Nova, Shadow of Death, Holy Nova. I don't know if that's perfect, but it is just, you know, Holy Nova hits really fucking hard. Yeah, it definitely is a really complicated math problem compared to a lot of the other specs we've tested. There's like so many varying modifiers at play here, I have no idea what exactly would be the best. The easiest solution is obviously you press Holy Nova and it does a ridiculous amount of damage. And considering, like, it, it honestly isn't even bad, that might just be like the no-brainer solution. There's also like, you know, the weird case of is it even worth pressing Power Word Shield to maintain the 10% damage bonus on Holy Nova? Like, I would argue it probably is in the long term, but I, I don't know. At the same time, you could just press one more Holy Nova. In a situation like this where I know I'm about to be spamming Holy Nova on multiple targets and there's only one target alive, then technically, yeah. In that case, pressing Power Word Shield is probably good. I have, I have no idea, though. So, like here, on, um, uh, Uh, yeah, like, no matter how you slice it, that felt pretty good. Uh, Shadow or Death definitely fucks at the end, compared to Holy Nova on a pure single target. But, weaving Holy Nova, like, compared to even Smite, like, the base level of Holy Nova hits harder on a single target than Smite. So I think using, using, like, Shadow Covenant, um, Dark Reprimand Penances to enable me to just hit Holy Nova and make it hit harder, I think is just overall better. But it's hard to say for certain. Either way, yeah, that felt nuts. 
Uh, the fact that Disc Priest can put out that much single target is ludicrous. I genuinely don't even know which one's better, though. Holy or Disc. I think, like, when played properly, Disc does more single target, and it does, like, comparable AoE. But also, the holy AoE playstyle is really mindless, and it, it starts scaling at much earlier. Honestly, I think I'm the tier list. I just slot them both into A tier right next to each other. It, like, they both felt insane. It's just so hard to say which one felt better, because they were both ridiculously overpowered. Uh, okay. I I'm gonna hop on to the next character, but before I start the run, I'm going to just, uh, let's knock out Resto Druid just to get that out of the way. Now that we've dealt with that. Actually, you know what? Since I'm on this server, fuck it. We're just going to do Miss Weaver next. Let me, um... Let me, let me read stuff that I missed. Uh, let's see. You're glad you don't know what a Petri Flask is? It's a, a classic hardcore thing. Uh, buy this mysterious cauldron and find out what consumables you get, and then 0.0001% chance of getting a Petri Flask. Exactly. Uh, what exactly is a Season of Mastery? Season of Mastery is basically like a classic, a variation on classic WoW. Think a Diablo season, but in classic. You can also literally look at what they did for the original Season of Mastery. It's something they've already done. People just think they're going to do a lot more for the next one. But it we don't know yet. Uh, there we go. Portal to Outlands. See, so yeah, let me just catch up on chat before I queue. Um, I I have no idea what they plan on combining. Uh, they they may do that on Alana. I I am not a disc expert. I'm just saying that realistically speaking, compared to a lot compared to a lot of other stuff I've played, disc doesn't have that many buttons. It does have a lot of relevant buttons, especially at low levels. Now, I could just be spamming Holy Nova, so I think a lot of specs are a bit less involved at lower levels, but at higher levels, like Brewmaster has a million buttons, so. Um... Brambles is busted. Yep. Uh, Atonement doesn't do DPS in the main application. Yeah, no, what I was saying... Yeah, it was Sins the Many, specifically. It's actually just a flat 40% damage buff. I guess I'm, I'm already off disc. I didn't realize. Uh, Purge the Wicked gets consumed by some spells for more damage. Yes. Yeah, it does um, does do weird stuff. It's like, and I gotta pop up. Oh, the Bronzo donated... Uh, is that Euros? I think that's Euros. 20 Euros. Thank you very much, Bronzo. I appreciate it. Uh, and I also saw, I, I was still, like, catching up on chat, but you said earlier, amazing, you finally got to see me live. Thanks to you, you've leveled up uh, four characters now to 70, and you have item level 400. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that the leveling guides have helped you out. I uh, love what I do, made you go for speedrunning myself a lot. I'm glad to hear that. I'm definitely happy to see more people getting into speedrunning. Always fun to see more people enjoying it. I mean, at this point, admittedly, I've, like, done it so much that it's, like, a little bit samey, but I still like, you know, spicing things up, doing, you know, Miss Weaver runs and such. But thank you again for the donation. That is much appreciated. Uh, let me see. You took a spatiate? Yeah. You get lost with disc spell interactions in general. It's an interesting spec for sure, though. I will say... I could see myself, like, if I was really trying to play a healer at endgame, I would really enjoy that. There was a lot going on. I don't know how it would play optimally, but I feel like trying to understand the proper, like, burst rotation is something that I think I would have a lot of fun trying to figure out. And I feel like I got, I got decently close. Of course, I'm pretty sure you're not going to be hitting uh, Holy Nova on single target in uh, endgame content, at least... I would assume not. Maybe it really is just that broken, even on single target at level 70, but that definitely felt like more of a leveling, scaling thing. Hello, Kent W. Good to see you. On uh, single target, you're better off using Purge the Wicked to refresh. Yeah, I probably should have been doing Purge the Wicked a bit more. 
Uh, definitely, though, at, at least at this level, Holy Nova was doing more damage than Smite on a single target. And, I mean, on all targets. I honestly, I don't even know if there was a reason to press Smite at all while leveling. It did not feel like it did anything. But I would imagine that's different eventually. I'm not sure, though. You don't think a Shadow Word Pain is 80% of a Holy Nova, or if we want to overestimate the buffs, then it's not like 50%. Yeah, I can agree with that. Hmm. It's definitely, it's a little bit weird. I don't know if I should have been using Mind Blast on AoE. I was trying it out because I wanted to see, like, how would it work. I do think, like, using Shadow or Death to finish off, like, a damaged target and then buffing your next Holy Nova was probably worth it. But it's it's a really tough call, for sure. Uh, and yeah, using Schism, something like that. Shadow Covenant was definitely a good suggestion. I forgot that, or, um... Divine Star with Shadow Covenant. I forgot that it would change into Shadow Damage. So that was an enabler. That definitely helped. But hard to say for sure. Uh, Smite consumes some Purge the Wicked. Oh, I... Yeah. That's fair. Okay. I guess because I have that talent where it would consume Purge the Wicked, if I don't have a super beefed up Holy Nova, in theory, because it would be consuming some of the dot, that would make it better. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um... You do use Holy Nova at 70 in single target, but rarely due to the stacks. Yeah, I would imagine at, like, full 20 stacks in single target, it would likely still be worth it. That is Euros? Okay. Um, it's definitely interesting how all this stuff works. Hmm. All this proves the whole thing about disc interactions. That is fair. I guess, yeah, that's something to consider about disc. Well, it may not have like a million different buttons. It does have a lot of interesting interactions. And I guess I didn't consider that like with Shadow Covenant, the way in which you use a lot of buttons then suddenly changes. So it's, it's a little bit subtle in that way. Yeah. Interesting. All right, uh, I'm going to just start queuing for, for dungeons here. Uh, I just realized. Yeah, we're at, we're at the five-hour mark, and I am on run number three. Uh, the rest of Druid 1 should be slightly faster than normal, but... Oh, boy. I'm going to be here a while, aren't I? Uh, let me just, uh, hold on. Talking to uh, a Wrath Classic guild. I decided not to stick around in the um, the guild that I joined last weekend. I honestly, I just, I was not feeling those guys. It was not really for me. Um, so I'm looking at new guilds and Fairlina. And I told one of them that I might be around at like 10 p.m. my time. Oh, you're fucking kidding me. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, you know. It's not an actual speedrun, so this is one of the few times where I'll actually just fucking do all of Escape from Durnold. But, uh, yeah, I just shot them a message and was like, hey, uh, probably won't be around until much later. Also, my Discord now crashed. But it is, it's in a, a type of crash where it refuses to close, so... I'm going to jump in the RP flight, and then I actually need to control alt delete close my Discord because, god, this program sucks so much ass. Okay, hold on. Task manager. Close this garbage program. There we 
go. The amount of times Discord crash crashes for me is like actually unreal. It is so garbage. There we go. Um. Uh, Bronzo said, you're welcome. You need to make your living. Thank you. Uh, what exactly is this stream about? Um, this stream is... Oh yeah, so Naomi explained it. He's testing 50 to 60 in every healer to be able to judge how well the specs perform. Um, 50 to 60 is just... It is an, an arbitrary number. It just so happens I have a lot of healers or a lot of healer classes left over at level 50. So it made sense because you don't need like a super long run to... Uh, what's it called? You don't need a super long speed run to be able to tell generally how well a spec performs. And later in the run is the best time because it, exactly as Naomi said, scaling does not make you insanely overpowered, right? So it works out better there. You get a more accurate idea. And yeah, you get more of your kit. So it's a little bit more accurate. Um, that definitely was a factor. There are basically a lot of different smaller factors that made me decide to do this. It was one of those things where uh, I initially decided to do this. The main reason I even had the inspiration was because I had a lot of healing specs around level 50. Honestly, if it wasn't for that, I probably just wouldn't have even bothered in the first place. But I noticed, I'm like, I have like a, a bunch of characters who can be healers sitting at exactly 50. Maybe I should do some sort of test run with them. And then... Because a few people had mentioned the healing thing, I'm like, actually, you know what? That could be a good idea on something that I could use these characters for. So it was like, it's kind of chicken and the egg type thing. Um, you know, one came after the other. Uh, good old Dio soundboard. Uh, okay, hold on. I need to actually respond in disk. They responded much faster than I expected. Um... Okay, yeah, they said tomorrow would probably work better for them then. That's nice. That way I don't need to worry about like trying to wrap up the stream at a specific time. That would definitely work better for me. Orange, strawberry, lemon, or blackcurrant? I don't even know what blackcurrant is. I don't know if that's like a flavor that we really have a lot in the U.S. Maybe we do and I'm just uncultured or something. Uh, I would usually say orange. Any sort of like lollipop stuff, orange would be my favorite usually. Oh shit. Getting blasted. I think unironically the best way to do damage in AoE at this point is literally just I think that is probably my best bet at this point. Literally just press one button. It doesn't have quite the same scaling. Is it even worth using Zen Pulse? Like, how much does this do? 913 damage. This does... I, I guess, yeah, this is probably worth it with Enveloping Mist. So on AoE, I can do, like, this, Enveloping Mist, Zen Pulse, and then I can spam. Yeah, that's probably the best option. Uh, do you have Feyline at 50? No, I get Feyline in, like, one more level. I'm pretty sure, yeah, the next thing I'm going to take is Feyline. And when I get Feyline Slump, it gets, like, a little bit better. But not by a lot. Um, Let me scroll up. Uh, do I follow GDQ? Not really, no. I mean, I have watched GDQ sometimes, but, I like... I would not define it as following GDQ. GDQ is one of those things where I almost never watch it live, 
But every once in a while, if I'm bored and I want to watch a speedrun, and sometimes if a GDQ speedrun pops up in my, like, YouTube recommendations, and the game seems interesting, I will sometimes watch it. That is about the extent of, like, what I really care for G GDQ. Nothing against it, just not really something I'm... I tend to be terribly interested in. Uh, also, what exactly does Teachings in the Monastery do? Oh yeah, it resets the cooldown on Rising Sun Kick. I couldn't remember if it increased the damage or reset the cooldown, because obviously that changes the order. But I want to use Rising Sun Kick first on a single target. So here I want to do... Uh, that... No resets. That sucks. Alright. I mean, it's... Like, that's still a decent single target, but unfortunately, I think this is going to be one of the big weaknesses of Miss Weaver for dungeons. Your single target is definitely infinitely less powerful than what we saw before on both uh, Disc and Tolly. just spam. Uh, I also want to make sure I get down to the bottom thing here, just so I... I'm not going to start it, but I need to turn in this quest before anybody else grabs it and fucks it up. Well, I can also use Chi Burst. I forgot I have that. Chi Burst is on... Actually, I don't even think it does that much damage. Yeah, Chi Burst is not really worth using. I guess if I need healing and damage, it's not bad. But, you know, it's something. Uh, since you went to the bottom, uh, you realized it does not consume Purge the Wicked. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Escape from Dungeon, or Escape from Durnhold first dungeon sounds like a go next character comeback later angle. Yeah, I mean, if this was a real speedrun, that's probably what I'd do, but I figure it doesn't fucking matter, right? I'm not too concerned about it anyway. At some point, if you do time walking twinks, you'd suggest uh, to keep anything the Epic Hunter drops. I'm gonna be honest, I, I appreciate the info, Tori. I have literally negative interest in uh, making time walking twinks. Just not really something I think I will ever do. Uh, let's see. Discord can be so wacky, some days you open it up in a Firefox tab instead. It's not a bad idea, yeah. As I press one button, I can at least read chat fairly effectively. Go. It, I mean, it's like decent damage. Could be a lot worse. Uh, I, I'm also using... Um... I'm using this trinket because I figure the proc is probably going to be more worth it. But since it's not really procking a lot at this level, I think I just run to Orb of Void Sight instead. So... Yeah. Actually, uh... Because this only gives me the buff when I hit with a harmful spell, I think realistically I just use... I get the raw intellect out of Discerning Eye of the Beast, right? And that's just going to be stronger. Yeah, that's probably better. I think the raw intellect will give me more damage than anything else. Ah. Interesting. Uh, hello, Thomas Pemberton. Good to see you. Let me just make sure I have this set up. This guy's backing away from it. You know what? I'm just gonna put Zen Pulse on myself. Yep. 
Okay, at this point I should be doing single target. There we go. And talk to Thrall, start the RP, whenever that's ready. There we go. Uh... Usually companies will replace black currant with grape for US flavoring. Ah. I see. That makes a lot of sense. Black currant isn't a thing in America because they carry a disease that would kill our trees. Huh. The more you know, I had no idea that was a thing. Am I planning on a new route because of the Halloween quests and the 10% buff? No. I do not plan around holidays. Um, so for starters, the Halloween buff is not actually a 10% buff. It is 10% mob kill experience, which really doesn't translate to much. It's like, if you want to sit around at the Wickerman whenever it's active and get the buff, you can, but it's really not that worth it. Generally speaking, I'd say, like, if you happen to be passing by and it's up, take the buff, but, you know, I would never go out of my way for it, basically. As for the other Halloween quests, it, they add nothing. Uh, you should never go out of your way to pick up the little pumpkin bags. If you happen to be passing by one, grab it. It's a free quest. But it is nowhere near efficient enough to like go out of your way to stop by a bunch of the pumpkin baskets and grab them. And there are enough along the route. Like on Horde side, you get one in Sepulchre. You get one in Terran Mill. Uh, I mean, you could pick one up in Orgrimmar if you want. And I guess in Wad... Are there any? I don't think there are. So I guess not really that impactful in Wad. There might be one in the garrison, but I don't think so. Uh, there's also like a handful in the Alliance route. Like, you know, you have Goldshire. Lachmodon Felsimer has one at the very least. If you want to stop by the Ironforge Pumpkin Basket, you can. Basically, it's like a few free quests here and there, but... Just following the route will almost always be faster than, like, running around and grabbing pumpkins. Unless, let's say you're at, like, level 59, and you finish Hills Red Foot Hills, and you haven't done extra crap in Gorgrond. Maybe at that point, it'll be more worth it to, like, fly around for five minutes and grab pumpkins compared to, like, Garrison Hearthing, flying to Gorgrond, and starting the questline there, or something. But, uh, I guess, point being, it's really not that much of an impact, so... I definitely will never make, like, updated guides for holiday stuff. The most I'll ever do is I'll make, like, a small bonus video discussing this is how you play around it. Like, Turbulent Timeways, I made, like, a four-minute video guide on how to optimize that buff. But the Halloween thing is nowhere near interesting enough, in my opinion, to uh, cover with a separate guide. 10 to 60, only herbalism mining speed run when? Yeah, uh, in your dreams. That's like a... That what is like a, a subscriber number that I will like never reach in the next decade? That's like a five hundred thousand subscriber special. All right, herbalism mining speed run only. Um, you know what? Like, get me to fucking five hundred k subs, and, and then I'll do it. Until then, fuck no. We still have the uh, the mechanome speed run. For uh, what, what did I say I would do the mechanome speed run at? I forgot what number I said I'd do it on. It would have to be like I I would I would need to be set for life uh, when I would start to consider you know actually wanting to die by doing an herbalism mining speedrun, basically. I I did I say thirty k? I'm pretty sure I said fifty k. I don't know. Well, I'll have to double check that. I don't know if I said thirty k because I I doubt I would have said thirty. It, like it, look, if I said thirty k, that's my mistake, and and I'll own up to it. But in my mind, I'm like, I can't remember if I said 50k or 100k, because there's like, like 30k is realistically achievable within the next few months. Uh, so, I would not have subjected myself to that. Time to make 500k alt accounts to sub? Yeah. Um, how long did it take Double Agent to do it? Like, two months? Yeah. I mean... Yeah, Double Agent did it as a Pandarian, mind you. You know, I, I never said I would do it on a panda. Maybe I would just for fun. Honestly, I like I'm not locking that in, but 
it would be significantly faster if you were doing it on um sky Glob. look goose comics here if you want I-, I will go and i will find the um the clip at some point if you want to i forget which run it was where i said that all i remember is when i said that i was doing the watt intro on one of my speed runs so it like i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure if you go through my speed runs and you look for the section where I'm doing the Watt intro, on one of them, like a month or two ago, I promised the Mechanome thing. I, I know you're just joking, yeah. I'm just saying for my own for my own personal um, housekeeping, I probably need to remember that, because I'm sure people are going to hound me for it. Um, but yeah, whenever that is, I, I will stand by whatever I promised at that point in time. So if somebody wants to find the clip of that, go for it. Um, sure, Naomi, I'll, I'll, I'll pin that message. <laughs> oh God, I, you put it in the challenge run thing too. It's honestly fitting for type of challenge run. God. Uh, hello, Nick. Uh, first time catching me live. Just wanted to say you love all my content. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Uh... Just... BFA gathering would be faster since you can gather mining nodes with the mount buff. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like when I initially agreed to do like the, the speed run. Of course, I- I'm saying like this is purely hypothetical because it's this is like years and years and years away, right? Um, <laughs> unless unless World of Warcraft speed running starts getting like, massive mainstream appeal. I don't think I'm hitting 500k subs anytime this millennium. So, uh, when I, like, made that joke, though, it was more, like, in the the hypothetical, um, I would probably do something like BFA on a mount or whatever, uh, where you're able to fly around between the different nodes. So it would be considerably easier than, like, a double agent-esque speedrun. All right. I have to wait for the quest. I mean, it, honestly, this isn't terrible single target damage, but it's not amazing. <laughs> what? You're half AFK reading chat. You're not even remotely trying to min max healing specs. Clickbait as usual. Where does it say min maxing healers in dungeons? I know who this is, by the way. Thank you for still being like so obsessed with me that you stopped by my stream months after your whole like blow up over uh classic hardcore rent free buddy <sighs> yeah it, it's bus driver x that loser's back again apparently i live rent free in his head i'm the only thing he thinks about imagine that life Uh, I'm not doing this again. Uh, let's see. It's not because it would kill trees for black currents, that is. Um, here, I can turn in the quest now. Uh, but more... Because they did, and people in the U.S. got so used to grape, there's no reason to import or use the artificial flavor. Huh. Interesting. Uh, let's see. You'll be honest, you can't even remember if Feyline grants spinning crane kick damage. Speaking of which, yeah, before I forget, I'll just grab Feyline and then Fatal Touch one point. That goes there. It doesn't grant Feline damage or uh, spinning crane kick damage. It's just a nice AOE button. But it um when I get the upgrade, Ancient Concordance, it me- makes a uh, blackout kick hit additional targets. And if I'm getting a full stack of teachings in the monastery and my blackout kick is hitting multiple targets, that would be more worth using compared to spinning or hitting spinning crane kick, at least. 
Yeah, because this falls off at five targets. So on a full five target, like sustain damage thing, maybe you could argue that it's still worth doing for um or still worth just pressing spinning crane kick, but at least on like three to four targets, that would make Feyline Stomp into Teachings of the Monastery AoE Blackout Kick much more worth using. Second. Um... Yeah. Look, I, I was amused by his first message just because, like, you know, the fact that he's still obsessed with me after so long is kind of funny. But at this point, you know, we, we know this guy, right? Like, he will create 50 million alt accounts and spam in chat, you know, for hours until he gets the attention he desires. So just don't give it to him. You know, losers are going to be losers. Uh, I don't know where this guy's going. I'm not going to try to, like, pull for him, though. I'll just, I'll, I'll let him do whatever he wants. I'll just follow along. Be the good, dutiful healer. Uh, maybe you could do a 10 to 60 challenge run with only mob grinding. Uh, that, yeah, that doesn't even really sound fun. That one I'm not even going to put, like, a number on. I just, I don't even think I would be having fun the so the reason why i wouldn't even be 100 percent opposed to the herbalism mining thing as a very special event is at the very least that would be like a a chill fun thing obviously like the whole idea of it being a speed run would be like it wouldn't be an actual speed run it would be like a thing that i do over a much longer period of time um because there's no way that you could reasonably do that in one sitting uh but that would actually be a type of thing where for fun, chill, like, I just want to talk about stuff. Hold on. This time I will say, follow me, Mr. Tank. Uh, just because it seems like he might be a little bit lost. So I'll just be... Okay, he knows the way? All right, well... Sure. Okay. I don't want to be, like, antagonistic, but he is definitely taking random, unneeded detours for Sanguine Hibiscus. If he really knew the way, um, then he would just be kind of grabbing it as he went. It's so whatever. Uh, how did I get into WoW speedrunning? It was something that I tried for fun at the end of Nihilotha, and it took off, so I just, um... Kept doing it. It's just been a fun thing that I've been doing ever since, pretty much. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go deep into the story again, but that is like the TLDR. Make sure I didn't miss any messages. Um... Uh, let's see. I missed a bunch of messages, actually. I didn't even realize. All right, we're going to be spamming Spinning Crane Kick a little bit while I catch up. Not that it really matters, because this is already, like, 90% efficiency, if anything. Um... Uh, Feyline on its own isn't that good. You may prefer to take something else until you get the stuff that comes with Feyline. Eh. I, the thing is, for Mistweaver, though, like, what else am I going to take? None of this other stuff really gives me damage. So, there isn't even anything else that, like, realistically would help. There are things that give me slightly more healing, but obviously, as we've seen, healing is not a concern, so... Yeah, I just, I don't even really think it matters. And I'm going to be able to get it very shortly anyways. It's 
just not even really a concern. Alright. Uh, getting bad resets is always a Monka S, yeah. Your M plus healer friend did a dungeon the other day where he got four Rising Sun Kick resets in the entire dungeon. How does that even happen? That sounds absurdly unlucky. Did I watch Pariah Nexus? I have no idea what Pariah Nexus is, sorry. Um... Just be honest, you don't even fully understand Zen Pulse. Yeah, it's definitely a slightly odd ability. I think it's probably, I don't know, like in theory it should be worth using, but half the time, like by the time I actually get it set up, it's just, just ends up being less than spinning Crane Kick. I think the advantage of Zen Pulse is it's doing damage and doing healing, so at least I don't feel like I'm just completely neglecting my duties as a healer. But, doesn't matter. Um... In fact, honestly, I could just be using Zen Pulse without the buff. It just makes that talent like a complete waste if I do use it without the buff. But that was a long Feline Stomp, huh? Uh... Yeah, Naomi explained it a bit. Finishing one of those trick-or-treat quests is what dinged you to 70 on your alt the other day. Yeah, it's not bad at all, for sure. It's just one of those things where it's not really worth going out of your way for. It's like, hey, if you can get it, Awesome, but don't sweat it, pretty much. Oh, the mob is dead. Alright, what the fuck? Yeah, okay, level 11. That makes more sense. Um... Naomi said, as far as Chori's, like, farming suggestion... Oh, I have slow fall. Okay, did not realize I had slow fall. In that case, then cheat torpedo and get like some good distance there. Uh, it sounds incredibly boring both to do and watch. Sounds cool in theory, but in practice it would be boring and monotonous. Yeah, so like the main thing about the herbalism and mining one is at least it's different compared to what I would normally do. And that's like a very mindless, chill thing where I would at the very least be able to like talk to chat in theory if those speedruns ever happened. So that would be like an Omega Chill leveling stream where I'm literally just picking up flowers. Um, but mob grinding would be at least somewhat involved enough to the point where I would have to pay attention. So I wouldn't be able to completely shut my brain off and read chat. And um, yeah, I think it would, it would kind of be the worst of both worlds. It would be boring for me and it would mean I won't be able to just fully interact with chat. Mining and herbalism speedruns would be like Really just laid back, though. So that's the reason why I think it would be at least something to consider. For sure. God, can I not get feared? Please? Also, does Feline Stomp have a target cap? Yeah, it only hits five enemies. That's actually kind of annoying. Okay. Lovely. I'll also... Shit, I forgot to target.
I do wonder if there's some weird scaling effect relative to the other members of your group. Because it does feel like whenever there is a level 11 in my group, I am doing less damage even then, like compared to how much I do in like groups where everybody's around the same level or if people are like level 30 or something. I actually wonder if the way that the scaling effect on these dungeons work is your character is actually being scaled down to the level of the lowest person in your party, and that is how damage is calculated. Because it does feel sometimes like I do disproportionately lower damage, and there's like a level 11 hunter one-shotting everything. Hard to say. Maybe it's just that their damage is so high that it like looks smaller in comparison. I don't know. Does the chance for teachings in the monastery? I think the reset chance isn't doesn't scale exponentially. It scales linearly. So I think that's probably worth it. Hmm. You've been thinking that too? Okay, yeah, I'm glad I'm not crazy there. I mean, it, it could just be that, like I said, we're both looking at the numbers and it seems so like such a large gap that we're thinking it must be some weird scaling stuff. But... Hard to say. Uh, Resonant Fists will be pretty nice. Now we have Ancient Concordance, so that should make low target AoE a little bit stronger. Uh... Okay, well, the hunter declined the queue. I hope that this is for TBC dungeons. Sometimes when other people start the queue, you might get, like, thrown into a Waycrest Manor or Freehold or a Teldazar. But considering they're queuing with a tank, because so they most likely got instant queues, I don't think they branched out into other... Yeah, okay. I was going to say, it would be weird if they weren't doing TBC dungeons. So I was willing to accept that risk. Uh, High Mountain Tarin BFA Sky Golem. Ooh. Yeah, that would be interesting. High Mountain Tarin on a Sky Golem. I didn't even consider that combo. Uh, you mentioned in a video, questing in Wrath or TBC is not optimal. Yeah, it's not really interesting, it's just they're slow, right? The quests are slow, they're they're not efficient, they're... Yeah, it's... Like, you can quest in those zones, they're just, I mean, they're older quests, really. There isn't, like, some super secret thing. It's just that if you look at, generally speaking, the way that quests are designed in, like, the modern zones of WoW, hell, even Cataclysm... They already started doing that. It is far more streamlined than you will find in the older expansions. Um... Eh. You don't even think Tiger Palm Cleave is good compared to Spinning Crane Kick? On three targets, this would absolutely be better. Right? Black Oak Kick does... Well, actually, wait. Why is Black Oak Kick scaling so bad? What the hell? What is this number? Okay, never mind. Yeah, I'm just... Uh, you know, I'm just gonna press one button. Um, oh, James, uh, shit, I didn't get notified by YouTube. Stupid YouTube, I don't know why it does this. James donated $2, been fun hanging out. Good night. I hope you're still around. I apologize that YouTube didn't notify me until I scroll down to the bottom of the chat. But yeah, um, I appreciate you stopping by and thank you for the $2 donation. I greatly appreciate that. 
Yeah, it does seem like it. It is so weird that I'm like trying to look into ways to like optimize the the damage, and it's just like, why does this do so much damage? It's not even as much as Holy Nova, so like this isn't anything crazy, but compared to doing teachings of the monastery at all, it's actually just worse. Like, this isn't even a discrete situation where, like, theoretically there are optimizations I can make and, like, Holy Nova spam is just easier. This is literally just one button requires zero thought and does more damage than pressing multiple buttons that do less damage. So, I literally think... I, single target, it's, like, a little bit more complicated, right? But, like, on pretty much three plus targets, why would I do anything except spam spinning crane kick? Hell, yeah, even on... Is it, would it be worth it on two targets? On two targets, I think it is still probably worth doing single target rotation on two targets compared to spinning crane kick. Just because rising sun kick hits like a truck. But lower than that? Uh, probably not. Oh, don't drag it out of my fucking ley lines. I guess there's no advantage to refreshing Feyline Stomp until after it expires, huh? Teachings in the Monastery Rotation gets you Rising Sun Kick, extends and resets more HPS. Yeah, Spinning Crane Kick healing conversion is also pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how it translates in, like, endgame healing stuff, but... Definitely seems counterintuitive. I don't know, it is very odd, for sure. Leveling on Wrath Classic while watching a Harlden stream, life is good. Good to have you here, Focus Future. Um, and I saw you said, Anomaly did some video about it, and it's the Binomial Theorem. Uh, yeah, and, and that makes a lot of sense that, like, technically speaking, I wonder, is there any reason to ever get three stacks of teachings of the monastery. I just, I, I struggle to see a case where if there is no exponential scaling and you have the same chance per blackout kick, it is almost just like mathematically better to do one tiger palm, one blackout kick, fish for a reset. And if that doesn't hit, you do it again. Right? Like, am I crazy? Maybe there's some something I'm missing. Maybe my math is faulty. But that just seems like it would be the better way to fish for resets. Because if most of your damage is coming from Rising Sun Kick, which seems to be the case, then you would want to front load as many of your reset chances as possible. Because if that first two blackout kicks, because like the regular blackout kick and the singular extra that you would get from the Tiger Palm that you can do within that uh, cooldown window... That would maximize the amount of chances per blackout kick to reset um, the rising sun kick. And then obviously you want to do that early so that you have a chance of finding it. I don't know, maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but it seems better. Basically, you stack up to three if you get a wasteful reset with less than three seconds of rising sun kick. Okay, that, yeah, that seems fair. But how often does that happen? Like, maybe if there's downtime and you only barely get into combat with a... Or get into melee range of a mob when there's, like, four seconds on the cooldown. And by the time you do Tiger Palm, if you were to do a Blackout Kick and it were to reset, it would fuck you over. So then you do another Tiger Palm to get two stacks, then Rising Sun Kick, then Blackout Kick to fit your resets. I guess in that case that makes sense. The more Rising Sun Kick CDs you reset earlier, the better. Yeah. Yeah, on four targets, I'm pretty sure I just pressed this button. Uh, with Phalanx Stomp, your Tiger Palm hits twice, so you get double stacks when you use the Capstone Talent. Oh, I see. Wait, hold up.
So if I have the full capstone talent and I'm getting double from Tiger Palm and double from Blackout Kick, because this is hold on, let me let me figure this out. So this just makes Blackout Kick strike three targets. And it has an increased chance to reset the cooldown. Okay. Holds up. Let me just make sure this guy doesn't die. So if I were to do Feline Stomp into with this talent, um, your Tiger Palm strikes twice. Okay. So your Tiger Palm would hit twice, it would build up two stacks, and then on AoE, you would get immediately a two-stack Teachings of the Monastery um, hit on multiple targets. I, I guess the thing is, at that point, would it also be good for a single target? I guess it would probably, yeah, because you'd be getting less Tiger Palms per reset. So it'd probably still be worth doing on single target, I think. It's definitely an interesting problem to solve, for sure. Oh, the Bronzo donated another 10 euros. Thank you. Uh, you're going to sleep. Hope to see you earlier next time. It's 1 a.m. where you are, Dan. Yeah, I'm guessing you're in uh, Europe then. I know there's a lot of uh, Europeans watching my stream and it is pretty late for them. But thank you for the 10 euro donation. The Bronzo. What am I talking about? Yeah. You're donating in euros. Therefore, duh. <laughs> I, I'm a fucking idiot. Um, anyways. That makes a lot of sense then. Yeah. I know. It, it's pretty late in Europe. Yeah, it's Europe. Yeah, I, I should have been able to, to piece that together much easier. But... Uh, uh, it's also 1.10 here for you. Nice. Yeah, where I am, it is still 8 a.m. 8 a.m. words. 8 p.m. Still in the evening. So it's, uh, it's not super late. But it is, it is fairly late. Yeah, you said you're in Europe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, and yeah, the, I, I should say, uh, I mentioned this over the last few days. Where, wait, where's the tank? Oh, he's here. He's just chilling. Uh, the next stream will not be for at least a little while. So I streamed, I actually, I didn't end up streaming yesterday just cause I had a lot of shit going on yesterday and I figured it was better to, uh, better to like get the video posted than to do like one bonus Twitch stream. So I, I ended up streaming four out of five of the planned days. I did end up getting the mythic plus testing I wanted, uh, done though. So I got most of what I needed. The unfortunate thing is Everbloom is like, Everbloom is so broken right now on the PTR, it is, there is absolutely no way that dungeon goes live the way it is. It is by far the worst dungeon. Like, with the Dawn of the Infinite changes, um, the, like, honestly, Dawn of the Infinite's kind of chill. I still think, like, Morchi sucks, uh, the, like, second half is still not the best. The first half of Dawn of the Infinite, honestly, feels great. Second half, eh, could be a lot better. However, uh, compared to Everbloom, it's night and day. Everbloom feels absolutely terrible right now on the PTR. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Blizzard needs to um, rethink a lot of the stuff of that dungeon. And honestly, the most frustrating part about it is that the things they've changed within Everbloom were better in the original WAD version of the dungeon. Like, they changed Archmage Saul to be a effectively completely different fight. Archmage Saul was the one that, like, in the old version, it had the plants that would shoot out the rings and you would, like, jump over the little rings and stuff. I really liked that fight. I thought it, the old WAD version was perfectly fine. It was a lot of fun. I thought Archmage Saul was a good boss. And they, like, completely changed the fight. And the new version really sucks. It is the worst... Actually, no, I take it back. It's the second worst fight in the dungeon, which is unfortunate because the other fight is even worse compared to Archmage Saw. All right, well, it looks like they're, they're stopping for now. So that bugs me a little bit, considering they changed something just for the sake of changing it. I don't really understand why is what it is, I guess. Uh, you're excited for hundreds of wipes to Morchi. Honestly, the boss is kind of easy now. It's still an annoying fight. And I mean, it is still possible to wipe, but Morchi is still one of those bosses where it is unironically easier to do with one person. 
If your tank is even remotely good, they should be able to solo Morchi. Provided you don't have, like, all five people blow up their, uh, their images at the exact same moment and one-shot everybody, including the tank. But, realistically speaking, you know, the timing to make that happen would be so precise that what usually happens is three people fuck it up, two people die, and then you have three people who finish off the rest of the Morchi fight because it's just not very hard. So that's what I mean when I say it's, like, easier... But it's still just a very annoying fight. Yeah, it, it it's still, yeah. Even before the nerfs, it was still easy to solo Morchi. It was just annoying. Um, on Tyrannical Weeks, people are going to do the mass res cheese. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Shuri, there's that cheese. There, There's the other cheese you showed me with, like, jumping off the platform, right? So there are ways to cheese Morchi. I am just assuming Blizzard will probably be smart enough to uh, fix that stuff before it goes live. That said, if they fix it, I hope they make the boss better to compensate. Realistically, they're probably not going to, but I would rather not have to rely on a cheese to make Morchi, like, not terrible. Hopefully. The res cheese actually made it somewhat sane, yeah. Like, stuff like that on M0, Blizzard doesn't care about, but if people are doing that in a Mythic Plus dungeon, I think they will start to care a little bit more. Uh, okay, after this pull lens, I can do one more point into Resonant Fists. Uh, oh, is this a level 10? A level 20 Blood DK. Still doing quite a lot of damage, yeah. So if the tank is low level, then this should be pretty easy. Scaling should carry this pretty hard. Especially Blood DK. I actually, do I even need to heal this tank? Like, low level Blood DK, if he knows even remotely how to press Death Strike... I'm pretty sure I don't need to do anything, and I can just sit here and spam Spinning Crane Kick for the rest of the dungeon. <laughs> Wait! Oh, never mind, he's getting spanked! Okay, there we go. Okay, I actually- never mind, I do need to heal. He's doing a lot of damage, though, at the very least. That's good. Um... I guess is, um, yeah, Spinning Crane Kick is just better to press. It's so weird. Blood TK is so squishy at low levels. Yeah. I mean, he was doing a lot of damage, so I was assuming that he had, like, a really, like, ideal setup. But he's definitely getting slapped around, so. I don't know. You can't generate enough runic power and shit slaps. Yeah. Uh, okay, now I can finally take Awaken Feyline, Resonant Fists. Now, I guess on single target, it's probably worth it to use Feyline Stomp and other shit. He's just dead. Oh my god. Yeah, that's like... I was literally about to do exactly this, Soothing Mist, and then, well, yeah, I can just Vivify. But he fell over before I could even press those buttons. And I had already used Life Cocoon as an oh shit. Maybe I could have, like, done Thunder Focus T, Emergency Enveloping Mist, and hope that would have kept him alive long enough for me to start Soothing Mist? I don't know. Uh, okay, let me scroll up a little bit, because I missed a handful of messages. Nice. Uh, you did some testing on dummies real quick, and you got way more damage just from pressing uh, Spinning Crane Kick. Yeah, unfortunately. And now you get f uh, kicked for flaming the tank. Yeah, thankfully those guys seemed pretty chill. I was a little bit worried the moment they were like, he knows what he's doing because a lot of people get like really indignant. And I was literally just trying to be like, hey, I don't want to pull for you. If you're new, this is the direction you go. So I tried to say it like as nice as possible. I even I threw in the Mr. Tank in there. I'm like, if I put Mr. Tank, maybe it'll be clear that I'm just trying to be friendly. Um, and thankfully, they didn't like get mad or kick or anything like that. So overall, I think those people were fairly chill. Uh, Mass B said, I found your channel some days ago, seen many speed leveling videos. 
Is there one for Prop Paladin? Oh, there's a ton for Prop Paladin, yeah. There's like a million, million... If you ever want to find a speedrun... So I think... I noticed, like, while skimming chat that people were saying, like... Uh, you know, look, like, suggesting where to find something. I didn't know the context because I hadn't read that message until just now. So I'm guessing the, the follow-up context that I will probably see is... You were unable to find it, people were recommending stuff, and they weren't sure. If you ever want to find any speedrun, this is true for every single one, check my playlists, WoW Speedruns playlist. It'll be usually towards the top of, like, the recent playlists, because every single time I do one of these streams, it gets updated. So, it should always be up there. And every single playlist I have literally ever done, including, um... Like, ones back in Shadowlands, like the, the super-duper early ones, all of which are now unlisted, they are all in that playlist. So, if you ever need to find one of them, it'll be in there. I'm pretty sure there's at least, like, one or two Prop Paladin speedruns that are unlisted, but, yeah, Prop Paladin, I think, is one of the most played classes for my speedruns. Guardian Druid, I definitely have done the most with. Windwalker Monk, I think, might be second, at least recently. But Guardi or uh, Prop Paladin is easily the spec that I've done the third most amount of speed runs with. I have played that a lot on various testing runs. Generally speaking, if I'm ever testing something that is not like insanely like speed or fast like leveling related, if I'm just testing like a cool little functionality thing for leveling that I may end up using in future runs, I usually do those tests with a Prop Paladin. Because generally speaking, I really enjoy playing Prop Paladin. It's very good for leveling, but it's not like speedrun world record viable. So I use Guardian Druid, Windwalker for like all the world record attempts. And then Prop Paladin is what I use for like a lot of generic like route testing stuff. Because I really enjoy playing it, but I can't play it for world record attempts. But it's still really fast and gives me an accurate idea on how quick every zone is. So there should be like a million of those runs uh, throughout the speedrun playlist, if you look in the right place. Yeah, it's like... See, I tried... That's the crazy thing. I tried doing, uh, like, the little Feline Stomp reset stuff, and Rising Sun Kick did more damage than any of my Tiger Palms or Blackout Kicks, despite the fact that it's a single-target ability, and... The other stuff was cleaving onto multiple targets. At that point, yeah, spinning crane kicks just better. On single target, it's a little bit weird. Just because there, even though it's not doing a lot of damage, the extra reset chances probably makes this worth doing. I don't know. It's hard to say. You didn't check the playlist. You checked videos. You did search but found nothing. Yeah, so... For reference, this is always, I understand it's a bit of a, you know, a new thing for people who haven't, like, who aren't used to my channel. Um, but this is, like, a standard thing going forward. I, I mean, I've been doing it for years. I unlist a lot of my old videos. This is something where, it, it's not, like, something only I do. Uh, it was actually something that I found out about as, like, a, I guess, YouTube strategy, so to speak, from other channels that I watched. So it is, it's not a, an uncommon thing in the large run, but there are definitely a lot of channels, especially like small-ish channels, that don't unlist any of their videos. And I have always felt that since I've started unlisting older videos and curating like my catalog of content a bit more, I feel like that has improved like my performance in YouTube overall. Um, so the way that the YouTube algorithm works, I'm effectively incentivized to take down a lot of my older videos from, like, the public-facing side of things, because otherwise, it's like marketing, right? Like, imagine if you were given, like, a free billboard to advertise stuff with, and you wanted to make sure that your newest, best products, in this case, videos, are being advertised to as many people as possible with your free advertising space. In my case... That is the random recommendations that YouTube gives, gives me in the algorithm. I want to make sure that all of those random recommendations YouTube gives me are going towards videos that I think are up to date or good or something that I want people to see. So I have to make sure that the only videos I have public are ones that are up to date. So if it's like a guide and it's out of date, I take it down. The moment something's completely out of date, it's gone. 
Um, if it's like a very older video that has like very rough editing and audio quality, because like obviously, you know, I've improved that stuff over time. Well, I don't want that to be somebody's first impression to my channel, so that gets unlisted. And it's all still there on my channel, but since it's unlisted, you can only find it if you go into playlists. Something that I think YouTube really needs to change, it is probably... I, I have some issues with this site, uh, but one of my biggest pet peeves, if not my biggest pet peeve, is the fact that unlisted videos will not show up on your channel. Uh, it will only show up in playlists. And I think that is annoying because obviously while I want to make sure that unlisted videos are hidden from the algorithm, and that, like I said, does help me. Yeah, like Andalana, it definitely has helped me. I, I can't like objectively, like I can't 100% look at numbers and be like, ah, yes, this is 100% because I chose to unlist a lot of my older videos. But I can generally speaking say that since I started doing this many years ago, like about almost two years ago at this point is when I adopted this philosophy, I think my channel has grown immensely. Now, I have done a lot of other improvements, which is why I can't say for sure if it's just that one thing, but I think that that is definitely one piece of it, and I do not think it has hurt my channel, because I have been unlisting videos for a while, and generally speaking, um, I, I have not noticed any clear trend of when I unlist older videos, my views go down. In fact, it, if anything, it is the opposite. When I unlist older videos that are not performing well, the recommendations automatically start using more of my better videos. And obviously if I have a video that is more likely to be clicked on because people find it more interesting and that's what people are getting shown instead of videos that I don't think are very good, then it's more likely to get views, etc. Um, But yeah, I, I do wish that what YouTube would let me do is like within the confines of my channel, right? If somebody clicks on my YouTube channel and they're looking through my videos and stuff, I should be able to have like a separate category different from unlisted that is unlisted from the algorithm. So as long as somebody is looking in the right place, they should be able to find my videos. But unfortunately, I need to kind of do a workaround like this for now. Um, but just know that this will always be the case, right? So if in the future you are ever looking for like some video that I've done and you can't find it, that is most likely where it is. And I generally try to keep my playlists fairly organized. So if you look in like the place where it makes sense, like if you're looking for a video that I made back in patch 10.2 and you look in the uh, playlist labeled patch 10.2, you'll probably find it there, even if it has been unlisted. I very rarely completely remove videos from YouTube entirely. And if I do, it's usually because it was like a stream that went really poorly and I was not happy with. And I generally speaking, post about that ahead of time and be like, hey, after 24 hours, I'll be taking down this video because I'm really not happy with how that went. And there's usually a very clear reason. It's not something I do often. Um, and sometimes I even change my mind. Like, I I think I mentioned uh, there was a stream where I did a Demon Hunter 60 to 70 speedrun attempt a few weeks ago. It went very, very, very poorly. And I said at the end of the stream that I was probably going to take it down. And I changed my mind and I just kept it up because... You know, I think a few people told me they enjoyed watching it because they liked seeing how, like, not all the speedruns go according to plan, and they found that, like, helpful to watch. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. You know, I think it was at least interesting enough that, you know, some people would probably find it enjoyable to watch for that reason, so I kept it up. Yeah, and that was a, a long explanation. That, that is how I plan on continuing to do things for quite a while. Uh, can you join community even if you're in another server? Oh, the the Battle.net community? Uh, yeah. yeah. You can. Uh, this uh, Communities like this are um, cross-server uh, compatible. They're, you'll never need to um, like be on a specific... It's not like a guild in that way. That being said, I, I will be honest, this Battle.net community, well, you can see like I will respond to people. This is very much a you know, how do I put this? It's for boomers, if I'm being real. It is for people who don't really use Discord. And that way, since the primary way to, like, contact me is through Discord, if you don't use Discord for whatever reason, uh, but you still obviously play well and want to ask me a question, well, the community is there. So there will always be a way to reach me as long as you play World of Warcraft and have Battle.net installed. 
but I do not really post anything here. This is literally just if somebody pops in and asks a question and says, like, you know, I don't know what this guy asked. Uh, I was going to try to use Party Sync, um, basically asking questions about how Party Sync works. And I responded and I, you know, I gave him a thorough answer and stuff like that. But I will never, like, actively post updates or anything there first. It is purely a way for people to get in contact with me if they don't have Discord. All of my channel updates, all of my, like, discussion around, like, cool things that I found, that is what I use my Discord for. Uh, honestly, past few months of Discord has been extremely active. There's been a lot of really good discussion there. So, I mean, honestly, if you like the stream, that is kind of the perfect place to be. Generally speaking, most of the, you know, active people in the stream chat are also there. And we've had a lot of really cool discussions. So. Um, let's see. I'm going to scroll up a bit because I did miss a handful of messages earlier. I just, uh, I scrolled at the, back to the beginning and was responding to something that somebody was saying, and then I just kept reading at the start. Um, and yeah, uh, so, Analana, in regards to how I got into speedrunning, it wasn't quite that I just wanted to level some, some alts for raid. Uh, honestly, I already had everything I needed. For, for quite a while, I mean, I guess, I have been, the, the reason I started doing optimized World of Warcraft leveling in the first place goes all the way back to, like, Mists of Pandaria, where obviously I like optimization in general. So even before I really knew what I was doing, and I was, like, fairly young and still, like, learning the game and stuff, I always tried to find, like, the most optimal way to level my characters. Uh, sometimes I would try to, like, you know, kill two birds with one stone. Like, one thing that I like doing is, back before they gutted Mists of Pandaria treasures... My favorite way to level through Mists of Pandaria was just flying all over the continent and grabbing every single treasure out there. Because while it was, it used to be an amazing source of experience, you would still want to mix some other stuff with it. But I like doing that because the Mist treasures actually gave a lot of gold. They vendored for quite a lot at the time, at least. So if I was just like going around Mists of Pandaria picking up all the treasures, getting, like, basically 75% of the way uh, through that bracket from, like, what was it, 85 to 90, I believe was the miss bracket. And I would get, like, 10k per character. I don't know if it's still that much. I know they nerfed the experience pretty heavily, so it's no longer even worth it for leveling. Uh, but I think m a lot of the items still vendor for quite a bit of gold, so it's, like, okay if you like doing that. But now it's, like, equivalent to basically a single rare mob. Not bad, but... Not worth going out of your way for. Um, in fact, I think earlier somebody asked if mist leveling is good, and I kind of forgot to answer. Like, I skimmed the comment, but I was reading something else at the time, and I never got around to, like, really answering their question. And the answer to that is, like, it's okay, uh, especially if you're doing treasures, but it's nothing amazing. It's just, it's fine. It used to be really good when treasures were broken, though, and you could just kind of zip around and grab all of them really quickly um do i want to do an entire blur dungeon yeah sure if the tank is requeuing then i'll do this i'm not gonna yeah because it's i'm still like at least part of a level off um but yeah, so back in the day, like, I would do stuff like that. I remember for WAD, I always tried to optimize, like, the two-hour WAD, um, whatever it was, like, 90 to 100 route, where you did, like, Spires of a Rock and set up all the bonus objectives and then, like, drank the XP potion and blasted through all of it in one sitting. Like, I always tried to do stuff like that to level really, really, really quickly. But it was never, like, I never timed myself. I never sat down and said, hey, you know, I'm going to try to set, like, a new speedrun world record. It was literally just a for-fun thing. I like leveling alts fast. And I would have, like, friendly competitions with, you know, friends of mine. Um, so we would, like, be, we would say, okay, we're going to level characters. Who can level this up to max uh, the fastest? And back in the day... The only person who could uh, level faster than me was my friend Paul. I'd be curious to see if my friend Paul ever came back to WoW, if he could, like, actually match my speedrunning times now. Probably not. Uh, though, honestly, knowing Paul, if I told him that I think he couldn't, 
he would probably do everything in his power to prove me wrong. That's the kind of person Paul is. Uh, Paul would always try to be the best at everything. And honestly, that he kind of like gave me that mindset a little bit in WoW. I've always like really enjoyed optimization, but seeing like I, I was always really impressed by Paul's ability to learn literally anything. You know, he would basically I, I'd ask him a question about like, oh, do you know anything about like this spec? And he would be able to learn it just like that, like really quickly. And back when I was like still really getting into World of Warcraft, I was like, how the fuck are you able to know everything there is to know about this game? And of course, I wanted to get to that level. I wanted to know everything there was to know about this game. And I wanted to be like Paul and be able to learn anything at like the drop of a hat, play any spec really well, um, you know, level efficiently, be good at endgame rating, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, you know... As much as, like, I, I would always, like, Paul and I, like, had that kind of friendship for a while where we would always, like, shit talk each other and stuff, uh, especially, like, when we were younger, both, like, teenagers and stuff. But I always, like, did really respect him. And I think, like, I, I've told him that since, you know, I, I've known him for, God, it's been, like, 15 years now. Something crazy. I've known him for a very, 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 very long time. Um, But, like, maybe not 15 years, maybe at least 10 years. Um, But... He kind of motivated me to get better at leveling, and I would always have, like, friendly leveling competitions with him, but whenever anybody else at the time tried to compete with my leveling speeds, they would get absolutely thrashed. And, you know, I, I like I said, I always did it just for fun, and it wasn't until Nihilotha, as I said, you know, end of BFA, where I had already gotten Mythic Nazoth, um, I kind of got burnt out, my guild at the time had, like, imploded due to drama, that was the, the cheating officer guilds, you know, that's a classic story. Um, so after the whole cheating officer thing, I was just kind of bored of Nihilotha. I didn't really want to join a brand new guild just to do, like, Nizoth farm for the mount because I just didn't really give a shit. So, uh, oh, owner, good night. Uh, uh, catch you. Yeah. Oh, I, I forgot to say it. Just uh, to be clear, I'll give more information. The next stream will be on Tuesday the 7th, so the, the launch day of the patch. I might do a few bonus Twitch streams over the weekend, but the next YouTube stream where I'm doing something structured, won't be until then. Oh my god. Getting blasted. I actually need to heal. I'll click the, uh... access chamber thing. Um, but yeah, so that will be the next, like, major stream. Any bonus Twitch streams, I'm not gonna, like, write them down, so... Obviously, I planned out the, the bonus Twitch streams for this past weekend and wrote them in a YouTube post. Going forward, other than special cases, I will probably not be, like, penciling in times for Twitch streams. That They're going to be very much a, I'm going to be doing something that maybe some people may enjoy watching. I will probably put, like, a two-hour advance notice in my Discord uh, server that, hey, I'm going to be streaming on Twitch today. That way, people who are interested know to, like, watch it, and then I will go live, and whoever happens to show up happens to show up. Uh, so I will likely do at least one or two Twitch streams next weekend for, like, Mythic Plus testing and stuff, but I do not have time to do, like, any sort of leveling runs or anything special that would be, like, YouTube-worthy until, uh, like, a week from now, or, like, two weeks from now, so, uh, and honestly, the next YouTube stream is just going to be, I'm gonna play the patch, right? It's going to be kind of blasting through the, uh, campaign on, like, day one, and then farming uh dream warden's rep and all that stuff and i guess the advantage of that stream is you'll be able to watch the exact steps that i take on launch day of the patch so that you know if you want to know how to be like hyper efficient in terms of like farming reputation you can copy exactly what i do and do that on your characters and yeah i feel like that will be helpful for people i will make a video on that topic too like a summary on like you know optimized rep farming and stuff but uh, generally speaking, like, I'll be going into more detail, of course, when I'm actually doing it on, you know, patch day, and I, there'll probably be, like, a few very minor optimizations that I won't really bother including in the video, just because it won't matter for 99% of players, but for people who are looking for that extra, like, 1%, well, that's a lot of times what my streams are for in the first place. Um, yeah, no, Naomi, I mean, if I... If I happen to know that I'm going to do it, I, I guess I should word that better. It is, I'm not going to be deliberately saying um, at the last second that I will be doing a Twitch stream. What I more so meant is that because I don't know exactly when I will be streaming, 
if I decide, like, on the day of, I'm I'm gonna do a Twitch stream today, then I will post about it the moment I have decided that I will be doing it. Which sometimes may be, like, two hours before. I might just be unsure if I could even do, like, a stream if I have time. And then if I decide I have time, then cool, I can, you know, post about it. Uh, but, like, if I know for a fact that I will be streaming on this day, then of course, yeah, I will, I will post an update about it the moment I am aware. But... Uh, I, I was more so saying I will always at least notify at least an hour or so in advance, even if I find, even if I decide, I guess not find out, but decide last second that I feel like streaming. Um, but, you know, sometimes it, for the Twitch stream stuff, unless it is a scheduled thing like this past weekend where I was kind of testing the waters with it, the entire idea of that going forward is it's going to be a bonus thing. So for instance, right, like uh, Mythic Plus testing. I don't know exactly what time I'll be doing Mythic Plus testing. Yesterday, I talked to my friends and said, what time would you be around? I, they said, past 6 p.m. I was like, let's shoot for 6. I ended up working on my video until 9 p.m. And then I had to message them and be like, hey, can we reschedule for like later tonight? Because I'm really busy finishing this up. And that is honestly the reason why I didn't stream yesterday. Because I was just caught up working on that video and I didn't want to start a stream at 9 p.m. Um, but also the time in general was uh, really late. And a lot of testing stuff, that's kind of how it goes. Like, whenever I need other people, I will, like, just, you know, they'll say, I'll be around from, like, these hours, and I'll try to put together a group. And whenever I happen to get together a group, then I'll start the Twitch stream. So what that kind of advanced notice might look like is, at some point today, I am going to be doing Mythic Plus testing. I don't know exactly the time. It's dependent on the schedule. But uh, when I think I'm going to do it, I will, you know, post here. Uh, basically, like I said, the moment I know what time it'll be, I will post it. ADHD focus engaged. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm also talking a lot. I know I'm like talking really fast trying to, to get through this stuff. I kind of knew this would be like a big undertaking in the first place. Doing, even though it is only 50 to 60, obviously 50 to 60 if I was only questing with each of these characters wouldn't be too bad. But 50 to 60 on six characters... Is definitely an investment, especially when dungeons are involved. So this is going to be, uh, well, a long stream. Uh, do I play any games outside of WoW? Uh, yes. Many. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've discussed a lot of them. I'm not going to go into the list of all the different games that I play, but yes, I, I play many games outside of WoW. I definitely play WoW more than any other game, but admittedly, these days, I play WoW about as much in terms of, like, free time allocated just towards it compared to a lot of other stuff I play. Uh, a lot of the time that I spend playing WoW these days, I view more as, like, work hours, because obviously, like, you know, right now, YouTube's my job, and um, when I am sitting there doing, like, hours upon hours of PTR testing, well, I still think it's important, and I'm not saying I hate it, right? If it was, like, a complete chore for me, I just wouldn't do it. But a lot of that time, um, a oh, wrong server. Uh, wanna, yeah, it's Area 52. Uh, a lot of times like that, I'm not playing WoW for the sake of, like, playing WoW when I'm, you know, doing testing, stuff like that. I'm just, I'm effectively doing work. Right, mindlessly doing stuff while I have like Netflix on another monitor. It's it's not the most fun thing in the world, but it still counts as playing well. But the amount of like for me, mythic rating, I don't really make a lot of videos about mythic rating. If I were to stop mythic rating right now, it fundamentally wouldn't really change anything about my YouTube channel or my upload schedule, etc. But it would be the loss of the main thing that I play well for fun for, right? Like the speedrun videos, I, I've said before, these days. I don't speedrun for fun. And that's not to say that I hate the speedruns. I'm like, oh my god, this is misery. Like, it's not the most fun thing in the world, but I do view it, honestly, as a job, right, at this point. Um, there, sometimes I have fun, sometimes it's a little bit tedious, but at the end of the day, all these speedruns are more fun because I can stream it and interact with people. And it is still, like, enjoyable doing a lot of the tests and figuring out, like, you know, uh, which spec is good, what the best builds are. And it all goes towards, like, an eventual guide and stuff like that. Uh, but 
the stuff that I do in WoW for fun is it's dungeons. It's raids, it's dungeons, it's that stuff. And sometimes I'll make videos on it because at the end of the day, if I'm going to be doing that anyways, I might as well try to make guides on it. But that stuff I have been doing even before I had a YouTube channel and I would continue doing it even after I have a YouTube channel. And that is like the main reason I play WoW. But a lot of times if I am not doing raids and I'm not doing anything like dungeons or whatever, uh, and I happen to have free time, yeah, there's plenty of other games that I'll play. Uh, do you feel that speedruns aren't fun anymore because there's no room for new innovations or for some other reason? Uh, kind of both. Um, I don't know if I would necess necessarily say it's because there's no room for innovation. Because I would say right now, obviously, my route is like basically perfect. It has been for quite a while. The, the route has received some adjustments over time since like Shadowlands beta, right? But... Generally speaking, the bulk of the speedrun route has remained mostly unchanged. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and, and like, I still have enjoyed doing speedruns even within that. That said, there is still absolutely, I'm sure, some little thing that I could do to improve it that I'm not aware of. Let's say that, like, theoretically, my current route is, like, 95% efficient. Now, I don't know what that extra 5% efficiency is, but I'm sure that somewhere out there, there exists like a little tech thing that I could do that would make the run 0.5% faster. And if I were to discover all of those little time saves, little tech things to make the run slightly, slightly faster, that would be, you know, I guess a, a little bit of a better speed run. But the reality is... None of that really would be route changes. It is very rare that I make significant route adjustments. Generally speaking, I only find new tech. Like a good example of recent tech that I found, uh, or rather uh, that was introduced to the route, Azero is actually the one who uh, told me about it. A few other people floated the idea, but I think Azero was the one who first made me realize that it had practical use cases with the run, is at lower levels, uh, picking TBC Chromie time, and then grabbing the wad and legion quests off the mission board it's a very minor adjustment it fundamentally doesn't change anything for the casual play style but it makes the run slightly more efficient in the early levels and like honestly the introdu uh, introduction of tbc dungeons at lower levels was one of the biggest routing shakeups that i've made and even then it's only really good if you're a tank or a healer so the questing route hasn't really changed significantly it's just a bonus option for people who can benefit from tanker healer cues. But those are like the only major routing adjustments I've made since Shadowlands. Everything else has been minor speedrun tweaks to make it slightly faster. And generally speaking, outside of like the once in a blue moon, you know, 10 to 70 super duper fast, efficient speedruns that I like to do just to like see what is the best time that I can get. The main reason that I do this stuff is for information purposes. It is for making the guide so that other people have a route to follow. And the reality is, little Timmy following my leveling guide isn't going to care that if you pick up TBC Kuromi time and grab the quest on the mission board, it is slightly more efficient than heading back to Kuromi and switching your Kuromi time, right? That doesn't matter for casual players. So the actual like routing as far as guide writing is concerned has not changed a ton, at least for 10 to 60. Dragonflight leveling is kind of always shifting as is normal for new expansions where Blizzard introduces new things that change up the route, etc. Uh, I'm still going to be making my 60 to 70 guide within like the next month. That is still a work in progress. Uh, but like, you know, that, that stuff always changes. Um, admittedly, like, and it, my biggest reason I don't enjoy 60 to 70 speedruns right now is neither of those reasons. It is literally because of dream surges. Dream surges as a form of content for leveling is garbage, and it makes it really not fun to do and in a speedrun setting. So that is the biggest reason specifically for 60 to 70. For 10 to 60, I would say it's less so that there's no new innovations because while I'm sure that, you know, it, I guess it's part of that, but it's not that much. It's really just I've done it a million times. When you've done anything a million times over, it stops being quite as fun. And that is why I've said before, long term, I'm looking into like different like challenge run formats that could spice things up and could make it a little bit more interesting both for me to run and for people to watch. I've talked, I have a bunch of cool ideas that I think could make it a lot more interesting. And the main 
the main thing that I'm going for with my challenge run formats when those are eventually finished is making the run more engaging. Because the reality is, I have spent half of these healing runs talking to chat and just mindlessly uh, like pressing buttons while I read stuff in chat and respond. And that's just because, generally speaking, 90% of retail leveling can be done with your brain on. It's the, the classic, you know, classic handy argument of, oh, retail leveling, so easy, ha ha ha. And the thing I like about, you know, the super fast speed runs is there is that bonus level of optimization that is a lot more fun and engaging to do, though it is very exhausting and tiring to set up all that stuff, which is why I, I don't do it all the time. If I was made of infinite gold in time, I would do those runs a lot more often, but I am not. It takes days to set up those runs, and it requires a lot of gold investment to pull off, like, the perfect, super optimized speedrun. So, yeah, I can't do that super often. Um, and these runs are definitely a little bit more mundane. Why am I a tank? Fuck. Uh, we're not doing Resto Druid, unfortunately. I, I don't know why... Despite the fact that I know for a fact I hit healer earlier, it probably, I think when I switched chromie time, it must have reset my dungeon settings. Because I did all this before the run starts and I, I tested it out. It must have defaulted me back to tank at the end. So, all right, we're doing druid later. Uh, What's next? Let's do... Uh, Holy Paladin is up next. Yeah, and then you're going to run Dernhold five times in a row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully not. That's pretty frustrating, though. Uh, okay. Let me go... I'll double-check this time just to be absolutely certain. Portal to Outland... Burning Crusade. Okay, I'm queuing as a healer. Cool. That actually... So, I, if I was queued as a tank that whole time, that was a long fucking tank queue. Uh... Anyways. Um, yeah, so... All that to say, the entire idea of a challenge run format would be to add some genuinely challenging things within the context of a run that would require you to know your kit and actually really pay attention and use it properly and stuff like that. Longest tank queue you've seen in a while? Yeah. Uh, okay, interface. Always show nameplates. Display class colors. Alright, so... Oh, I accidentally bubbled. Whoops, did not mean to hit that. The thing is, how do I even... Hmm. Yeah, so I'm concerned because it looks like this tank is taking a bit more damage than like a traditional tank. He is a prot warrior, which they are a little bit more reliant on external healing, especially at lower levels. So, this might be a little bit tricky for me to do. We'll see. Uh, yeah. What is Shining Righteousness? What the fuck is that? Huh. Okay. Shield of the Righteousness is apparently cracked as fuck on single target. Interesting. I forgot that was a thing. Still goes to show, it. overall, HPAL damage is not going to be the most impressive. Uh, do I think it was a coincidence that after I made the video... Oh, it's not a coincidence at all. No, Blizzard 100% watched that video. That's not even, like, a question. Because the questline existed for a while. So this wasn't like, 
you know, it, it just got added and I just happened to cover it. The quest line had existed, to be clear, for months at that point. And I strategically uploaded that video late at night on a Friday because Blizzard, unless there's like a literal emergency that is like breaking the game, Blizzard doesn't really tend to make changes on weekends. So I, I was at least smart enough to realize that there was a good chance Blizzard would fix that. So I uploaded it late at night on a Friday. So Blizzard did not um, like immediately nerf it. And guess what? Literally early afternoon, which would have been early morning for them. So early afternoon for me, basically right before noon, their time, they had already fixed it on Monday after they got into work. So I, honestly, it I don't even think that I just got it nerfed. I think I made it one of their top priorities on a Monday, at least whatever the bug fixing team was assigned to, because they fixed it fucking early in the day on um, on Monday, which is just absolutely fucking mental, right? Goes to show where their priorities lie. Uh. And I mean, honestly, though, it's also not surprising that video did well, right? So it wasn't just that I... Um, I, I've gotten multiple things nerfed. I'm one of the reasons the Onyx Annulet got nerfed. I'm one of the reasons that a lot of World Quest trinkets got nerfed, even though they weren't, frankly, that good. Uh, I, I think it's funny that, like, I made a video on a bunch of... Uh, on, like, Drogbar Rocks and a bunch of other very niche World Quest trinkets that, like, literally nobody even knew existed. And, like, I mention them in passing as like speculation of this seems like it's a little bit overtuned for its item level and nobody was even running it but after that video popped off blizzard nerfed the overpowered healing trinket all of the really niche trinkets i mentioned that nobody was even running because they weren't even really that good they were just like good for their item level and then they just like didn't nerf drug bar rocks for whatever reason <laughs> i don't actually understand how drug bar rocks escaped the nerf bat there Somehow it did. Yeah, no, Drogbar Rocks was known about. What I'm specifically referring to, Naomi, is in that video about Drogbar Rocks, I talked about a bunch of, like, Smoldering Howler Horn and a bunch of other random trinkets from stuff where I'm like, hey, if Drogbar Rocks is good, nobody is talking about these other trinkets, maybe they're actually worth running and we just didn't even realize. And honestly, I don't think they would have been. But Blizzard, like, panic nerfed half of the drops from Zerla Cavern after that video popped off in the algorithm. They 100% knew. And this was, mind you, one week after I had made my video about the Onyx Annulet. And days of, within days of that video also popping off in the algorithm, they announced that they were nerfing the Onyx Annulet. Uh, so, yeah, I, I take credit for that. I also take credit for... Um, Ian Hasakostas having to make an ass of himself and admit that there was never a ripcord because uh, uh, my Covenant spreadsheet definitely brought light to that. So I don't know if I can take full credit for the delay of Shadowlands. I'm pretty sure the delay of Shadowlands was due to a lot of internal factors like uh, COVID-19, right? But I am 100% the reason why Ian Hasakostas was forced to go on record and admit I lied in that interview with Preach. There was never a, rip, a ripcord. We're doing nothing about Covenants. Fuck you. Of course, that was not the response that I was hoping to get. But uh, at least I got him to admit that he was a fucking clown and lied. Which, better than nothing, I guess. Still pissed off about that to this day. Uh, yeah, and, and mind you, Music Hall of Fame. That was... Um, all of those views were within the three days. Pretty much the moment that video got nerfed, I took it down. So it's, uh, yeah, th those were like within three days, the amount of views it got. I think it has gotten like residual views, but not a lot because it probably got linked places and people didn't realize that it was no longer working. But generally speaking, that was all just over the weekend. So it was a good video. Like my, um... The two other videos I referenced got about 50k views by the time I unlisted them, but I never took them down because uh, Blizzard nerfed it later on, so th those videos were relevant for a much longer period of time. But yeah. Um, Beacons of the Beyond seems OP to you, but you don't know? Yeah. it's uh, It's definitely very good. 
Now, that being said, uh, I did make a video on Beacon and some other stuff, which is, you know, the one linked in the chat. That one, unfortunately, so far has been kind of a dud, but uh, not every video can do super well. It's just one of those where I played around with like a few different title thumbnail combinations. Just doesn't seem to be something that people are super interested in. And um, the only thing... Um, the only thing I might do, I might, like, play more heavily into the why you should not farm Iridius Fragment right now, because I think that is, like, actually some inf interesting info that a lot of people may not realize they don't know about, and I think that could be something that might be worth focusing more of the branding on, but if that doesn't really improve the video at all, I'll just write it off as, like, you know, a, just an underperforming video it happens. You know, not all of them can be amazing. Uh, if Beacon gave main, main stat, it would be unbelievably broken. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, Grief Torch. Whenever people in Raid are playing like complete morons, Grief Torch pops the fuck off. It can do, honestly, more than Beacon in certain cases. Uh, yes, so that is one of the topics I cover in that video on Alana. Any item from Naltharis, Brackenhide, Halls of Infusion, or Ultimon is not worth farming right now. You should actively avoid, like, taking it from your Great Vaults, provided, like, if you have no other good options and you don't need sockets, then yeah, I guess take a 447 Iridius Fragment. But honestly, at this point, it is more worth it to take a socket than it is to take anything from those four dungeons, because it will be upgradable up to 450, which is higher than the current max item level for any item from those dungeons. So that is kind of what I meant when I'm like, that's actually kind of relevant info that, you know, I included in that video, but like in that video, I discuss a multitude of different topics related to like gear transitioning from this season to next season. Though I think the, the way that I, I think the video is going, right, is a lot of people are probably looking at the title and thumbnail and thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beacon is really good. I get it. And then they're thinking, I don't need to watch this video. It has nothing to offer me. And maybe they wouldn't care anyway, but I think there is probably a good amount of people who would find that information really interesting because I found it interesting when I realized it. I'm like, oh, wait, this this is actually crazy. Uh, I had no idea that was a thing. And to the point where initially that video wasn't even going to be about um, that topic, but I was like, this is actually really important. I should mention this within... Uh, this new video. So, I actually think that focusing more on that subject, oh my god, can this Blood DK heal himself, like, at all? Like, brother. One death strike. I, I don't think I saw his health bar move at all. If I knew he wasn't going to press Death Strike, I would have just fucking lay enhanced him. But I'm like, you know, a tiny bit of residual healing should be fine, right? Like, surely you don't need insanely focused healing to survive as a Blood DK. Probably Giga. I mean, uh, maybe, but I did not see him heal himself at all. So the only thing I can imagine is he just, like, pressed Death Strike when he was at full health. And then just didn't think about it. And suddenly he went, oh, fuck and died, but I was kind of spamming heals into him for a good bit of time there. Like, wh where is his- where is his self-healing? He's just actually getting shredded. The mage is face-tanking these mobs better than the Death Knight. That just makes no sense. So, I mean, he- there's absolutely no way he's pressing any buttons whatsoever. If you're dying that fast. That is, that is not, I am out of RP and I do not have enough to press a death strike. He walked up and he just fucking died. Like, no. That is not normal. Which means I'm probably going to have to hard pocket him. And that's, you know, one of the other problems. Obviously, we've seen that tanks can contribute a significant amount of damage when played well in pretty much solo dungeons, but... Oh, is he running? Oh, okay. Well, he has literally no gear, and he's fresh out of the Death Knight starting zone. So he also probably is a brand new player who has never played before. 
Um, at least that explains it. That's going to make this really fucking difficult. Yeah, he pressed Death Strike once. I mean, I don't know, man. At this point, maybe I just tank as a Holy Paladin. I just walk up, hit him with Shield of the Righteous. At least he held aggro. Yeah, I mean, that's just low-level scaling, right? Just if you press Blood Boil, hopefully you're able to hold aggro. But I genuinely think at this point, maybe I just pull and tank. I mean, if I'm going to tank on any healer, I'm pretty sure Prop Paladin or Holy Paladin is the way to do it. So, you know what? I'm, I'm actually just going to pretend that I'm playing that. I even get my free logs. Yeah. Or a mastery. Jesus Christ. Like, is he pressing? He didn't even press Death Strike. He pressed it three times? When? Okay, so he's like sometimes pressing it, but he's getting like next to no value out of it. Yeah, it's just all Blood Plague. I guess at this point he's not taking a lot of damage, so we'll see. All right, here. All right. Yeah, unfortunately, this seems to be working out much better than just actually being a healer. How was it? The damage, too? Yeah, I mean, it's like, this is definitely not disc priest damage, but it's at least passable. What's the add-on that tells you how much they press the skill? This is details. It's just a damage meter. It's just, I, I'm looking, like, within details. So normally, like, most people just use the damage meter as, like, a basic you know, who is doing the most damage type thing. But of course, if you click on it, like left click, and you look at like the damage breakdown, you know, details, well, for lack of a better word, it has a lot of details hidden within it that most people don't take advantage of. But like, if you need to get that information, it actually has quite a lot. Obviously, logs are still like, generally speaking, a better source of finding all that info out, but yeah, Details is like a shittier version of blogs, like Naomi said. Alright, I'm gonna wait to open this chest. Shit version of Warcraft Logs, real time in game is good, yeah. Definitely. That seems fine. Ah, uh, well, I'm gonna be real. Okay, the tank left. I was not gonna re with him anyway. <laughs> Wish him the best of luck, but, uh, yeah. Naomi got filtered from top chat. Is that how top chat works? I always use live chat. I... Sometimes YouTube, like, will... 
I've had times where if my browser crashes and YouTube reopens, it puts me back in top chat and I don't realize. And that's always really annoying because then I find out like an hour later that I've been missing half the messages and it's just, ugh, it's a pain. Anyways, uh, I missed a lot of messages while I was talking about the most recent stuff. Okay, I found where I was. Um, I don't know if Michael, Michael Onella is still watching, but uh, they asked... Uh, boosting, you see boosting for levels in trade chat all the time. Is that bannable? No. It, it, so, generally speaking, you can sell a boost for literally anything, provided it's for in-game gold. Now, whether you should, or whether you should even buy one, that's a different story. I've said before, I don't think it's worth it. Having boosted a character at least once to try it. Now, there are different speeds of boosts. The one I did took, like, around three hours. Really wasn't all that good. Um, but people will tell me up and down that, oh, no, I, I've been in a boosting team that's so good, they can do it in, like, an hour and a half, and it's like, I, I'm sure if you have a dedicated team of boosters, maybe, but I still don't think it's worth the gold. Now, the argument that some people will use is, like, it allows me to do other stuff, you know, while I'm, you know, getting my character leveled, and... Honestly, that is literally the only reason I even tried the boosting thing in the first place, because the only time that I've literally ever bought a boost, um, and specifically I'm talking about like a, a boost from people in trade chat, it wasn't even that expensive. It was like 75k gold, pretty reasonable, all things considered. But I needed to get a character leveled up because it was the final day of the first week of patch 10.1. And in order to uh, reach rank or renowned 15 or 14 or whatever it was with uh the uh Lone Niffin, i needed to get one more character at level 70 so that i could farm the uh sniff and seeking digs and get the little whatever rep insignia to push myself over renowned 10 so i could get the bonus so that i could benefit from all the tokens um and I did not have another character at level um, at level 70 to use. And I considered leveling one. It would have taken me like two hours. But the problem is, I had done the math wrong. And I had assumed that I had enough rep, and I did not. And I was also in the process of finishing up my Aberus raid guide. Like, all heroic Aberus bosses in one video. And I needed to have that done. Because this was Monday night before the raid released. And I was already, like, late on getting that out. I wanted to get it out earlier. Thankfully, the video ended up performing pretty well regardless, but hindsight's 2020. So I was already like mad at myself for taking a while to release that. And I'm like, I need to have this video out ASAP so people can start, you know, using it as a reference. Especially because I had said that I was going to get it out earlier. And as usual, it, you know, took me longer than I expected to finish. So it's late Monday night. I have spent all week trying to get my rep farmed. And now I'm going to be one character's worth of rep token short. And that really sucks. So I either basically chalk up all the time I spent rep farming as a loss and just go work on my video, or I buy a boost, and as I'm working on my video, I get this character leveled up so I can get the rep token. So this was quite literally a case of, I physically do not have enough time. There is no time in the universe for me to do all of the things that I needed to do before the next day. I like I, I was like looking at my schedule, I'm like, I simply can't make it work. This video will take too long for me to make. I do not have time to level another character. That was the only time I have ever said, okay, fine, I will buy a boost. Because I need a character level literally right now, and I cannot set aside that time. Other than that, I genuinely do not see why you would not just level a character yourself. It's easy, it's fast. I literally, like this morning, I woke up at like 8 a.m. I think I said before at the start of this uh, stream that... Um... I, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, I did not have the druid and the, uh, holy priest at level 50 before, uh, starting, because those were the ones that I used for those, like, streams a little while ago, and they were still, like, level 30-something. Now, obviously, getting from 30 to 50 is a lot different from getting all the way to, you know, 60, but still, it's, you know, variable time investment, but I woke up at, like, 7.30 a.m., I hopped on to my priest, and I started doing dungeons. Because, you know, if I want completely, absolutely mindless leveling, yeah, I guess, you know, in that case, especially uh, while practicing my healing rotation, um, I wanted to do that. 
right? So I'm like, okay, two birds, one stone, right? I get to practice the healing stuff a bit because, you know, I hadn't played high level Holy Priest. I had never played Resto Druid. And I wanted to at least become familiar with that while leveling up my character, while also, um, okay, this guy likes my name. Um, and, uh, while doing that, I also watched more episodes of House. I've mentioned before I've been, uh, catching up on House. I'm on, uh, season four now, and it's still really good. I've been enjoying it a lot. So I got to watch a show that I liked while getting practice for this. Well, leveling up a character mindlessly, chill as hell, uh, I just, I don't see what the downside is. Now, obviously, I had free time this morning, but still, it was only a handful of hours. Season 4 was fun, yeah. People have told me that it, it like, falls off later, but so far, I'm still really enjoying the show. Uh, if you worked for two to three hours and made more than $20, that's way more efficient. Yeah, but, like, at the same time, like, I could argue that, technically speaking, I'm probably already making enough to the point where, you know, the amount of time, like, I, I could spend, um, what's it called? Like, buying a boost would be, like, a time that I could spend making a video to make more money or something. I don't know. I'm sure I could rationalize it that way. But... Like, who cares? You know, it's still easier for me to just, like, kill two birds with one stone and mindlessly level while I do something else. So that's why, like, I never find that argument to be, like, really strong. Because at the same point, there are a lot of things that I can just spend gold on. And I just, you know, it's like, I don't really care. I'd rather spend just a few more hours. If it's not, like, focused grinding, right? Like, if it's something where... I am miserable for four hours. And, you know, oh my god, would I pay $20 to skip being miserable for four hours? Um, sure. But, you know, if it's like, you get to spend four hours watching, you know, House, which, you know, otherwise I guess I'd just be watching on my phone or something. Or, I don't know, I guess I'd be watching, watching House while I do... Uh, Gamma Dungeons in Wrath Classic or something for, like, I, I don't know, farming, like, a tiny bit of gold, which at that point, I, also kind of the same logic. I, I might as well just buy a token. I don't I could do something in, in some game uh, while I watch House, or I could level up a character, which saves me money. I just, I don't see the downside. I, I get that, like, everybody has their own priorities, right? For some people, like I said, if you really do not have the time, sure. Um, but I think a lot of people try to justify it by being like, well, boosting is so convenient. And it's like, eh. it's really convenient if you don't know how to level at all. Uh, I like to think that, you know, with the right route, it's really not that hard. Yeah, and, and for, for the record, Naomi, I know that you're, like, playing Devil's Advocate, and you're not, like, actually advocating for that. I'm just like, since you are playing Devil's Advocate, I'm saying I've heard people make that argument, and that is usually what I counter with. Uh, leveling gets you in a zen relax mode if done right. You have a level 60 boost token from Blizzard, and you have no plans on using it. I mean, I... So, I would say use the token, right? There's no reason not to. It's a free character. Um, like, I always use my free boosts just because it's not like, I'm not going to pay $60 for a boost, but if I literally get a free boost for buying the new expansion, it's, it's a bonus character that I can use for something, right? Uh, whenever I need to farm it. Um, but obviously, yeah, there's a very big difference between that and, uh, you know, actually buying a boost with money. Um, also, like, you know, to each their own as far as, like, being in a zen state, like, personally, honestly, I'm not in, like, the most zen state in the world whenever I'm, um, doing leveling stuff. It can be a little bit tedious sometimes for me, at least for, uh, for the Headless Horseman. I think that guy clicked the wrong button. Yeah, there we go. Random Burning Crusade Dungeon. <laughs> um...
But I say, um, yeah, like for retail leveling for me, I'm not really in a Zen state when I'm leveling in retail, unless I'm literally doing something else, like watching a different show. Admittedly, classic leveling. Oh God, please. Honestly, not as bad as a. Uh, What's it called? It, it is not as bad as Black Morass. So. Fine. You know what? Uh, I'll be honest. If Mr. Druid here hadn't complimented my name, I might leave after the first boss. But, you know, he is a fellow appreciator of Speed Wagon. So I will uh, I'll stick it out in this run. And throw myself in the flight point. Uh, okay, let me let me keep keep getting on like a long subject, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But then I keep forgetting to read the rest of the messages. That was yeah, the answer about boosting thing. Um, obviously though, paying with real money is always bad for boosts. Don't do that. Like if you're gonna buy an in-game boost, yeah, you know, only do it for golds, and make sure like everything is above board. There are certain boosting communities that are less than reputable. The only one that I can actively advise against is there is a boosting community called the Mercenaries. They are led by a former guild leader of mine, and uh, the dude is kind of a scumbag. He stole a lot of gold from my friends. And overall, just uh, not a very nice person. So, you know, I, I don't know if... Um, you know, he has actively scammed buyers, but he has definitely scammed a crap load of his sellers, and he's just a shitty person, so definitely uh, don't buy from them. Uh, just checking something real quick. Got pinged on Discord. My mom just said, I just checked your stream and you're still streaming. I don't know if you're watching right now, mom, but yes, I am. I am still streaming and I will be still streaming for a good few additional hours. There's a decent amount of testing left to be done. Uh, what else did I get pinged for? Okay, uh, so what did I miss? Oh yeah, uh, so... On Alana, the Dragonflight leveling, I just, because I'm reading older messages, I feel like there should be at least one Prop Paladin speedrun in the Dragonflight leveling thing. Um, actually, there should be multiple. But... I don't know for sure. Uh, oh no, the Druid... You're going the wrong way, buddy. It's down this way. Okay, I think he got it figured out. He was just, you know, being thorough. I respect it. Uh, but yeah, I feel like there should be multiple Paladin uh, runs in the playlist. Hard to say. Um, What are these messages? I, I remember reading a lot of this stuff. Oh, I missed a message from Mez. Mez said gamer. I think Mez probably left the stream by now, but, you know. Would wish I'd noticed so I could have said thanks for stopping by. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is, like, tricky trying to find which messages did I read, which messages didn't I read, because I saw a lot of these ones. Where is this guy? Where? Oh. I was wondering why I couldn't target him. Uh. Yeah, it's still mostly Consecration and Shields. Holy Shock surprisingly doesn't do as much damage as I thought it might. 
kind of counterintuitive. You would think it would be your top damage, but while Glimmer is nice, it doesn't do enough to uh, carry that hard. Yeah, still shield all the righteousness. Or shield the righteous words. Uh by Rakaden. Oh, I don't know if uh you're still here, but if you are, you have a level 70 account your brother gave you, but you don't like uh, don't say that out loud. Uh personally, I don't give a shit if you're like, you know, shared accounts within the family, right? Who cares? But Blizzard is like really, 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 really against account sharing, so you know, don't don't let them find out about that shit. Um, I'm like partially joking, but you never know what Blizzard will do with shit like that. Sometimes they are just like ridiculously strict about account sharing for no reason, so just you know, be careful. Uh, you don't like Demon Hunter, and you want to play DK, so you're gonna create. What do you suggest? I guess. Oh, I didn't even think of that. I can see how Mr. Tank. Kind of sounds sarcastic. In my mind, I thought it was, like, friendly. I was viewing it as, like, if I said, Tank, get over here, follow me. Like, I, I felt like that was a bit more forceful. But I'm just like, hey, Mr. Tank, you know, like, head over this way. I guess maybe it, like, if you say it that way, it kind of sounds condescending. But, like, you know, that's that's not how I, like, envisioned it in my head. But I can understand how, I mean, it, it's, language is complicated, especially when typed. Like, anything can sound condescending, I guess, if you say it the right way, so... I don't know. I don't know if there was any good way to tell the tank to follow me, considering the stigma of, like, you know, a lot of people are impatient and whatnot, and I can understand why he would be wary about that. Anyways, at least hindsight 2020, he was pretty chill. The cooldown of Hammer on, or on Hammer of Wrath is, like, ridiculous. 16 second cooldown for this? Is like, what the hell? Yeah. This definitely does not feel great at all for dungeon leveling. I mean, I don't know if I'd say it doesn't feel great at all. For for specifically dungeon healing, it's fine. But I can't even imagine trying to do solo questing with this. This would actually be misery. Like, I think, well, there is absolutely no reason to play Mistweaver... Admittedly, it felt a lot more manageable to do damage. It was nowhere near the highs of Priest. But it was, like, not awful. Whereas, uh, Holy Paladin, I just, I don't see how you do damage, realistically, with this. Um, I'm actually curious, does Holy Paladin do good damage relatively at higher levels? Like, does this improve? Or is Holy Paladin now, like, one of the lower damage healers? I know they used to be, like, very strong in the context of Ashen Hollow and stuff. But that was largely because of Ashen Hollow. And also other healers got a lot of really useful tools that, you know, Holy Paladin seems to have lost more than it's gained. Um... Stocking up on charged files of alacrity and re-enchanting some gear to speed for the patch. Oh yeah, you're you're right about that. I should probably work on some sort of speed set just for like early patch stuff, just for fun. I think uh, yeah, couldn't hurt. It's uh, not a bad idea. What does charged file of alacrity do again? Charged file alacrity increases your speed by six thirty. Yeah, I guess that probably would be good. The only thing, though, is, like, speed is less good when you have flying. So, I'm trying to think, like, would that be worth it for Emerald Dream stuff, considering you obviously have dragon riding immediately, and, um... I'm just, yeah, I'm gonna fucking lay on hands and who cares. Oh, come on. Fuck it. Just gonna bubble that off.
Yeah, I'm not sure. I would imagine speed for anything like that's indoors might still be good. Like Zerlek Caverns was a little bit harder to evaluate because in Zerlek, there were still a lot of sections that were completely like in caves and stuff. So there were more situations where you might need speed. But I'm thinking about it and like the entirety of the quest line in Emerald Dream outside of like one particular set of quests is outdoors. So maybe you bring like different files and switch to speed specifically for the one quest line that's like in a barrow den. I don't know though. Hard to say. Um you didn't really think you would escape, did you? Just a pre placed consecration. That's annoying that, like, if the mob is untargetable and I spam click it, it just targets me. I guess I should have thought of that as a possibility, but... Didn't consider it might do that. There we go. Yeah, I feel like AoE Prop Paladin has next to nothing or re or holy paladin ha can't talk uh single target it's like okay with the shield of the righteous stuff but it's still not amazing uh Andalana said i think you're right that it got you more hooked to my content everything you get shown is relevant and high quality yeah i'm glad to hear you think so that's definitely what i try to go for with like curating the older videos and I think, you know, when you when you look at my channel also, if you, like, very quickly look through my videos, you get a general idea of, like, what stuff I'm covering. There have been some times where, like, part of that is also, like, I try to keep my actual channel page relatively clean. Like, you'll see it has, it's sorted into specific playlists. Like, if I go there right now, clicking on the My Channel button is right next to the big red End Stream button, so... I have to be a little bit careful there. So if I go to my channel right now, it has... Oh, somebody uh, left a comment an hour ago. Just liked that. Uh, you know, outside of all the YouTube stuff at the top, right? It then has, you know, the very first thing is the current stream, which that is just automatic. YouTube puts that right on the top. Then I have, you know, the whole members banner. Where it says, you know, thank you for channel members. That's another, like, automatic YouTube thing. I think there may be a way to, like, adjust where it's positioned. But the default position is right at the top. And it makes sense to put it right at the top. Uh, then regular videos, like, that is sorted by most recent in terms of uploads. And then I tend to structure, like, I have different playlists. So everything outside of that, that is, like, the basic YouTube setup. It'll have, you know, the members bar, the basic, like, sorting bar of, like, at the top it says home video, shorts, live, blah, blah, blah. That appears for every single channel. After that, you can, like, organize it a little bit. So I have multiple different playlists for, like, stuff that I find relevant, right? Like, right now, obviously, the latest thing is Wrath Classic, and I've made a bunch of Wrath Dungeon Guides, so I have my Wrath Dungeon Guides playlist right at the top. Then below that, Dragonflight Leveling, because that's always a popular topic. Classic WoW videos, I'll probably bump that down shortly. Then I have WoW Speedruns, which is the playlist I was referring to where you'll find all that stuff. Uh, and I also, I shuffle things around within the context of that playlist. So, like, within that playlist right now, the first few options you see, are uh, first few showcased videos, I specifically put the ones on there that I think will be, like, the most interesting at the immediate moment. If I want to, I can take some of those and put them further back in the playlist so they won't be featured in, like, the first six videos shown on the front of my channel. Uh, and generally speaking, channel views, admittedly, are a much lower source of viewership. Like, for almost everybody, most of their views are going to come from random recommendations. For a lot of people, you know, you're going to get a lot of views from, you know, subscribers who get, like, a notification or something like that. But generally speaking... Whenever a video performs well, it's because it did well in the ge like general algorithm, not because like a bunch of your subscribers watched it. So 
I still like to keep this neat and tidy just because if somebody clicks on my channel, I want to quickly showcase like all the different things that I tend to cover. But then, you know, if I don't cover one of these things anymore, or if it's less important, like when patch 10.2 is coming around, I am going to move down the Wrath Dungeon Guide section and I'm going to, you know, at the very top thing there, right below the general videos thing, it is going to be patch 10.2 guides. And then below the general patch 10.2 guides, I'll probably have another thing that says uh, Amir Drissel raid guides. And specifically for that, uh, something to that effect, right? And then the Wrath Dungeon guides will be all the way at the bottom. I'll probably remove the general classic WoW videos. And the playlist is still there, mind you. Uh, but I will remove it from, like, the featured section. So, whereas, like, you know, be like, otherwise, if it's not on this front page, you'll have to go into the playlist, like, part and look for it. Uh, but this way, it, like, appears front and center. People can find it, and it, like, helps sort everything. So I'll probably just remove that from the front page, and then I'll obviously remove patch 10.1 guides. But there might be certain patch 10.1 videos that I still think are relevant, like uh, my how to get caught up in Dragonflight video, well, it'll be missing information on the new patch, what I'll probably do is put it there and be like, hey, this is still a nice way to get ready for Mirdrasil, and then eventually I'll update it, and then that video will be taken out of that playlist, etc., etc., etc. And it's just kind of an endless cycle of like little tweaks like that to make sure that only the most relevant videos are shown in any context, and I think that generally speaking, is more helpful to people, but I also think it improves, like, viewership and stuff like that. So. Uh, Music Hall of Fame finally got the Reigns of the Headless Horseman. Awesome. And I I helped you do it because I made your level easier. I'm glad to hear that. Glad to hear the leveling guides helped you get characters ready for that. Uh, do I share my UI? Um, yeah, it, it is the default UI, but I, like, honestly, if you... Go into my Discord and you, like, search it. I've been asked that a few times, and I posted the string on there. Normally, I would just repost it, but it's, like, I think literally, like, two days ago, somebody asked me if I could share, like, the, the edit code thing. Uh, where, like, you know, if I click share, copy the clip clipboard. I literally just did that. So if you go into my Discord, it's within the last few days I posted the whole string to get my uh, my UI thing. Shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, let's see. Make sure I don't let this tank die. Um, how many characters do I have now? A lot. Um, I have... So one thing that I can say for sure is about, you can have like 50 characters on your account. Um, something like 40 out of 50 characters on my account are level 50 or higher right now. And I've had to start deleting a lot of like random low level characters that I used for testing. So I happened to save the priest and the druid that I used. But almost all of the other characters that I've used for, like, random speedruns, where if I copy them over to the PTR midway through, most of those have been deleted. Not all of them, but a good amount. Heart of Azeroth? What the fuck? Wait. How the hell did my Heart of Azeroth level up? Hold on. Why did I get artifact power from that? Why do I even have a Heart of Azeroth? It took me a moment to even realize. I, I don't have it equipped. It's not it. I think it's in my bank. So, what the fuck? Okay. I I am confused. That is odd. Um, but yeah, almost all of my characters are 50 or higher at this point, which is I, I'm glad that I'm almost done with all the testing runs because it would have been increasingly difficult to do further test runs because I would not really be able to motivate myself to delete a level 50 or higher character. At that point, it's like a pretty big investment. I don't really think I can justify it. It's a little bit tricky. Um, But, 
if it's like a level 20 character, I can get a level 20 character leveled up in like an hour or two. So some of those random ones that I didn't feel super attached to, I deleted. I specifically kept the the druid that I'm going to be using, which is the world record 10 to 70 druid, because obviously that was my world record 10 to 70 character, even though it was still only level like 30 something on live servers. That was a really cool run. So that character had like, you know, special attachment to me. I definitely didn't want to get rid of it. Also, it's Boris Ursus. I like the general, like, name, race, class combo that I did for it. I think it fit, or it was very fitting. I liked it. And one that kind of, like, surprised me is I really liked my Dark Iron Dwarf Priest. The one that we did the Holy Priest run with earlier. Something about, like I said, Holy Priest really connected with me. So even though the live server version of that character was left at, like, 20-something... I never deleted it, and I deleted all the other characters I did around that time. I specifically left that one, and it wasn't even like a strategic, I should keep this character for the healer speedrun video that I'm going to do like in a month from now. It was literally just, I liked that character. I'm like, I really don't feel like deleting this one. Something about like the name. It was a, it was kind of like a random name. I think it might have even been, I don't, probably wasn't randomly generated. A lot of times what I do is I take like, if I really can't think of anything, I randomly generate a bunch of names, and then I look for, like, cool prefix prefixes and suffixes off different names, and I try to, like, combine them together and then warp it a little bit to be something that I like. So, like, uh, hold on. I check something. Yeah, so if I... Uh, search on World of Warcraft right now, the armory, Swigra, which was the character name, there were, there's no other characters um, named Swigra. So it wasn't a randomly generated name, but I think I got like inspiration from some random Dark Iron name. And it was like, I'm like, I kind of like the sound of that, but I want to change it. And I just like thought of Swigra, like a variation of whatever it was. I don't remember the original name. And I'm like, yeah, that, that like rolls off the tongue pretty well. I like it. And because I had a lot of fun doing that priest run, and I just really liked the name and, like, the general design of that character that I, like, whipped together, just so happened it like, I, I'm like, I really like this character. I'm gonna keep it. And I kind of always meant to get around to leveling it at some point, and I never did, and this was kind of, like, the perfect opportunity. So I got it up to 50, used it for the holy priest run, bing, bang, boom. And now I have that priest at 60, and I don't know if I'll use it again in the future, but there's almost no chance I will be deleting it ever at this point. That is, like, a permanent character. So, that one gets to live. Uh, same with, you know, the druid, especially. Uh, oh, nice. So I haven't done the quest in Slate Pens. This should get me uh, most of the way there, then. Um... This was definitely a BFA instance. There was a battle and we're technically on Hesseral. Nice. Yeah, I just uh, looked at the most recent part of the chat. Um, but yeah, I pretty much the only characters that I have now that I don't have at level like 50 or higher, it is, there's probably like one or two random characters that I still partially leveled for a speed run that I haven't finished. Uh, like the Outlaw Rogue from uh, like a few weeks ago, that one I still have. That is like... Uh, that one's still like 30-something, I forget exactly. And I don't know, I, I haven't really touched it. It's also, it has a name that I like, so... If I deleted that character, I would still want to reserve the name for when I used it eventually, so... I might as well hold on to that character in case I ever decide to use that name for something. That it, it Maybe I'll need to test the rogue, so I'll have it. Uh, and then I have, like, a bunch of random low-level characters on whatever server I'm playing on with a few reserved names that I plan on leveling at some point in the future, but haven't gotten around to yet. And then I think on, like, two servers, I have a level one with the name Harald in reserved. That's, like... That, that's the only other thing that I could really think of. Um, and usually uh, the only servers where I actually like reserve my name is on large servers that I have played on in the past. So like I think right now I have Harlden reserved on 
uh, what server? There was, I think it was Illidan, which I don't actually have a character named Haraldin on Illidan right now, but I used to play on Illidan uh, with one of my older guilds. I don't have any plans to play on Illidan again, but I still want to make sure that, you know, if I ever decide to, like, level more characters in that server, be it for, like, testing or something, I have that character name available because, duh. Um, that one, I hope I don't need to explain the logic behind it too much. Also, oh, spicy. Oh, no. Why do I have threat, bro? What are you doing? I, I actually don't even know how I have threat there. That's like... I wasn't even doing more damage than him. He's the one who pulled the mobs. Somehow I ripped threat off him and he wasn't able to take it back. Despite the fact that according to this, he's doing more damage. Oh, he got mind controlled. Oh. All right. Well, that, that uh, yeah, that would explain it. Yeah, I, I know you're joking, Naomi. Forgot that some of those mobs could MC. It's why usually when I tank this dungeon, you'll see me hooking left here. I rarely go through the middle here. It's uh, generally speaking not worth it. These like bog strop guys do nothing. They just auto attack. It's piss easy. Uh, let me scroll up. What was I talking about before? Yeah, characters. That that's about it for characters. I I don't know exactly how many level seventies I have. I've leveled. An insane amount of characters, though a lot of those were on the PTR for testing purposes. As for how many were on live servers, uh, I have at least 20 level 70s now. That's all I really know. It's around there. And I would say probably 30, 35 of my characters that are above 50 are also 60 or higher. Most of them are just at 60, and I haven't gotten around to leveling them through the last 10 levels yet, but there are a handful that are kind of, like, in the middle that I did, um, like, some 60 to 70 testing on. Like, that, uh, the Demon Hunter that I did, like, the failed speedrun on is still level 68, because I got it up to, like, 64 or something on the stream, and then after the stream, before I was actually doing, like, the world record attempt, I did, a, I did like, a practice run with the Demon Hunter, basically picked off, or picked up where I would have left off, and got it up to 68 after doing the Thaldrazis questline, and then from then onwards, I, uh, yeah, I just haven't touched it. It's also, it's, like, my fourth Demon Hunter. What the fuck am I gonna do with my fourth Demon Hunter, right? Um, Paul is an inspiration to all of us, yes. Paul seems like a cool dude, yeah. I mean, Paul is definitely, like, unfortunately, I don't talk to him a lot these days just because he's super busy with work, but, like, it's one of those things where every now and then, uh, he will, like, you know, uh, pop into, like, my group chat. Like, me, Paul, and my cousin have, like, a group chat where we talk every now and then, but, uh, he's just really busy these days, so. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of free time to do anything. I think I mentioned before, he tried playing WoW again when it was on sale for, like, a day. Mr. Demon Hunter, you don't need to pull those bobs. Um, uh, but yeah, he tried playing WoW, and I, like, I did some dungeons with him in Dragonflight, and he was, like, uh, healing and doing big pulls and stuff like that. And I was tanking it for him. And we played for, like, a few hours before he had to, like, get ready for work or something like that. So, yeah, unfortunately, you know, I still talk to him. He's still a good friend of mine. But he's, like, really, really busy these days. He can't, you know, play WoW. But as far as I know, you know, his job is pretty good. He's making enough to, to get by. And, you know, he has, he has a nephew that he needs to support. So it's, like, obviously very understandable, right? And, uh, yeah. So d definitely a cool dude. He actually did uh, make a guest appearance on one of my streams back in Shadowlands. I'm willing to bet that nobody here was probably around for that stream because it was a very long time ago. Uh, it was not when I very first started streaming. It was like, I have done, 
think I, I, I looked at this a while ago. I You can kind of separate my streams into, like, I think it's like four different categories. You can look at my old streams that are now, like, unlisted or, or unlisted or privated. At this point, this is definitely the longest stretch of time that I've streamed uh, in one go. Because it's almost November and I've been streaming pretty consistently ever since June. Like, late June, early July. And that is a longer stretch of consistent streaming time than I've managed to pull off in, well, ever. So, uh, I'm definitely actually kind of happy about that. It's one of those things where every single time I would, like, return to streaming, I would, uh, like, tell myself, this is the time that I actually managed to stick to a consistent streaming schedule. And hey, I may not always get the stream started on time. Sometimes it takes me a few extra hours. Um... Sometimes I don't always end up streaming the exact thing that I had initially planned the previous day, but one thing I can say for certain is I... What the fuck do I use Blessing of Winter on? Oh, I have to use Blessing of Winter on myself. Oh. Okay. Um, but yeah, one thing I can say for certain is I have managed to maintain a pretty consistent streaming schedule, at least in terms of days, for the last... Uh, how many months is that? Like, three, four months or so? I think, like, I, I forget, I did the math a little while ago, and up until now, my longest stretch of, like, consistent streaming time was something around, like, just over three months. And at this point, it has been close to, um... Oh, shit, I hit the wrong... Fuck, I let this guy die. That was 100% my fault. I literally just pressed the wrong button. I mean, to be fair, though, you shouldn't need a healer, but... Hey, Zach, good to see you. I should have been able to keep him alive, so I blame myself there. Wrong key. At least I think I managed to kind of pull this out at the ends. Recovering from fucking up. If only I had been paying attention and not misclicking up until that point. Um. Yeah, Dion, uh, I intentionally have not posted that list anywhere. It is one of those things where if you watch the runs, am my be tank. Uh, if you watch the runs, you'll get that information. I do not want to advertise that because I do not want to be held responsible for encouraging people to leave specific TPC dungeons. Now, it, like, I don't want that information on my guide. So, uh, it it's like I'll talk about it. Like, uh, Ana Lana pretty much answered that question, but. Um, <laughs> at least the tank is, uh, good about it. Um, so I, I don't want to basically be like, or have people saying, oh, you're encouraging people to leave dungeons. Yeah. It, like, at the end of the day, though, it is one of those things where I will leave those dungeons, and I will fully say I think it is okay to leave dungeons if you get, uh, Old Tales Brad, because, hey, it's Blizzard's fault for putting extremely garbage old design dungeons into the pool that are, like, three times as slow as everything else. They could just retire that dungeon from the pool. It They are the ones who choose to put it in there. So I... I don't feel bad about doing it, but I at least... It's one of those things where I'm just saving myself the headache of having to listen to people saying, why are you encouraging, blah, blah, blah. I already get comments, like... 
I actually, I got a comment the other day, which I deleted, of course, because, like, outright hate comments like that. I'll read it, I'll get a chuckle, and then I'll delete it. Um, but it was something to the effect of, like, Oh my god, I fucking hate you. You're exactly the type of person that I would immediately kick out of my dungeon group or something like that. <laughs> it was just like, Jesus Christ, brother, it's a speedrun. Calm down. Like, some people take it so personally, and I already get enough of that shit. I don't need any more reasons to have it happen, you know? Uh... But yeah, that that's kind of the reason why it's, uh like that. Uh, and Seth Beneath, if you want to know more about the talents, I spent a big chunk of time at the start of the stream explaining that. So the nice thing about YouTube streams is you can uh, scroll back in time and, you know, read or watch all that stuff that you potentially missed. So I thoroughly discussed my talent options for every single spec that I'm running in this stream, including uh, Holy Paladin, so you can go back to that point in the stream and find it. Can't get kicked if you already left, yeah. The first step is the hardest hitting the live button, yeah. I mean, honestly, the next major thing that I need to start doing, and this is one of those things where my dad is always nagging me about this, is, um, like, using a face cam and stuff. And admittedly, that is, like, you know, self-conscious shit, but, like, I know I probably should be doing it. And I probably will eventually, I'm just like, that one is going to be difficult. Because the reality is, like, even if I, I wake up and, like, you know, my hair is a mess and I look like shit, right? I don't need to worry about it. I can still start a stream as long as, as long as my voice is fine and I feel good enough to actually do it, I can start a stream. The problem, one of the main reasons why I'm a little bit worried about, like, you know, doing a face cam thing is because I know that it is going to make me stream less. There's no way around that. If I start using a face cam, I will probably end up streaming less because there will be times where for whatever reason on that given day, I am self-conscious about my appearance and then I either choose to just like not stream that day or I don't know, stream without a face cam, which maybe is what I would probably have to do in those situations. But it's kind of one of those things where you can't like, can't close Pandora's box. The moment I start streaming sometimes the face cam, I know people are probably going to come to expect it. And it's like, I, I guess kind of the way that I've always rationalized it is, oh, surely that like anxiety will go away eventually. And whenever that anxiety finally goes away, I will start streaming with a face cam. And I told myself that years ago and, the, but yeah, it n never happens. Still just as anxious as I was before. So it's just, uh, is what it is. Disc pings are just you. Oh yeah. Um, well, actually, there are two pings not from you, <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, I, I will read all that stuff later. What if you call it a dungeon suggestion list? Would that create a difference? I mean, that would definitely be a better way to spin it, Dion, for sure. Uh, you're not wrong. I, I would think, I might think about that. I don't know. It's like, I know it is something that people might find helpful it's just, uh, obviously, I've explained my reasoning. I'll think about it. I'll, I'll give it some thought. Maybe in, like, the next version of the guide, I'll do it. <laughs> You're spamming me? No problem. Yeah. Uh, oh, the tank left. Okay. Well, I'm out then, too. VTuber models are more expensive than you'd think. Oh, Troy said you can have an emergency VTuber model. And then Naomi said VTuber models are more expensive. I, I mean, I, I also, I don't have any plans on doing a VTuber model? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I just don't think that's something I will ever do. But, yeah. Um, and pretty much, yeah, what Naomi said. At that point, it's like... I, I also... Look, I don't want to, like, poo-poo on what somebody finds fun. I have never understood VTubers. I'm gonna be completely honest. It's... It's not something where I'm like, I hate VTubers, blah, 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 or oh my god, why would anybody watch this garbage? I have nothing against it. It is it is just one of those trends where it, it makes me feel like a boomer because I do not understand it at all. I genuinely, I do not understand the appeal. I don't understand why people like watching it. I don't understand. I mean, I can kind of maybe understand why people might want to do it. It's like if you want to, 
if you don't want to have a face cam, but you still want to have some cute anime, you know, avatar to, you know, get people to watch and it, like, I, I guess. But, uh, I don't know. Like I said, I, I just really don't understand the appeal, quite frankly. Like I said, don't want to, like, say that I, I'm judging somebody for enjoying a thing that I don't, you know, whatever you like, go for it. But it, it is very much the case that I do not understand VTubing as a concept, why it is a, a thing. You're Brazilian, you have nothing to feel conscious about. Uh... <laughs> well, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail on that because it, you know, whatever. Um, just put a picture of the doggo over your screen. I mean, at that point, that you know, defeats the purpose, kind of, as well. Um, you literally made a VTuber model. People just obsess over ultra-high-quality ones with jelly physics. Geraldine is an anime girl on the internet. Uh, Music Hall of Fame said, I do wonder what your face looks like, but at the same time, it's your face, and you really have no right to know. Yeah, I, I mean... I appreciate that, right? You know, it. it's... I, I very much appreciate that instead of the people who have sometimes asked, like, you know, when are you doing a face cam, et cetera, et cetera, because that always, like, bugs me a little bit. And it's just one of those where, well, I generally speaking have, have thick skin about, like, 99% of things. It is one of those where, even if it was completely unfounded, Opening myself up to criticism for something that I am already, like I said, self-conscious about, justified or not, would make it a little bit harder to stream. Because I would be anxious and nervous the entire time. I'd be less able to focus on chat and you know, the actual stream itself. And it would, I feel, overall make for a worse experience. So if I were to do a face cam, which I will probably do eventually because I know that for better or for worse, it is necessary. Um... It would be on a very chill, not important stream at all. That way, because I am almost certainly going to be more anxious and whatever, it would not really impact the quality of the stream because it wouldn't be important at all. I like I would even consider this to be a little bit too important for that type of thing. So hell, maybe I try it on Twitch. I don't fucking know because that is like lowest stakes possible, but we'll see. I also, I mean, I don't even have a good face cam, which is another, you know, separate issue. But that I, of course, could solve by buying a good face cam, but it's not really something that I care enough to invest in, at least at the immediate moments. Uh, you could do commission rigging for that doggo pick, too. Do you really think... I, I'm, I'm not saying I would want to do that, but just out of curiosity of how that would work, would you actually be able to do something like that, of, like, animate this specific profile picture? Like, is the technology there for that? Because if so, that's wild. Like I said, I, I do not think I would ever do that, but I'm more asking from a purely hypothetical standpoint. Interesting. That is crazy that people would be able to do that. Huh. Yeah. And so, like, and I I appreciate those suggestions, but obviously none of, the thing is, none of that is a substitute for a face cam, right? Like, it is, it is one of those where it is a substitute as, like, an, a less anxiety. Also, should I just fucking AFK? This is a level 10 monk booster. I think I just AFK and let them solo the entire dungeon, because, like, I, there's, I won't contribute anything here. Is this, like, a full... Uh, yeah, they have, like, a decent amount of farm stuff. Yeah, with life-stealing sockets and... Okay, yeah. I can mostly just let them do their thing. Oh, hey, this rolled leech. Huh. That's, like, actually kind of an insane pair of bracers. I don't know, Chori. Like... I don't know much about time walking scaling, but this is like busted, right? This would be theoretical. I don't know if it, this would be best, but this is really, really good as far as random rolls go. I'm pretty sure that's kind of what you want, like sockets and tertiary stats. Obviously, for sets like, you know, the 
thing that this guy's running, you would probably want speed more so. Um, it, well, obviously, yeah, if that was a Mythic Plus drop, that would be nuts. Uh, that much is definitely true. Okay, this guy's going this way first. You'd imagine you can do a model of the dog. People can well a model I I can make from scratch, yeah. Or I wouldn't be able to, but I'm sure somebody could. Um I have not seen the video of Todd Howard singing Biddy Biddy Bum Bum. <laughs> I believe you that it exists though. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I'm sure there are, like, crazy things that you can do with, like, technology these days, but... Oh. Well, okay. There we go. That's level 60. I'm not gonna bother sticking around. They don't need me to, uh, carry that dungeon. They have that monk. Um... Uh, so, before I continue talking about this stuff and, um... Uh, and move on to the next run, which that'll be the druid run. Uh, actually, you know what? I'll do the shaman run since we're already on the server. Yeah, wait until AI takes over the world. It's scary, the shit you can pull off. Uh, honestly, out of the healers we've tested so far, this has been by far the weakest. I would put Holy Paladin an entire tier below the other three. Like, if I were ranking them right now, obviously, like... Dungeon stuff aside, Holy Paladin, if I had built it more for healing, could have healed just fine. I, I, you know, let the tank die. Could have gotten around that. I'm more talking from the damage element. This was significantly weaker than both Pre-Specs and Mistweaver. Um, I would probably put Holy and Disc in A tier. I'll kind of... It's like, I, I've said so many things are probably A tier. I'm going to have to filter out a few of them that I think don't truly belong. But Holy and Disc are definitely there. Like, they they were so powerful. That is, like, actually really, really nuts. In fact, I may even move Priests above Death Knights overall. Because... I don't know. I feel like if you want, like, actual damage now, Shadow is just really good for that. And if you want something that does a lot of damage but is also really tanky, now, like, the healing specs are really nuts for that. So, yeah, definitely for leveling, I would say then Mistweaver. Mistweaver, like, I, I honestly, though, I was going to say I would put, like, this a tier below the others. I actually think Mistweaver is kind of significantly down there. Because, realistically speaking, while this was definitely much stronger, or uh, much weaker than Mistweaver, was Mistweaver really even close to the performance of the Priests? Like, not even remotely. This was like, Disc and, and Holy were up there. Like, we were topping damage on certain pulls. And then, I was getting maybe half of that value out of Mistweaver, and this is, of course, for the entire value of leveling, which is why I do the tests later, because, yeah, at low levels, you can just spam one button, spinning crane kick, and it's fine, because it procs all your shit. But, realistically speaking, you do not have a fleshed-out enough damage rotation to really do enough damage. Your single target is still weaker than Holy and Disc, despite having, like, a more involved playstyle. It's okay, though. So, I'm, I think it would maybe be, like, bottom of A, top of C, but also, it just doesn't really do anything that you can't do with Windwalker and Brewmaster. So I think, if anything, it has to go and see, right? There's just no upside to it. You could probably level perfectly fine. So it's not like playing Outlaw Rogue uh, before the, the changes. Outlaw Rogue before the changes just functionally did not work for leveling. Uh, at least, Mistweaver, you could, if you really wanted to. It would just not be great. And then Holy Paladin, I think, just needs to go in, like, bottom of C tier. It's, like, same deal. It could probably work for leveling, but why would you ever want to level as this? Not only is it not a super efficient dungeon uh, healing uh, spec, but, like, obviously for solo content, what are you going to do with this shit, right? You don't get Divine Toll until much later, and that's, like, really your only form of AoE. Single target, all you really have is Shield of the Righteous, which is literally a prop paladin ability. Why would you play this? It has even less of a reason to run it than Mistweaver. So, it's not, like, objectively bad. Like, I would only... 
Uh, I would only go below C tier for specs that are legitimate, legitimately broken. Like F tier would be if it was physically impossible to reach max level with the spec without like dying a million times. Like the spec was just completely non-functional. Nothing in retail, I think, would get my definition of an F tier. So I just, I won't make it on the tier list. F tier would be like trying to level as, I don't, I, what would you say, like maybe a Balance Druid and WoW Classic or something like Classic Era or leveling as like, what's another really bad uh, spec in Classic Era or something? I'm trying to think of examples. Obviously, Balance Druid is like really not great for leveling. Um, you could argue that like certain warrior builds would be not great. Uh, shaman, like, certain builds of shaman would be pretty terrible in, like, classic era. But basically, we would have to have something so fundamentally non-functional for leveling that it's just, like, this, you, you can't do this unless you are genuinely a masochist, which describes a lot of specs in WoW Classic, honestly. Um... F-tier would be Outlaw Rogue with daggers. Yeah, I... I'm not going to, like, technically speaking, I could go into meme specs. Obviously, Outlaw Road with Daggers is a complete beep, and I know you're saying it as a joke. Um, but, yeah, it, it's like Outlaw Rogue, definitely I would have put it D tier before the Rogue changes. It is probably Outlaw is C now. I think we decided on that towards the end. I would put it ahead of Holy Paladin for sure. Maybe even ahead of Mistweaver. Hard to say. They're roughly equivalent, I would say. Uh, assassination was a good deal better. I think Assassination, I would put low B. It definitely is a lot more functional and has a more, like, well-put-together kit compared to Outlaw or really a lot of the other stuff. So it doesn't belong in C tier, but it was still a little bit wonky in terms of how it played to the point where I think a, a low B would be justified for that. Uh, so then I guess the only question is, where does Resto Shaman and Resto Druid fall? Resto Druid, I mean, we'll see, but I've talked about this before, it's going to be no higher than a C. Because Resto Druid, fundamentally, is just a case of, why would you play this? Right? You either play a worse Feral, or a worse Guardian, or a worse Balance. It has no actual saving graces of its own. Whereas, like, there are some things that Resto Shaman does that actually, you know, it's pretty not bad. It's not going to be amazing, but I think the question now is, is Resto Shaman actually better than I expect? And it will also get the A tier up there with Disc or Holy, or will it end up where I expect it is, which is mid-B tier, is where I think I will end up putting Resto Shaman. But quite frankly, I probably would have put Holy and Disc at the top of B tier before today, and after seeing how they still scale extremely well into the late game, I think that there is absolutely no reason why Holy and Disc don't deserve to be A tier. That was really strong. But uh, I don't know if that'll be the same for Resto Shaman. I'm curious to see. Uh, no, Mateus, I do not have an actual tier list yet, but that is exactly why we are doing these. So the entire purpose of doing these runs is so that I can eventually make a full, complete tier list. So what I'm talking about right now is where I think they will be ranked when I make the final tier list. But, you know, when that tier list gets created, that will be like the final say. Uh, everything will be decided then. Resto Shaman have two, having two charges of Lava Bolt is nutso and Acid Rain isn't bad. Yeah. Uh, the scaling really hurt your Arsham. Yeah. I think nothing that is in Arsham's kit seems quite as bonkers as the stuff that we were doing with the Prespecs. But it still looks strong. It definitely, just looking at the different spells it has and knowing how well it plays at low level, like Resto Shaman is right up there with Holy and Disc at low levels. The problem is, we kind of discussed this earlier, especially not having Primordial Wave. While Holy and Disc continue to get really good tools throughout their entire leveling process for, you know, doing damage and stuff, Resto Shaman, you get Lightning Lasso. And that's pretty much it. Uh, all of your good stuff is very front-loaded, which means that they're actually quite strong for low-level dungeons, which is the main time where you'll play them. So that's good. That's great for Arsham. Uh, it gets a lot of credit for that. So Arsham, for the record, can go no lower than B tier. 
There is no world in which our Shaman is C-tier. It is automatically, by default, stronger than every other healer outside of Priest. The only question is, is it as good as Priest? Or is it solidly a B-tier uh, leveling spec? But no matter how you slice it, I've, I've already partially tested our Sham in that run like a month or so ago. And that alone is enough to say, yeah, it is a, a above C-tier spec. It's pretty good. For marginal wave damage nerf is a kick in the pants. Yeah, well, the problem is, I don't know if you um, uh, were here earlier on Alana. Uh, in patch 10.2, you can't target enemies with primordial wave. So I would actually say the spam casting primordial wave thing with like tumbling waves as a chance of like big AoE burst damage could be pretty nice. But I specifically will not be taking primordial wave for leveling here because of the fact that it will not be usable as a damage cooldown in the next patch. And I just think that would give an inaccurate view of how strong Resto Shaman is. So we have to play it like we don't have Primordial Wave at all. Because for all intents and purposes, you don't. And that is going to severely hurt their late stage scaling. Because pretty much after Echo of the Elements, which you get at like level 30 something, you don't really have anything else that boosts your kit in any meaningful way at the very least. Outside of, I guess, like, like I said, Lightning Lasso is... A solid single target damage option, but it is nowhere near good enough to make up for the lack of any other damage increase. But, you know, they, they're they still good, as we will see. The only question is, how good are they? Right, portal to Outland, and we can start queuing for these dungeons. I need to keep things snappy, because I still have to make sure I get two entire runs finished within the next two hours. Because remember, if the stream goes past... 10 hours, it's the recording is dead. I'm completely fucked. So I only have two more hours left to finish these last few runs. I think I can pull it off, but it'll be close for sure. Ah, okay. Um, Let me finish reading. I I'm going to scroll up. There's a few messages i still missed before but i want to at least kind of finish up this topic so we're not like bringing it up 30 minutes from now um you'd like to imagine i'm actually just tucker there uh the real reason for the vtuber thing for most people less judgment on their appearance while being able to give visual reactions expressions that's fair uh you think my voice would work really well with a little anime wife <laughs> oh, oh god um or they're just popular and you get more viewers from it if you pop off yeah exactly Uh, first face cam stream on Fansly. I don't even know what Fansly is. Uh, as long as you're comfortable, still watching streams face or not. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, you feel like it's a good segue into full face cam because you get the anxiety with that shit. Yeah, but like, I don't know. I feel like the VTuber thing would really not meaningful. Like, even if I, I'm not going to do it mind you. But even if I were to do that, I do not think it would do anything meaningful to address my anxiety, because it, it is, like, I don't really care about, like, my visual expressions. Um, like, that that is not the thing that I am self-conscious about. Uh, if anything, I think that is one of the reasons why a face cam would help. You know, th there have definitely been a few times where I slam my head against the desk, and uh, you know, I, I feel like the Comedic timing especially would add to like a good clip or something where that happens. Um, but the it, it is it is more of like just anxiety, right? Of like showing the actual face cam. And I've done it once before, uh, which, you know, maybe I, I don't know. I think I brought this up once or twice. All I'll say is like, if you really, 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 really dig around my channel, there is one video for a small section of it where I used the face cam. And that was the only time. And it was specifically like a testing it out type of thing. And I still felt really anxious to the point where I had to, you know, pause recording in the middle to just stop because I, I could not focus on what I was doing. Because And this wasn't even a live stream. It was like a video. And I was still just super duper anxious. So... Fansly is like OnlyFans Jr. Arguably better in some ways in reality. Uh. Um, but what else? Uh, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, obviously, you know, it's my stream, it's my channel. I can do whatever I want. 
And there are plenty of people who have very large YouTube channels who never show their face. And I'm not saying that, oh, if you don't show your face, you cannot have, you cannot be successful on YouTube. You cannot have like a large channel because quite frankly, I think I've done fairly well for myself considering I haven't shown my face. Um, but it is honestly an undeniable fact that people are more likely to like enjoy watching your content across on average right if you do actually show your face especially for this type of thing if i'm like making a random ass guide i'm not going to show my face on there anyway even if i do start streaming with a face cam but the reality is especially for stuff like this stuff like the streams the speed runs etc having something like a face cam would 100 percent add to it i can objectively look at that and say yep this would help me it is just it, the the difficulty is getting past the you know objective this would probably be a good thing to do and accepting the fact like you know getting past the anxiety on that it, it's not necessarily an easy jump to make we'll see though maybe one day um what else uh the lack of spammable aoe and consecrate is just not working in the current meta probably drops it down yeah Uh, Prot Warrior, non-dungeon classic era would be terrible. It was your first tune ever. That sucked. Oh, yeah. Um, that, I could 100% see being, like, equivalent of F tier. Leveling in open world questing as a Prot Warrior. Yeah. Absolutely. Or, honestly, F tier in classic would be, like, leveling in open world anything as a healer. That was fast. Okay, somebody declined. Fucking hell. So this is probably not going to be a TBC dungeon just because I literally just expanded the search and it insta popped. Oh my god, no! I must have the list. Oh no! Can I do escape from Durnhold instead? Naomi is correct. I, I, that, no. Uh, I would sooner do Black Morass. There is absolutely no fucking chance I am doing that dungeon. It has no quests. It is the worst fucking thing ever created. So I'm going to get no experience and I'm going to want to fucking kill myself. No, I will pass. Thank you very much. All the fucking dungeons. Why the fuck do people queue for BFA dungeons? God, man. Fucking Temple of Setherless. As long as it doesn't happen two times in a row, it doesn't matter. I just need to not get completely fucked. From now on, we are not expanding the dungeon pool. I'm going to stay in BFA dungeons where it's nice and cozy. Okay, uh, make sure I check healer this time. <laughs> yeah, Naomi is correct, yeah. Oh, oh. In hell. Yeah, oh god, I didn't even think of the healing boss. Oh my god, that would have sucked so much. Oh my god. Okay, I, yeah, wow. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. Of all the times to get Sethralis when I am playing a healer, god no. See, I my mind got to the orb puzzle and I immediately just said, fuck this. But I didn't even get as far as remembering the fact that I am playing a healer and there is a healing boss and I am specced for damage. God. That would have been such a rude awakening. Yeah, I will do anything but that. You're going to stay in BFA dungeons. Oh, did I say BFA? Oh, oh god, no. I I meant yeah, TBC. Whoops. Yeah, that was a uh, definitely not what I meant to say there.
Okay, well, at least the queue time is faster here, and it's a TVC dungeon, so I'm not fucked. You're having no luck trying to queue into the... Yeah. Uh, I wonder if it would be easier or harder on a higher or lower level character. Don't think it would make a difference. Wait, you did and you left? The stream delay. Wait, what happened? So you queued into my group, but you, you left or something? I'm confused. Uh, also, what's my AoE healing thing? I think it's just wild growth. Uh, one of the other problems with, um... Oh, you were the first tank that had the Q-pop. Ah. So you were the one, uh, who, like, I guess it, the tank that it popped for and then, you know, the Q got declined. Or you... Oh. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you queued for it, you thought that you missed me, but you actually would have gotten into the same dungeon. But because you thought it was, uh, a different one, you left. I see. Unfortunate. Okay, I'm going to put Snarian Ward on myself. Uh, you declined because you thought I was still queuing. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have like a built-in stream delay, but sometimes it's off by like, you know, up to 30 seconds or so. So, Worth noting. I don't think I took Soul of the Forest. I can check. Um... I did take Soul of the Forest. Forest. Okay, words. Uh, in that case, yeah, I probably should take Swift Mend. Honestly, I I don't really care too much. Um, mostly worried about damage. Anything else is just bonus. And we have a level 10 Guardian Druid, so quite honestly, if they are not able to handle the shit on their own, then, uh... Yeah, I don't know. I trust that they can just kind of heal themselves. I'll at least throw him a life bloom. Uh, yeah, Sunfire does dick all for damage. Uh, Guardian gets Frenzy Regen. I think it gets it by level 10? I don't remember exactly. I can check the talents. Uh, yeah, it's a baseline spell, because you start with it here. It's not really all that powerful, but, like, I mean, you should be one-shotting mobs, realistically, as a Guardian Druid anyway, so. Eight seconds live latency in the YouTube stats for nerds. Ah. Sense. All right, now I spam Wrath. Don't need to heal if there's no damage being done. Exactly. Okay, so... That was my entire burst window. That is to say, I don't really have one. As a Resto Druid. Heal, brother? Like, what you're bitching. Um, you'd be tempted to leave. I mean, I don't really care. As long as he doesn't keep complaining, I don't give a shit. Like, just keep pulling. You're not gonna die. Just, like, stop being a bitch. Um. You are dead IRL. <laughs> I'm glad you found that amusing. Okay. 
They aren't jumping down? Oh yeah, no. I mean, I technically, yeah, if you don't have the quest, but there's almost always somebody who has the quest, right? So let's usually do this. Uh, do you typically do BC dungeons for leveling? Yes, uh, which is why I'm using them for testing healers, because if you are ever going to be doing dungeon leveling, it is most likely going to be in TBC dungeons, so that is the most accurate place to test them. Uh, just tell him you don't need to heal when you're such a Giga Chad. Yeah, true. Maybe I should have gone for the inflate their ego approach, but somehow I don't really know if that one would have worked. There. They have, like, heirlooms. I don't know why they're concerned. Like, no, he's fine. I guess, realistically speaking, though, it's not like I can really contribute all that much damage as a wrestler druid anyway, so healing him really is not that much of a loss. Just because what else am I going to do? Spam Wrath, I guess, but overall, really not too important. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could go into cat form, I guess, but it's one of those things where I think I talked about this at the start. I was thinking about how much effort I realistically want to put into min-maxing Resto Druid DPS. Because here's the thing about being a Resto Druid. You could, in theory, do slightly more damage by going into bear form or cat form or something in addition to applying like your hots and casting. Why the fuck would you play a Resto Druid? at that point. So I am going to be staying out of any special forms because it like realistically speaking, I you can cat weave and I understand that Rester Druids will sometimes do that at max level, but this is not a mythic plus dungeon. There is absolutely zero reason for me to be playing a Rester Druid if I'm looking to go for damage. It's one of the reasons why I think Rester Druid is genuinely the worst possible option to level as a healer. You just have, like, you can play all the other druid specs and still have the flexibility of having, like, easy, uh, like, free healing as a flex stuff. And we've already gone over the fact that you do not need to be, um, uh, what should we call it? Like, prioritizing healing on a healer. So, it may genuinely be better to, if you, for whatever reason, want to heal Q as a guardian druid... And just, like, sometimes shift out of form and heal people. Realistically speaking, just tank the dungeon. You're going to do more healing with Frenzied Regen than you're going to at all with Resto Druid. And you're going to be killing everything. So it, it is, like, one of those things where if we start to optimize, uh, like, Resto Druid damage past a certain point, it almost becomes, like, pointless. And just defeats the entire purpose of doing this test in the first place. So what I'm trying to figure out is if you are still mostly trying to heal with the Resto Druid, can it at least somewhat contribute on damage? Is there any merit whatsoever to bringing them? And the answer is no, but like that is kind of the entire point. Um... Why did I get pinged? Uh... You've healed dungeons in bear form with After the Wildfire. Yeah, and that's why it's like, it's so weird because, sure, you would probably be better off going into bear form, but at that point, literally just play bear, and who fucking cares about Resto Druid? So, 
I am trying to play Resto Druid somewhat the intended way to demonstrate why there is genuinely no point in playing the spec for leveling in dungeons. I know that that is mostly what I'm going for. Because like Disc Priest, Holy Priest, we saw they crank out damage while also keeping the entire group topped off. There is very much a reason why, like, even if there was a tank spec for priests, you may still want to play Disc. Holy shit, it does damage. Uh honestly. Rustor Shaman, kind of same deal. It does a lot of damage while being able to keep people up. It definitely is a tough sell to ever queue for a healer, though, when your spec can play a tank. Like, provided you are able to queue as a tank, it's like the advantage they provide is just so much better. Uh, oh, wow. The Bronzo donated another 10 euros. Thank you. That That is extremely generous of you. You're Now you're really going to sleep... Uh, words... Okay, now I'm really going to sleep. Tried to stay awake and watch, but you can't no more. It's all good, man. Um, you know, I appreciate you stopping by the stream, and you don't need to feel bad about falling asleep for the end of it. This is, like, the longest stream that I have done in a while. The last time I had a stream go this long, I guess the Rogue Run reached uh, 8 hours 40 minutes. But this one is going to be close to 10 hours, because we're still not even, like, really close to finished. And the last stream I had that came, that was like past nine hours, was it was like over three months ago. So this is going to be a very, very, very long one. I appreciate you stopping by for the time that you were able to. And definitely, I appreciate the donations. That is extremely generous of you. Thank you very much for that. And I'm glad you're looking forward to all those videos. I hope they, uh, hope they live up to your expectations and my expectations. I have a lot of stuff planned over the next few months. Started streaming 68 minutes ago? Oh yeah, because I guess when you join, that uh, little timer thing doesn't update. Going to give myself a little bit more time to keep this guy topped up. I will say, as far as like actual healing goes, maybe one of the nice things about Resto Druids in, um, in Dungeons is because... Realistically speaking, you can't, like, build for damage. I am running a fairly healing-intensive build, because I'm just taking all of the talents that do damage, and then there's a lot left over. And this means that I'm actually able to do a pretty good amount of healing in a, you know, pinch. Whereas with a lot of the other healers, because I kind of gutted my healing kit to be able to do damage, that is not necessarily the case. So, Rest of Druid has that going for it, if all you care about is, like, actual healing, but it's, um, obviously for the purposes of should you level as this if you're trying to be efficient, which is the entire point of this. No. Which is, I, I guess that is another reason why I'm not shifting, right? Because that at least highlights the maybe one strength of Rest of Druid, that as a pure healer, it is probably a little bit stronger than some of the other options. That is the only thing you're looking for. It definitely has a lot of really beefy dungeon heals. Whereas, like, you know, Disc Priest, well, I was able to keep the group really healthy. There were some times where things got a little bit spicy. And if you weren't as familiar with the damage rotation, maybe it would be kind of spooky. So that is definitely something to consider. Uh, I hit the wrong button. This is stuff. All this stuff is going to be dead before I even have a chance to dot it up. What's the two-hour buff I have there? Mastery of the Timeways. It's the um, current Turbulent Timeways thing that, unfortunately, is going away. When does Turbulent Timeways end? 7 a.m. Uh, in less than 12 hours, this buff will no longer be available. So, unfortunate. I also, I didn't even bother doing Turbulent Timeways every single week to get the uh, special thing. Oh man, this guy is going way too far ahead of me. I'm gonna pull the patrol if I stand there.
Uh, all right. Well, um, I don't know what it is, but something about Rest of Druid Healing feels very intuitive for me. And it, I really haven't played it a lot. But, like, the way that it plays, the general, like, healing style clicks with me a lot better than some of the other specs I've tested. I feel like I handled that pull pretty well. Could have done four dungeons and then log out and log back in each week in the same character? I probably could have, honestly. I mean, you know me. I don't really care about mounts and stuff, and that's the only reason to do it. I thought about farming it for my uh, Blood Decay to try and get them like the heroic boxes, and I did it one week, and then I just got really bored and never got around to finishing it. So, um, I don't know. See, I honestly, though, I should, I will probably do that after the stream, at least get it this week for the heroic box in my Blood Decay, and probably like, since I don't really have any video planned for tomorrow, I don't need to like work on anything. I don't have like raid. Uh, that's actually. I just realized that's super nice. My guild is not raiding uh, tomorrow. They're not raiding this week in general because BlizzCon week, a decent amount of my guild is going to BlizzCon, so they have to fly out and stuff like that. We are raiding on the 7th. I will probably stream that. But uh, since we're not raiding tomorrow, I no longer need to like go to bed at a reasonable time so that I can like be well-rested for raid. So I will probably just like stay up all night, finish gearing my death knight a little bit because uh so one thing that like i'll be doing in uh at the start of a new patch my death knight is actually the first character that i plan on doing emerald dream uh world content on so this is something that i discussed back in uh oh the, uh, naomi i was talking about my retail guild because obviously retail I raid Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but uh, lately we've obviously only been doing Tuesday. But because a lot of people are like do busy doing BlizzCon prep, and I mean we've been doing Sark every week for like I don't know, I I don't even know how many Sark kills I have at this point. It's probably like fifteen or something. A lot of people are tired of doing Sark, so uh, the officers figured everybody could use like one week off just to, uh, like, get prepared for BlizzCon and stuff, which is fair, right? Um, I think they were debating even canceling Raid last week, but that was more so because of the other thing that I talked about last stream, which, as you might imagine, kind of hit everybody pretty hard all of a sudden. Uh, but, you know, we did Raid, and actually it was one of our better Raids last week. Wiped on Sark for a little bit, but we, uh, it wasn't, like, the worst thing in the world. Um, and they decided not to do uh, any of the other, like, farm bosses. But it was still fun, you know. Everybody was, like, joking around. It was still a good good raid. I had fun. Which, you know, I was glad. Because it was uh, definitely a, a rough situation, you know. But uh, we are, like I said, raiding on the 7th. Which, that should be fun. Because we get to play around with all the new 10.2 shit. And see how that's going to make killing Sarkarath either easier or better um but oh yeah so what i was saying before is one of the reasons i want to work on my blood decay is i'm going to be doing emerald dream first on this character so on the seventh when i'm streaming like my initial rep farming shit all that's going to be on blood decay not brewmaster because the entire thing that you want to do with like getting the augment rune and stuff is you want to do an alt first and then once you have gotten to Renown 10 on your alt, then you go through on your main. So what I'll probably do is at least unlock it at some point on my Brewmaster, but like try to avoid as many rep sources as possible. And I'm not going to be doing like pretty much anything outside of like time gated stuff. So if there is, if there's like a specific rep source that you can only do once per day, like one thing I will do is world quests with the contract. Any world quests that are about to expire, I will do them with the contract just to make sure that I don't miss out on that source of rep, even if it's not getting boosted. But I am hoping to get to Renown 10 before, uh, like, by Friday or Saturday on my Death Knight. That way, with the Darkmoon Fair buff, I can do all the stuff for rep on my Monk towards the end. And ideally, that should... uh 
let me get to Renown, or at least close to Renown 20, or at least what, whatever it is, like Renown 18, enough for the Augment Rune. Uh, Super Blooms once per hour. Yeah, I guess, well, Super Bloom is a repeatable rep source, right? So, hmm. How much uh, rep does repeated Super Blooms give? Because I know you did a lot of research into that, Naomi. I guess that, that is also a topic that we could discuss in more detail later. Because I am curious. I still need to do further testing on exactly how that works. Uh, 100 rep per hour? Gotcha. Uh, yeah, that would probably be worth doing. The only thing, though, is can you only do Super Bloom on one character? Like, if I did... Uh, I guess it's kind of hard to test right now, though, because in theory, right, uh, uh, the way a bunch of those events work is if uh, the people were taking a really long time to complete the Super Bloom, then you could finish it on one character and then quickly switch to your other character and get a completion at the last second. And as long as that would count, then you would be able to get double rep. But a lot of those uh, events that are like they last for a set amount of time. And you can't really, like, speed them up. But that wasn't the button I meant to press. Uh, it's a little bit tricky because then you're kind of unable to get, like, two characters done at once. Uh, get Renown 10, Day 1 in DK, go Brewmaster and lock stuff, do Super Blooms until... Well, so we'll have Darkman Fair at the start. So that is another thing to keep in mind. In the past, it was you had to farm rep before Darkman Fair. Now we're actually... On the plus side, we'll have Darkman Fair from the very beginning, which makes early rep farming much easier. So, previously, I would not have Darkman Fair buff. Like, I did not have Darkman Fair buff when farming rep in patch 10.1, because I needed to get there before the buff rolled around so that I could then use it on my character. Now, I will have it on my Death Knight, so it'll be 10% easier. However, I will um, also be on a clock where I need to be able to hit Renown 10 before the thing goes away. Now, I'm pretty sure that that will be not super difficult to accomplish, but I will need to kind of figure it out in, like, exactly how I want to do that. One second. Let me keep everybody alive. Uh, why are you talking about getting DK up before Darkman Fair? Um, yeah, I, I meant doing it before it's gone. That's what I mean. I need to get my DK up to Renown 10 before it is gone. That is what I, I was saying there. Um, so that is, like, something important that I need to do. Because if I don't have, like, realistically speaking, I have until Friday to get to Renown 10. Because I'm gonna need, like... I could maybe squeeze it in on Saturday, but I would like to give myself at least like over 24 hours to get every single rep source done on my Brewmaster, because ideally I should be super close to Renown 18 by the end of the 11th. And I want to make sure I have as much time to do that as possible, especially considering I'm going to be working on videos a lot. So if I need to, like, I don't want to repeat the disaster of patch 10.1, where, like I said earlier, I had to buy a boost because I fell behind on rep. Um, do you think that with, like, the current math that you've done, you can, like, I don't know if you've written it down, do you honestly think it will be possible to get Renown 10 on day one? I haven't looked into it a ton. I guess, though, the other thing is, we discussed this before, but it will depend a lot on what Blizzard decides to make available day one. Now, they did post that campaign availability thing, where it seemed to indicate that all of the main story stuff would be available on the first day. I hope that is true, and that is what they are going for. And it's not just like a miscommunication, but it is entirely possible they delay the campaign again. And they didn't outright say that it would be available. They just didn't put a date on it. So we're left to assume that, you know, we have all of them available on launch. Uh, if you do first five chapters Super Blooms, then wait for a Dream Surge. I see. So you're saying... You would do all of like the chapter tokens with the Darkman Fair rep buff, with the 70 or well, the 50% Dream Surge rep buff. And mathematically speaking, those five tokens would be enough to get you to Renown 10, along with like a handful of extra rep sources. I see the math there. 
because five 2,500 rep tokens would be um, renowned five. And then the 50% buff plus 10% uh, would be 60%. So that would get you to like what? Renown, renown eight ish. And then there's almost certainly enough ways to farm renown to get uh, like two renown levels or so. I assume, it, is that, am I correct in saying that that is like the math that you're doing for that? Or am I missing something? Uh, the chests, oh yeah. I didn't realize they added rep to those. It's around 14k, or four, I assume, are you saying 14,000 rep? Uh, from just the tokens you get, if you turn in inside a dream search. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm curious as to how the potential delays could affect it. I also, I still am unsure if they are going to put in Super Blooms at launch. If you are able to find somewhere where they have outright said Super Blooms will be available within the first week of the patch, starting on the 7th, then that would make things much easier because then we could plan around that. But they waited until the last second to say that Researchers Under Fire would not be available until the week of the raid releasing which severely hindered my initial projections for how much rep I could farm. So I'm not entirely sure how that will play out. But if they confirm it somewhere, then that would definitely make the projections a little bit easier. Yeah. I still think even if they do push Super Blooms back and we don't have the full token stuff available... So that would be tricky then, because the concern is, what if there is simply not enough rep to reach Renown 10 before the end of the Darkened Fair? Like, what do I do at that point? I guess I would probably still need to just eat the fact that I'm not getting the 10% rep buff on my monk. Because it would still, no matter how you slice it, be better to get... Um, 100% increased rep over the Dark and Fair buff, so yeah, that, that is like a no-brainer. However, it would definitely feel kind of bad. Hello? Tank? Just uh, apparently fuck everybody else. I'm just going to hold W and completely ignore the mobs that just walked into my group. That's awesome. Um, Yeah, 100% for the first 10 levels is definitely better. I guess the... Nightmare scenario is that there is some ultra degen way to, technically speaking, reach Renown 10, and it is only possible with that ultra degen method. And then it's like, okay, am I actually going to do this just to get 10% additional rep, or do I just say fuck it and wait it out and just accept the loss? I guess we'll have to see when push comes to shove, but... Yeah, I don't know. Might be only with Super Blooms if they delay the campaign. Yeah. Alright, hold on. Now that I, I'm getting towards the end of the stream, so I want to scroll up and make sure... Um, actually, I think, yeah, I've already started to have some of the messages get pushed off. Because I missed a few. Oh, well. Uh, I think I read most of the old stuff, but there might be like one or two messages I didn't get around to reading. Earlier, Dreamer Magister said, I think Blizz should give us options to increase the difficulty of the leveling experience. I have seen... I, I saw, like, a really weird comment. There is a... There's a Reddit post that was made on, like, the classic subreddit a few days ago about, like, you know, making fun of retail leveling, which is fine. Honestly, the, the post in itself is not bad. Basically, it, it's a typical classic post of, haha, retail leveling bad, classic leveling good, which... Whatever. Uh, in, in some cases, they are honestly not even wrong. The problem is, if you go into the comments section of that post, there are some absolutely unhinged takes about retail and retail leveling in general. And, you know, people, classic players giving suggestions to make retail leveling actually feel meaningful again. And they are just some of the most mind-numbingly stupid suggestions I've seen in my entire life. And I think if Blizzard were to make leveling more challenging, optionally, right, 
I obviously think they should never go back on what they've done now in terms of making this available to players. The current setup is great. It is perfectly accessible for people who are, uh, you know, trying to, uh, whatchamacallit, who are trying to level their characters efficiently. It's great for new players. Overall, it gives you lots of options. It's good. They should never take this away. But, like, one comment that stuck out to me on that Reddit post about, like, you know, retail leveling being bad is somebody said, and, and like, it wasn't even, like, a troll comment. Like, they, they typed this... Because like it, they, it wasn't you know clearly bait. They the way they described it and worded it, it sounded like they genuinely believed this would be a good idea. Um, and in some ways, I see where they were going for. They basically said there should be different difficulties of leveling that you can enable, where there is normal leveling and then heroic leveling. And they they said heroic leveling should be like wrath speed or something. And then um, mythic leveling should be like TBC era speed or something like that. And it takes forever and everything is a slog and things take forever to kill. And I'm just like, why? Why would you want this? Because like, okay, it's different to basically say, I like the cadence of TBC or classic leveling. And I've said before, it's a, a different game, very different experience. But I can understand why people enjoy classic leveling for what it is. I enjoy classic leveling for what it is, but for different reasons than I enjoy retail leveling. Like, when I'm playing classic, it is very much more like the experience. I want to experience, like, you know, the world and stuff like that and take my time and have fun. And, yeah, it's slow, but, I mean, the entire game is about the leveling journey. It is. As many people say, it's the journey, not the destination. Honestly, by the time you get to, like, Wrath, that is honestly, that isn't even really true. TBC, you can argue to some extent, it was probably true back in, you know, that time in, like, the game. But they were already adding ways to speed up leveling back in Wrath of the Lich King. That's when we got heirlooms. And right now in, like, Wrath Classic, it is very much about the destination. Nobody is playing Wrath Classic or I would should say the vast majority of people playing Wrath Classic are not doing so for the leveling journey. People who want that leveling journey are already going back to Classic Era because the thing that they want is more prevalent in that version of the game. And, you know, it, it is just a very different style, right? Some people want endgame stuff. Some people want, um, like, you know, the, the leveling experience things. And... That is, like, not even a hot take. That is something you, you don't need me to say. The reason why this comment surprised me is that person, I think, just... It's like a false dichotomy of saying that the reason why classic leveling is good or the reason why classic leveling is considered difficult is the, like, amount of time it takes. And that if you just arbitrarily added that same amount of playtime and tedium to retail leveling, it would magically become more difficult. And no, that would not make retail leveling more difficult. Like, just look at Double Agents. Literally, the thing that we talked about earlier of mob grinding and stuff, there are a million different ways to make retail leveling as slow as classic leveling. It's just not interesting or fun. So why would you do that? Why would you equate that to an added challenge and added difficulty it, it is not even remotely comparable the thing that makes classic leveling hard quote unquote by most people's standards is that you need to have a better understanding of your class things take longer to kill you can only fight a few mobs at once because if you over pull you die and like maybe these people or the guy who wrote that is like thinking in an alternate reality where magically if you were to make like Every leveling mob in retail deal 500% increased damage and have 500% increased health. That magically, suddenly, leveling would become so much harder. But, like, I, I don't think that those classic players realize that, like, Prop Paladin exists and Guardian Druid exists. And, like, you could make mobs hit 1,000% harder. Yes, you would pull slightly smaller, but you would still be leveling at, like, 75%, 50% efficiency and it would only take like a few additional hours. 
because those specs are broken. Now, if you were to level a rogue where mobs are hitting 500% harder, suddenly, yeah, that starts to become, like, ridiculously impossible. But that is also because, you know, adding random scaling modifiers, especially to mobs that were not designed to have random scaling modifiers, is not an interesting way to create difficulty. It is, by definition, artificial difficulty that does not make something harder or easier, it just makes it more tedious and take longer, which is exactly why, like I said, it is a poor understanding of what people enjoy in classic leveling and a poor understanding of what makes classic leveling hard quote unquote and obviously hardcore is a completely different story because hardcore the difficulty is that you can't make mistakes none of the individual things that i am doing in hardcore are challenging it is the fact that before doing any quest i have to look it up to make sure is this something that could potentially kill me and there have been multiple times where in hardcore I have decided, eh, I'm not going to look something up, and then I've almost gotten my teeth kicked in just because I wasn't prepared. And, you know, that in retail would just be one of those, like, woo, that was a close one moments, whereas in Classic Hardcore, it's obviously like, oh, fuck, I have to restart. Different, you know, comparison, obviously, we're talking more about just Classic in general, um, but I would say, if anything, whereas in retail, understanding your class makes leveling faster, in Classic Understanding your class is fundamental to being able to level at even a remotely fast pace. Um, and that is why, when I say I want leveling to be more challenging, my entire point is I want it to be more engaging. I want there to be content throughout the leveling process that forces me to understand my class and use my kit appropriately. Things like Yetimus. Yetimus is a fantastic example of how to make leveling more engaging because 99% of my leveling runs are boring until they reach Yetimus, in which case everybody sits up in their seats like, oh shit, you know, this is going to be fun. Because now you get to see, can this class kill Yetimus, which has actual mechanics and is notorious for just demolishing people because it is actually somewhat hard. And if you had more challenges like Yetimus throughout a run, such as go solo the Fell Reaver at level 30, well, you know what? That is actually maybe somewhat of a challenge. I've said before, some of the other challenges that I might include is go solo Ring of Blood at like, you know, level 30 or something like that. I don't know exactly what levels or what things, but things of that nature are what I am thinking of for the type of challenges that I want to have present within like my leveling challenge run format. And I I have still the one thing that I, I've invited people to guess what they think that the final challenge in my leveling challenge run format would be. Uh, so far, I haven't seen anybody get an accurate guess on that. Um, but I have a really cool idea for what I would want the final challenge of that to be. And I think it would be the perfect way to add difficulty to a leveling run. And I think it would be really fucking fun. And there's like a few different ideas I have that I haven't really expanded upon a lot because like, you know, I want to keep that a surprise for when I finally unveil the format that I've been working on. But that is kind of the entire level of difficulty that I'm going for with those types of challenge runs. It is something that makes you more engaged and makes you think more about the abilities you pick. One of the other things that I've already said is I want there to be randomized talents, right? It's like a roguelike where you get offered a random selection of talents uh, as you level up and you can't choose your specific build. That way you need to think very carefully about which talents you're taking because you're like, hey, you know, I may not be offered this one specific thing that works really well with my kit. So do I want to take like, you know, this talent that's really good with the right synergies or this other talent that's more generally useful? And there'll be a lot more decision making in theory with that stuff. That is kind of the entire thing that I think would make retail leveling more interesting. Play into the actual like mechanical difficulty aspects that make retail endgame fun and then, yeah, add stuff like that to the leveling process. And if Blizzard were to add things like that to leveling themselves and make it like a fun challenge, I absolutely think the challenge run format idea I have would work even better if it was in the context context of like an actually like fleshed out in-game design where you could go wild with like a lot of different modifiers and stuff like that. But I still think it'll be fun even in a vacuum within like a, you know, self-made format type thing. Anyways. Um, and yeah, Dreamer Magister even said, give some, uh, like, T-Mogs or something if, you, if it's necessary. I think, yeah, that kind of thing, you know, appearances and fun little cosmetics would be a great way to reward things like that. Uh, similar to Diablo ARPGs, higher difficulty, better drops, XP and gold. Yeah, kind of. 
And, uh, oh, I should say Naomi, uh, one thing that is slightly incorrect is the, uh, Broken Thaldrasis quest line actually did not exist since leveling last year. It has existed since patch 10.1. That is honestly the reason it remained undetected for so long. It was a generic quest line added to a leveling zone that for whatever reason did not exist on launch. It was just a generic quest line added in patch content, which is why very few people thought to check like, hey, did they randomly add new quests to a leveling zone because something they don't really do a lot and uh, i think that is honestly why the leveling scaling was fucked up in the first place because when they designed the quest line they probably intended for it to be for max level characters probably fucked up some values in the back end and then they accidentally made it available to all players and well here we are uh what's my favorite tank dps and healer spec individually right now um brewmaster monk windwalker monk and uh, no opinion. Probably Holy Priest if I had to pick one. I'm not a healer player. Uh, let's see. I also... Oh, another thing that I think would absolutely be uh, like crucial for a leveling challenge run format that I hate when people suggest this. Do not give it a experience bonus. I hate when people are like, they should make a harder version of leveling. And it makes leveling faster. No. For the love of God, please no. The last thing that people need is another mandatory quote-unquote buff to apply to make their leveling more annoying just because they want to be efficient. It's the worst thing about war mode. Like, if war mode wanted to exist so people could do PvP while leveling, sure. But the fact that in many cases you get a 20% experience bonus for turning it on means that even for people who don't care about PvP at all, it feels mandatory. If you give a challenge run format an experience bonus, you are going to be forcing people who have no interest in it into that form of content. That is the absolute worst thing you could ever do. And I really, really, really hope if Blizzard ever decides to add like more interesting leveling methods it is entirely for cosmetics and not at all for actual experience increases you know as somebody who loves xp buffs i love xp buffs when it is just a slap it on to the regular run and you do the same thing again i would be happy to do challenge runs for the fun of it but the last thing i need is for people to feel compelled to run things that they don't want to do because they think they need to do it to level faster it's terrible all you need to do is give it cool cosmetics and people will do it just for fun. And if they don't want to do it just because they want to casually level up a character, they will casually level up a character in chill stuff instead of forcing themselves to do the hard mode. Terrible, 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 terrible thing that a lot of people have suggested. I think it's a horrible idea. Um, Let's see. I've read a lot of this stuff. Uh, I don't, oh yeah, Chori, I don't know if I actually addressed that, but I did see your message about the Silver Pine Rare, uh, when you posted it in Discord. I glanced at that in Discord. Definitely good to know. I kind of assumed that's how it worked, as I mentioned on the stream, but I appreciate you confirming that. It is very nice to have, like, the official confirmation just to know, like, once and for all that, yes, that is how that thing functions. All right, one more dungeon for this, and we'll be good to go. I could probably grab, convoke, circle of life and death, take this, take this, and... Sure. I'll just queue. One more dungeon should do the trick here, as long as I don't get escape from Durnholt. Honestly, if I get escape from Durnholt, I'm probably just going to not continue the druid run, just because... Like, we're at 59. We've already, you know... We, we know how Druid plays. There's no surprises here. Uh, yeah, it, it has not been impressive damage-wise. I've already said all I really need to say about it. If it's, like, a good dungeon, I'll knock it out just for the sake of finishing the Druid. But I am slightly tight on time here. There's nothing... Okay, this... No matter what, Underbog, perfect. Underbog is a short and sweet one. Um, let me, I'm going to quickly scroll through chat to see if there was anything I missed. Uh, stressing the reach, rank 24 and dragon scale to finish the campaign quest before next patch. Well, I, Mass V, if you're still watching, the campaign before next patch does not matter from that stuff. To be clear, the campaigns are completely disconnected from any of the endgame stuff, and, uh, it is not a prereq. The only prereq, which I will mention this in a video, but if you want to start preparing for... Um, 
endgame stuff in the next patch. Fuck, wrong. Uh, Dragon Isles. The, the quest line from Chandris that starts right around here, that is the only prerequisite for starting the Emerald Dream. And it is not skippable on alts. So I would highly recommend whenever you have time, go do that quest line. It's like, it's not super long, pretty easy. Uh, just go blast that out on all of your alts that you plan on doing the patch content with because you will need to do that. Oh shit, this guy dying. This guy's dying. Oh no. Don't die on me. I haven't let this tank die and I don't plan on, you know, letting him die just yet. That was actually really close. I almost panicked for a second there and I'm like swift mend and I just kind of pressed other buttons and things worked out. But uh, his health bar was a little bit spooky there. Yeah, I feel like unless I'm doing anything crazy on Rest of Druid, the only thing I can really do to contribute is like put up Sunfire and then maybe throw out a few of these. Doesn't seem like it adds up to much. Unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, that is the only prereq. Anything else is just bonus. So definitely do that on your characters, though. I, I will, of course, cover that in a video and cover anything else, like, important. I don't know exactly what I'll title that video because I am I definitely want to make sure people have that information. So I might make, like, a generic things to do before patch 10.2 and it'll be, like, a three-minute really quick that plus, like, one or two other quick things to prepare. Uh, we'll see, though. Honestly, if if I have nothing else to cover... I might just make a video that is literally just do this quest line before patch 10.2 and it will be literally a one minute video just saying make sure you do this campaign quest. It is a prerequisite because that is absolutely important information. So that is the type of thing that like I would probably include that like bundle it in with other stuff that's like relevant. But if I can't find anything other any other interesting info on like, you know, things you should do before the patch, I will just mention that. Quick, short and sweet, one minute video. Boom. We'll see them. Uh, why have I gotten so many pings? Uh, no, my, um, my friend sent me his, uh, one of my healer friends who, my healer friend who is my number one, uh, most played with healer during, uh, season two. So, uh, in case anybody hasn't seen the Raider.io recaps are available now for the current season. So I did mine right before starting the stream. And, uh, one of my healer friends was my second most played with person. And the first one was a mage friend of mine who unfortunately... Uh, my mage friend was from OE, and after all the OE bullshit, he uh, he stopped playing. Not necessarily because of OE, but just because like he wasn't about to find a new guild. He has like too much shit going on. But yeah, you know, I'm still friends with him, right? Uh, and uh, I, I even I offered him like, hey, I will try to help you either get a trial in this guild somehow, or like write a letter of recommendation so you can get into a different guild because he was like really, really, really good. But you know, unfortunately, he said he was actually taking a break, so unlucky but he was my most played with uh person during this season and then my healer friend was number two and uh he sent me his recap just now and i was his number three so we were both within each other's top five for who played with who also this druid is like really 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 scared i don't blame them oh their health dropped kind of low there but i had them they were covered. Uh, let's see. Speedwagon is your favorite character? Awesome. Yeah, good old Speedwagon. I'm glad I kept that character. I don't know if I'll ever move those tunes off of um, Nemesis. Honestly, I might want to keep them on Brazilian servers now, because the one nice thing about Brazilian servers, as we saw in the video three years ago when I first leveled Speedwagon, is that they are very good for finding chests. 
So in theory, if I ever wanted to set up the perfect speedrun, it would not only be like in the middle of the night or something, but it would be uh, on a Brazilian server because there is basically no competition for stuff. That being said, it would also be in a uh, like on the you know PTR or something would be the best place to do a speedrun if I wanted perfect RNG. But on live servers, the best opportunity would be on Brazilian stuff. So we'll see. Maybe I'll do that at some point in the future. And it's good to have Speedwagon over there in case I need him to like check stuff out on the Brazilian server in advance. Uh, what would you say is the most beginner-friendly healer? I, I don't know enough about healers to say that. Like, they all, a lot of them feel pretty easy while leveling. Like, Holy Priest feels pretty simple for leveling. Uh, Rest of Shaman isn't too hard for leveling. But, really, I don't think you should, like, I'm considering this stuff for leveling more just for fun, for, like, analytical purposes. I generally don't think you should ever base your... Pick on what you play on how good it is for leveling. You can sometimes pick your spec, right? So let's say you really want to play a Resto Druid, and you've already made up your mind you want to play Resto. Well, you should never level as Resto. Just level as a Guardian Druid, and then when you get to endgame, swap to Resto. That is the only thing where I think it kind of matters, just because one is significantly faster than the other. But if you're like, I don't know which I should uh, play at endgame... Priest or Shaman, which one is easier to level, that should never be a consideration. They'll usually be within the same range. The only class as a whole that falls behind is Rogue. And, you know, Rogue is what it is. Uh, note to self, always compliment names. You may get an extra run from Harleton. Yeah, true. Uh, leveling from 60 to 70 on a fresh alt and leveling from 60 to 70 in one hour are both prop pally. Yeah. Well... Yeah, so the recent world record, that was on Prop Pally. Yeah, true. I completely forgot about that. I could have just said that. I, I wasn't even thinking of my recent... I, I guess it's technically, by most, like, definitions, no longer a world record because, like, you know, it got nerfed. But that run was a Prop Pally run. I can't believe I didn't even think to mention that. I just kind of forgot it was on a Prop Pally. Whoops. Uh, but yeah, I definitely did a bunch. Do you think it would be worth it to do a speedrun on a character that gets the gear upgrade since it puts them directly on Morchi? Um, I don't know. So, Chori, I assume you might be still here because, you know, usually you stick around. You asked a question about being whether it's worth it to do a speedrun on a character. I, yeah, I, I don't fully understand that question. I don't know if you remember the context of that, but I, I'm not entirely sure what you mean. In your guides, you recommend to go to WAD at level 25. Is there a reason it's not recommended until 30 when you get flying? Uh, because the WAD intro, you can't fly. Oh, uh, Naomi answered that. Awesome. You just realized you're not subscribed? Yeah. I mean, hey, if anybody who's watching this enjoys the stuff and isn't subscribed, you know, friendly reminder for that. And if you haven't liked the video yet, that always helps too. Good to mention every now and then. Um... I think I've read most of these messages. Yeah, because this was where we had the VTuber model discussion. I remember I, that was like, I actively read all those. And we were like discussing it back and forth. Um, if you're basing it a bit on patch, you're ranking H Priest above Disc. You believe Disc got some aura nerfs that will reduce Holy Nova's damage a little bit below H Priest. Yeah, but at the same time, Disc definitely does more single target damage than Holy. So I don't know. I think even with those nerfs, Disc's single target was considerably ahead of Holy. Holy had really strong burst AoE though, but Disc was also good. I think as it currently stands, I would probably put Disc one spot ahead of Holy. Like on the tier list, they would both be in A tier right next to each other. Because it was extremely comparable. The only thing is, which one is ahead right now? I honestly, I would put Disc ahead. I enjoy playing Holy, because Holy is like, you know, brain off, press Holy Nova, <laughs> and Imperial Blaze is a really fun button to press, but Disc was very, very powerful. It surprised me, I did not expect it to be able to compete, but it has a lot of modifiers that also apply to Holy Nova, 
So it ends up doing most of Holy Priest's damage, uh, and it makes up for the lack of Imperial Blaze with a lot of good sickle target damage and a lot of strong modifiers to make Holy Nova even stronger for Disc than it is for Holy. So not something I was expecting there. Oh, it always picks me. Alright, at the very least, our Arrested Druid done. Uh, okay, so yeah, this was Temple of Sethrilis. And let's quickly hop over to the Shaman and knock that one out. Check the wrist you got that proc to socket tertiary, and it would be really good in general. Though there's another bracer that already has a socket that can proc a second socket. Ah. Alright, that makes sense. Yeah, I could see that being even stronger. Uh, Dragonflight Crafted Gear has an effect. It's also really good for some specs, and you can add a socket to it with the vault tokens. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, as long as you keep Scenarian Word and Life Bloom up, you can basically live in cat form. I suppose, yeah, I could see that. But I think you would still probably need to shift. Uh, okay, so one thing I'm going to do is, uh, like I said, I want to mostly do TBC dungeons. I'm going to do some Wrath Time Walking. Specifically because, um, well, I I will end with like a handful of TBC dungeons. We've already done like a million. And I need to make sure that this is not over 10 hours. So Time Walking is obviously faster. So I don't know exactly how many I'll do, but I'll do like two time walking dungeons and then maybe one or two TBC dungeons. But uh, I'd rather bend the rules a little bit than literally not be able to finish the video because it's going to go over 10 hours and the recording would be lost forever. That is not going to happen. So uh, I'm going to try and get this to 60 in under one hour. Um... okay i remember a lot of these messages oh yeah naomi this is when we were talking about reputation so i guess that when i scrolled up it was right at the end of the reputation discussion yep if you get the same okay so this was when i was discussing the like potential challenge mode things for um there we go nice fast queue when I was discussing the potential hard modes for leveling, Naomi said that might be the worst suggestion you've ever heard. Anolana said, I don't see the reward there. Uh, if you can get the same thing but easier, why would you not take the easy route? Yeah. Everyone is going to what you posted in disc. What did you post in disc? Huh. I'll have to check that out. Interesting. Um, oh yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, Zach, if you want to post that in my Discord, in case people are curious, I don't know if anybody said that they were interested in seeing that, but I have no problem, like, I don't care about private server stuff, also, this Blood Decay is, like, you know, big dick just, uh, slamming over here, he just gives absolutely no fucks. Uh, I was not prepared to immediately have to heal before I was even, like, fully set up, so... Uh, I'm just gonna press chain heal and hope that's enough. Because this is not what I was expecting. Uh, it, hey, it worked. Man, this guy is just full sending it. Alright. <laughs> sure. Uh, I have water walking, so I can... I can spam water walking on myself and on other people. And, um... Fuck. Killing rain. Here we go. I thought I was gonna have some time to fucking sit here and read chat, and instead it's just right out of the gate. Bam, this guy's just, like, throwing me through the ringer. Which, you know, good. I did say I need to level <laughs> in under an hour, and... Uh, this guy's making it happen, so... 
Uh, I'm not even upset. I'm actually going to bloodlust. This is the hardest pull in the dungeon. Uh, okay, we're going to put a flame shock up. Lava burst. Ooh, got two lava bursts. And I'm going to put acid rain. Acid rain. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, here we go. Riptide. Throw this up. Ah, uh, good damage overall. I'm still, that was like my first actual pull with this, so it could definitely get better, but that was not bad. Wait, where are you going? You're telling me Mr. I'm going to pull ridiculously quickly is not jumping over the railing? The thing that everybody does? All right, well, I'm, I guess I'll clear out the piranhas. God, Lightning Lasso is actually such a stupid ability. Um, oh yeah, so what I was saying, Zach, if you want to post the private server stuff there, I don't give a shit, right? Um, obviously, I know what you meant about, like, don't actively discuss it on stream, etc., etc. That's smart. But, like, in my own private Discord, if, like, you know, you post it and some people are interested in it, cool, I, I do not give a shit. Fuck Blizzard, honestly. life, healing rain. All right, lock a burst. And all oh, more lava bursts. All right, now we're cooking. Yeah, lava burst, kind of juicy for sure. And I should note that, like, the general damage uh, that you deal does not feel significantly different uh, in Time Walking Dungeons. So the main reason that I didn't want to do Time Walking Dungeons is because of the damage intake. When I was doing Time Walking on my Druid and my Priest earlier today, it was actually specifically this pull. The Rhino Charges, uh, if you are, like, at a low enough level... I don't really want to demonstrate it because it's probably going to kill me, but, like, if you're not super high level, these Rhino Charges, the way it scales, they will just insta-kill you. And that is not very fun. Let's, uh, be clear on that. Oh my god, this guy's getting cranked. Yeah, the, this pull in general just trucks. It is one of the hardest hitting pulls I've had to do in Time Walking Dungeons, just because of, like, weird scaling bullshit. I'm going to do one lava burst, storm keep. Fuck! That's instant cast. That's instant cast. And let's do another lava burst and reapply flame shock. Okay. Now I'm going to channel lightning lasso with the buff. All right, that was pretty good. Uh, Alright, well, the tank left, so I guess I'm just requeuing. Um, You've heard there are good private servers up now, even with official Wrath Classic? Yeah. 
I've heard that too. I have not tried any. The only thing I'm considering trying is a Cataclysm Classic uh, private server just before like Blizzard opens up the Cataclysm Classic beta. Because as I've said before, I'm really excited to try that stuff out. So I want to get as much testing done as possible even before the official beta is out there. But obviously, once the official servers are live, I'll switch over to those. But, you know. Uh... Oh, it's... Uh, yeah, I I've heard about that server. Yeah. Heard a lot of people saying it's, like, actually somewhat decent. I don't know if I'll ever check it out, but it it's it sounds interesting from what I've been told. Um All right. Okay, Nexus uh Nexus is not terrible. We already talked about how Blizzard stocks his channel for things to nerf. Yeah, I mean, I don't... So, to be clear, I don't think Blizzard is, like, always watching my channel and it's, like, a big conspiracy. But I do think that they probably keep an eye on, like, channels like mine and Arch Valder's too, I'm fairly certain, since a lot of the stuff he p reports gets nerfed. Channels where they know that, like, if we talk about things that are overpowered or broken or whatever, Blizzard will definitely keep an eye on it. And if I happen to make a video on something that is really good, it will get nerfed. The moment it, like, catches Blizzard's attention, which is, like, it happens usually for any video that is, uh, I would say, like, 20,000 views or higher, Blizzard starts to take notice, give or take. Obviously, the exact number varies, but that is, like, the number where I've seen if it gets that much, Blizzard will almost certainly nerf it. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. It's, it's kind of like that bittersweet thing of, I'm glad this video is doing well, but damn, it's probably going to get nerfed now, isn't it? And usually, yes. Yes, it will. And that always sucks. I'm gonna just spam chain lightning here. Cause duh. Lightning bolts. Oh, this guy's pulling more. Alright. Yeah, overall, Shaman damage definitely seems pretty good. I still want to do one or two TPC dungeons, but the way I see it is time walking dungeons are definitely better than regular dungeons, and this way we get to build up the buff. Especially, well, time walking dungeons are better than regular dungeons if you are not doing dungeon quests, which I do not have the dungeon quests for TPC. At least I don't think so. Maybe I do. Um, actually, I probably do. But either way, uh, that combined with the experience buff makes this worth doing obviously before you do the other dungeons and this guy is looking to get himself killed uh, you better have a cooldown here because if you do a pull that fucking aggressive there's only so much i can do here buddy Okay. Any second now. Alright. Jesus Christ. What level is this hunter? Oh. It's an 8 out of 9 mythic hunter. Okay, well that explains why he's just murdering everything. 
And the Paladin is... Okay, well, the Paladin's at least max level, so the scaling is not really going to apply to him quite as badly. To catch up. This is, I would say, one of the downsides of Resto Shaman. As we said before, Disc Priest and Holy Priest can do basically everything on the fly. Resto Shaman, a lot of times I find myself sitting here casting, and I'm lagging behind the group a little bit, so it takes me a bit of time to keep up. That's not ideal. It's not enough to make it bad. Like, I'm still doing good damage. This is like... It's harder to evaluate with time walking, but I would say this is like around the same as Windwalk or Mistweaver, but probably a little bit higher. Especially because it's a lot more flexible single target or AoE. And uh, I will say, love, I... I find it unlikely that Blizzard would DMCA me if somebody in my chat was talking about a private server. I think that would be, like, a little bit much. Um, I, like, if this stream, like, if I was a much larger streamer, maybe. But I think, you know, a smaller stream, unlikely. But, like, if I was actively advertising it or something like that, I could maybe see blizzard being upset about that but it's also why like i'm not discussing it i'm just saying like i don't really think if you talk about it in chat it really matters i could be wrong though maybe um maybe that is the th the the case you probably know more about that than i do but i'm not, I'm not entirely sure uh let's see naomi said why wasn't it added in 10.0 yeah i have no idea why it wasn't it was very weird, I, but it, it's also like, I believed it when I saw that it wasn't added until 10.1, because I distinctly remember seeing that quest randomly appear on a bunch of my characters, like at the start of patch 10.1, and I had no idea what it was, And because especially on my monk, because it's marked as a campaign quest, and I remember thinking like, why is there a non-completed campaign quest on my monk? I know I 100% of the campaign at the start of the expansion. So that always seemed odd to me, but I never really gave it a second thought. And then later on, I found out that there was this new quest line that was then added in patch 10.1 as like a sequel to one of the baseline uh, story campaigns or story quest lines in, uh, in Thaldrasis. And I was like, oh, so that's the thing that was appearing on my characters at the start of this patch. But it definitely was not added until... Uh, the next patch, because I distinctly remember that happening, and of course, I mean, if you just check Wowhead, it says wasn't added. But, like, I guess my point was more so, Wowhead is not wrong on that or anything, uh, because I, I remember that being the case, too. Drop a... Acid rain over there, and I guess I just spam chain lightning now. Oh fuck, I missed my free meatball. Oh fuck. Come on, I need to get in range before I lose this uh, free lava burst. Yes. And then. Before Master of the Elements fades, I need to stop getting fucking dazed by this stupid crystalline flare. Oh, that was really annoying. Alright, whatever. If it's dead, it's dead. It's weird how mop challenge mode speedruns became timed uh, Mythic Plus gear drops. Yeah, I mean, I think challenge modes were overall a better form of content, in my opinion, partially for that reason. I think uh, that the whole, like, you're just doing it as a fun, spammable challenge was infinitely better than farm this over and over to get better gear, but it needs to be tuned to be really annoying so that, you know, people can't get gear for free. But it can't be tuned to be too difficult, otherwise then nobody can get it. 
whereas challenge modes were arguably too difficult. Challenge modes were fucking brutal. The thing about challenge modes, though, is you had infinite attempts and could just reset over and over and over and over and over. So challenge modes I liked because it was all about setting up the perfect run. We would fail repeatedly, and then we would just go again. And it's like, we do the first room slightly incorrectly. All right, just reset. And I know you can do that on, like, tournament realms and shit, but I'm just saying, like, I would prefer if it was an actual format of that nature. All right, what level am I? Oh, no, fuck that. The tank's not requeuing. I'll do one more time walking dungeon, and then I will do a few TBC dungeons. I just want to be absolutely 100% certain that there is no chance I don't finish this run before uh, the stream runs over the 10-hour mark. I'm taking zero chances here. Oh shit, I actually... It's an appearance I don't have. Uh, let's just get rid of this stuff. Uh, time to go back to Temple of Sethrilis and the Shaman soon. Oh, God. Could you use rockets to jump to the final boss in Underbog? Uh... I can test it in the next instance, but I'm 99% sure that X-52 Rocket Helm would not work within instances, Troy. But, uh, it's worth a shot. If it doesn't work in one instance, though, it won't work in any. The Season 2 recap is your top 5 players played with. Two are your M-plus healer, his Pally Priest, and three are your guildies you did runs with in week one. Shows how many runs you did, yeah. Leveling is almost never representative of Endgame. Look at Windwalker Monks being complete dog shit, for example. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thanks for the reminder. I'll unsubscribe right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. X-52 Rocket Helm. Yep, can only use outside. It's a good idea, though. It's a good thought. Uh, definitely. See, stuff like that is how you find skips in the first place. Just ask yourself, like, can I use XYZ item here? And a lot of times the answer is going to be no. It, it won't have any practical use cases. But if you ask that question enough, you're bound to find a situation like the Undercity one where it's like, oh, fuck, that's actually a time save. That one's pretty good. I should also note on the topic of potential time saves in one of my runs, I think it was the Rogue Speed run, I discussed a potential time save in the WAD intro. And upon retesting it, I found that it is not actually a time save. While you can skip the final cutscene, you still need to watch the introduction uh, cutscene where it's like, uh, this dang army is going to get here any minute. Khadgar, buy us some time or whatever the fucking one it is. Um, and then he's like, we'll do all we can, Thalen. That intro cutscene, even if you jump out of the little cannon and jump back in, you still need to watch that playthrough all over again. So, unfortunately, that means that there is no actual time save to skipping the final cutscene, uh, because if you exit the, the seat and come back in in order to do that, you will just need to watch the entire thing from the start. So it, like, defeats the entire purpose, basically. Um, bring me ball. Let me make sure I'm not letting these guys die. Uh, let me see. If you don't play a character that's still leveling, you get a gear upgrade. Oh, the gear upgrade. I see what you're talking about. Uh, that will allow you to remove all your quests and reset your position to Chromie. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong, Troy, but what you're saying is... You do like a partial speed run and then you log out of that character for an extended period of time and use the teleport to Chromie as a time skip across like a speed run that is focused on slash play. Am I correct in that? Or were you suggesting something else?
Uh, the single target is nice. Not sure how much that actually helps compared to better AoE. Yeah, I think the only- my only point, Naomi, though, was, like, single target definitely matters, though. But it's like, if your AoE is terrible, that's obviously a major downside. But we've already seen that Disc Priest has very, very strong AoE. So it might be marginally weaker. I guess it depends on the extent of the nerf that you're describing. But the way you described it sounded like it'll make them slightly worse than Holy Priests. And slightly worse than Holy Priests on AoE is still pretty fucking good. So if they are only slightly worse on AoE and still really strong on single target, I think they are still a perfectly strong healer. Now, maybe that would make Holy Priest slightly better if the nerf is, like, sufficient that Holy becomes much, much stronger in AoE. I think they'd both still be A tier regardless, but I don't know. I think it would have to be a very substantial nerf for me to say that uh, that is enough to make it not worth running compared to, like, you know, just running Holy or something. Because I think right now, Disc's single target is, like, substantially better than Holy's. Maybe not substan- I don't know, it depends on what I mean by substantially. It, it's like a good bit better. Not to the point where like, Holy still has good single target, but Disc can really pump single target, and both of them can pump good AoE. Whereas right now, Holy is a little bit ahead, but Disc is still competitive. If Disc fell off hard, that would hurt it, but I don't think it's anywhere close to falling off that hard. So I'm gonna... Ah, crap. Let me do Stormkeeper and this. Pretty good. What does this do? Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't make anything an instant cast, so... Hmm. Why don't you want it over 10 hours? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Naomi, to be clear, I, in theory, if I wanted to, I could restart the stream and just do, like, a two-part stream. And that has been my plan for any stream that I know is going to go above 10 hours. Which, the only stream that I really had planned to go above 10 hours was the uh, Dragonflight launch stream, which, obviously, you know, I got fucked by Blizzard, but... Uh, if I ever do, like, a 10-hour stream in the future, that's how I would handle it. But another good example is on the 7th. So I'm just going to be streaming what I do on launch day, right? Now, depending on when the servers go up, if the servers go up at, like, uh, let's say noon or something like that, well, by the time you reach, like, hour 10, I would be in the middle of my Aberus raid, and I wouldn't want to, like, cut it off there. So what I would probably do in that case is just cut it off at, like, 8 hours, right around before I'm going to start my Aberus raid, and I think I would actually stream my raid on Twitch. That way, you know, it, it's like a, a bonus, like, hey, if you want to watch the raid, just head over to Twitch. It's, like, less stress because there won't be quite as many people watching, and that way it's, like, less of a... So lots of, uh, I guess, importance for me to focus on interacting with chat and all that stuff. And I can just focus on raid and if people want to watch, they can watch. So that is probably what I'll do. That's like a good example of how I would handle that. But what I will do in the long run, I guess I had also maybe planned on doing this for classic hardcore, but I was like feeling a bit more tired than I thought is at like around 10 hours, I would just split it and do a part two uh, for the recording. But that is like, I usually would only do that if it was something really heavily planned in advance. Admittedly, I did not expect this to take 10 hours. I expected it to take a very long time. Uh, that much is a no-brainer. But I uh, did not think it would be quite this long. Okay, I've reached level 56. Uh, 56 and a half with the 15% bonus, this is probably enough that I can do TBC dungeons. Like, I think two TBC dungeons with the bonus will probably be enough. So, let's hope. Random Burning Crusade dungeon. And that way we can get, like, a slightly better comparison on what the damage would look like. Um, 
And it's 10 hours per uh, recording. So, yeah, I could split it, but it it's not like per day. Wait, did I actually get flamed for lusting without being told? I didn't even see that. Did they actually give me shit? I wasn't really paying attention to party chat. I didn't notice it. Unless, uh, are you just like joking, Chori, that like I am going to get flamed for doing that? Um, that, that would actually be hilarious if they did flame me. I didn't even notice. Um. They're gonna post it. The server is sick so far. This is legit classic plus. If Blizzard doesn't do something solid soon, they're about to lose another sub. It's every unused asset you bitched about endlessly about put into use. I mean, yeah, but to be fair, I don't know exactly a ton about that server. But I would imagine that if Blizzard were to do something, there would need to be like a higher level of quality control, right? And the reality is Blizzard, like, this is the main reason they will never do uh, Classic Plus. It requires them to put in actual development hours and effort and stuff like that. And and I don't really think they would just be reusing assets. They would probably be trying to design new content if that were ever to happen. And that is simply not what Blizzard views Classic Plus or Classic WoW as. To Blizzard, Classic is a way that they can literally just print money. They can re-release old stuff and make free money off it. Seasons are extremely easy for them to create. It requires no effort and, you know, it gets people to continue playing. But anything more than that, there is absolutely no chance we're going to see it. What level is this Guardian Druid? 14. Okay, this run should be easy. But I'm glad it's interesting. It's one of those things where if I have literally nothing else going on, maybe I check it out one day, but it's, uh... Well, I mean, as you know, I have a little bit too much going on at the immediate moments. Um... Uh, they will on Twitch, YouTube, you don't know the policy. Twitch just likes to suck Blizzard's dick, as long as you're not showing the stuff. Yeah, honestly, I I am fairly certain that there is nothing they can do on YouTube, because I like I, I know, generally speaking, the rules for DMCA. I don't really think, ta like, if I, like like you said, if I showed private server assets or something, on stream and actively streamed and talked about a private server, I could see how YouTube would maybe fall or would or Blizzard would maybe be able to claim that as being like, you know, oh, this is uh like misusing our assets or whatever the fuck. I still think it would be a reach, right? There is still like a level of stuff where that wouldn't matter. But if literally like discussing the subject, I am not gonna name the server just to play it safe but even if i were to discuss it without showing anything i do not see how there is anything within like dmca takedown shit that would allow blizzard to say you discussed a private server of our games that is like an infringement on our copyright you know that that's like if i were to discuss like a a star wars fanfic and disney were to say this like infringes upon our copyright because you discussed something that a fan created of our game or of our franchise, right? I'm pretty sure there is no grounds for there to be like any DMCA related bullshit for that. That being said, I mean, it is a good thing to keep in mind because obviously a lot of companies do not respect DMCA takedown rules. Case in point, Creative Assembly. Oh man. Creative Assembly, I am so sad because I love Total War. And that company is dying. Like the like the only thing that would genuinely be worse for Creative Assembly than is already happening right now is if it somehow came out that they had like a uh you know Blizzard Cosby Suite level work environment. As far as I know. There is nothing confirmed about that, though I'll be completely honest. According to one YouTube video I watched, there are claims from fired employees 
then it has a very toxic, misogynistic workplace culture. That is like though something I saw on a YouTube video that is unconfirmed. So I'm not citing that as fact, but it is at least one thing that some people are claiming. But the stuff that is confirmed, obviously, is Creative Assembly is a fucking shit show of a company. Not only do they run their games into the ground, despite it literally being a money printer franchise, because they are just so unbelievably greedy. Like, genuinely, the shit Creative Assembly is doing now, in terms of, like, greed and trying to rob your player base blind, the only thing that Blizzard has done that is worse is Diablo Immortal and now Warcraft Rumble. But... Blizzard has not done anything with World of Warcraft that is nearly as greedy as what Creative Assembly is currently doing to its consumers. And the thing about Blizzard is, at the very least, Blizzard, like, kind of has always known what it's about, right? Blizzard has always had this, like, atmosphere of, like, yeah, we're greedy, what the fuck are you gonna do about it? And they're at least open with that. The thing about Creative Assembly is, like, Currently, the biggest problem is they are now, after receiving heavy backlash from customers about being like a ridiculously greedy scumbag company, they are actively trying to silence criticism to the point where they false DMC takedowned a Total War YouTuber who called them out on a lot of the shady bullshit they've been doing. And guess what happens when it comes out that Creative Assembly, a big corporation, is now trying to attack small creators. A lot of people, like, I, to be honest, I don't even like the guy that they tried to DMCA takedown. I watched, like, one or two of his videos, and I found him to be just incredibly annoying and frustrating to watch. I, I cannot stand watching his content. But guess what? It's still not okay to false DMCA takedown people like that. You can't fucking do that shit. And especially a company trying to do that to silence criticism from its consumers is like, what the fuck? Thankfully, it got overturned. And of course, the entire community basically told this company to fucking eat dirt. And then they took to the forums and started saying, like, what the fuck is this company doing? And then the mods on the forums started banning all discussion that was not, in their minds, productive. And they said, and I quote, in their response to why they were banning criticism on the forums, that discussing our games is a privilege. Like, this is Nintendo levels of bullshit. <laughs> of like delusion of thinking that you somehow can do whatever the fuck you want and nintendo already gets a shit ton of flack from consumers over how garbage it treats its fans sometimes but it's fucking nintendo right like creative assembly is a big company it's not nintendo you don't get to do that shit and get away with it uh so they are just crumbling and it, it, this also isn't like a Blizzard situation where even though everybody is like mad at the company for doing shady shit, they are at least making a lot of money. The problem with Total War is they decided to get so comedically greedy that the entire customer base completely saw through it. And now, according to internal reports, they are actually bleeding money because they just made so many stupid financial decisions out of greed that were just absolutely stupid and anybody with a brain would have said there is no way that this is going to be profitable but they're like we want all of the money and in you know the process of trying to get all of the money they lost all of the money instead of just being content with having a stranglehold over a niche genre that people like me who like that genre absolutely loved they had to basically spit in the faces of their actual fans who would have been willing to buy whatever the fuck they threw at them like i have I spent hundreds of dollars on the on Total War games, right? Like, now, in the grand scheme of things, I have spent more money in total on World of Warcraft, right? But I have bought, like, multiple Total War games. I bought every single DLC for Total War Warhammer 2, because guess what? It's good content. Total War Warhammer 2 had amazing DLCs for, like, really, really, really good prices. And... They started slowly increasing the price of DLCs, and it was like, okay, I mean, the, like, I'm okay with that because this company was putting out amazing content. Like, anybody who has um, played Total War Warhammer 2 knows how absolutely amazing the DLC packs for that. You would get, like, literally hundreds of hours of content for $10. It's insane how good those packs were. So if they want to increase the price to, like, 
$20 for, you know, a new race that they're adding to Total War Warhammer 3. Okay, yeah, it's a bit of a steep increase, but they have been making really good content. But then they randomly tried to charge people, like, three times the price for less content. And made some, like, really weird justifications for why they think that people should be paying more money for the same exact content. They tried to label it as, like, a premium DLC, despite the fact that it was the exact same thing we've always gotten, but with three times the price. And then they got mad and released, like, PR statements basically criticizing the way in which people complained about the content because you guys just don't understand why the price is increasing. And, you know costs for our company are up and therefore prices must go up as well except the thing about costs for the company going up is that costs for the company were going up because they were wasting money on garbage like fortnite ripoff games that nobody asked for instead of actually putting those resources into the franchise that they are then taking money out of people for it's ridiculous and, and the crazy thing is the the all of the money that creative assembly sank into this garbage fortnite ripoff that nobody asked for, they had to cancel their game. That Fortnite ripoff game that nobody asked for because it did so poorly in terms of like pre-release sales and stuff that whatever the company is that owns Creative Assembly, it's one of the really big ones, uh, basically said, can this game, it is not even going to pay off. It's like it was 99% done and they had to cancel it before release because whatever the major corporation was that owns Creative Assembly decided it wasn't even profitable to release a finished game. That is how dog shit it was and how uninterested anybody was with this game. And they sunk years of development time and probably millions upon millions of dollars into that completely scrapped game instead of spending it on a cash cow franchise that tons of players would have been happy to pay more money for DLC. It is just actually the most ludicrous downfall of a company I've ever seen. Like, just throwing away a winning formula. And it pisses me off, because I fucking love Total War. And I especially was really looking forward to a lot of potentially uh, new things that we would be getting in Total War Warhammer. There's so many, like, different, like, things they could expand, expand upon, and, like, new DLC packs and give us, like, new characters to play with that a lot of people were really excited for. And at this point, I'm not even sure if the game is going to survive for, like, another year because the company fucked up so badly. And it would be such a waste of, like... At this point, the first game came out in, like, 2016. The, the Total War Warhammer franchise has been going on for almost seven years now, and they may somehow managed to completely fuck the ending to what should have been an amazing franchise just because they got so comedically greedy. And it really, 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 really pisses me off. So right now, while Blizzard, of course, may be pissing me off with things like Warcraft Rumble, Blizzard is not the number one company on my shit list because god damn am I mad about the way that Creative Assembly is handling things. Anyway, I had to get that off my chest because even if I don't really like talk about total war content stuff a lot on my channel it is a, a franchise that i do love and play a lot in my spare time and seeing uh the company ruin it as much as they have just makes me unbelievably angry okay uh does the end of this dungeon count as outside good question okay well we'll see out of combat can only use outside okay nope so even if you are technically outdoors, it doesn't work. Maybe it would work if you are in a dungeon that allowed you to mount up, like Dernhold Keep. But I think that is the only situation where maybe it would sometimes work. Um... Because it would require you to fly to be able to use it, you would need something like the Necronomicon 1 in 4 to make your jumps a mega jump. Yeah. That much you need to, like, actually go and pick up in Shadowlands, though, right? So it's, like, a really steep investment. Uh, if you go out of bounds in Scarlet Halls, that whole area is outside, so that's the perfect testing ground for stuff like that. Yeah. I could see that. Um... 
Your point was disc goes down to B tier, something you think holy will be marginally better. Oh, you're saying you don't think it would be go going down. You just think you I should put holy ahead of disc. Yeah, I could see it going either way. Definitely. Uh, it was something like what Naomi said, create a character, wait two months, and then start the run with the character. Ah. That's an interesting concept. Okay, so what you're saying is... That would teleport you directly to Chromi, so you'd be... A oh, wow, that was already 60. I... That was... Okay, no, that was two dungeons. I, that was, yeah... Because I did Underbog, and then I did that. That was just very fast, because that Brewmaster carried. Um, admittedly, I did not get, like, an amazing opportunity to test out Resto Shaman, but I think there were enough situations where we saw it does good damage. It's, like, it is definitely up there in both single target and AoE. I think it is... We know that it is strong in low-level content. But I do think that the problem with Resto Shaman is that you have to sit here and you have to cast. And you're constantly trying to catch up to the group because of your cast times, and that uh, hurts it a little bit. But it still has good damage, it has good healing. Uh, I think... I would maybe say that it at higher levels, this only felt like slightly better than Miss Weaver, maybe? But... Miss Weaver obviously is significantly weaker in the early game, whereas Resto Shaman is significantly stronger in the early game. So I think it would average out to Miss Weaver high C tier and Resto Shaman low mid ish B tier. I think honestly, this feels exactly where I suspected it would end up. And uh, that is every single healing spec we got there with uh, 20 minutes to spare. Did have to do I did have to do a few time walking dungeons, but you know what? Made it in the end, so. Whew. Alright. Now I have 20 minutes to read the rest of the messages in chat before I have to stop the stream because otherwise I will run out of time. Uh but yeah, that's an interesting thought, Troy. I have no idea if that would be fast. I know what you you are saying that is like more of a joke. It is an interesting suggestion for sure, though. I would never do something like that for a run, but it's a, a funny, amusing, like, thing to consider of, like, would that actually be a time save? I don't know if it would be, but it, it's interesting. Uh, oh, wait, Azero, though. That is, that is spicy tech, like, combination of Azero and Choi's suggestions of doing it on a demon hunter to send them straight to Stormwind. I actually, that is actually a major time save. So... I was trying to think of, like, would it ever be worth it on a starting spec to, like, do something of that nature? Though, I'm assuming, Azura, that probably only works if you start the, like, intro and then get to level 10 and then log off and wait for the gear update. Uh, and yeah, I, I think I have the Necronomicon. Necro, yeah. Uh, it requires an enchanting vellum? Alright, interesting. Uh, but yeah, that is definitely an interesting tech there, Azero, of like, skipping out of the Demon Hunter starting zone. I don't know if there's any other ways to do that. I obviously would never do that in an actual run, but that is like an amusing little potential skip that you could do if you really, really hated the Demon Hunter starting zone. Uh, yeah, the main issue would be creating characters well in advance before I actually do the speedrun, which is, like, a little bit cheesy. Um, anyways. Uh, yeah, oh, my entire point with the whole creative assembly thing was that, technically speaking, even big companies can abuse the DMCA tool, and I doubt they'll face any major consequences for it. Like, technically speaking, that YouTuber who Creative Assembly DMCA'd, he could, if he wanted to, take Creative Assembly to court. Because that is absolutely illegal, what they did. And they, for the record, have still not apologized for it. They have not acknowledged that it was them who did it, even though there is pretty much irrefutable proof that they did it. They have not confirmed or denied it, uh, despite the fact that everybody's calling on them to do that. 
but they have been silencing any mention of it on any public forums that they have control over. Right now, the only major public forum that people use to discuss Total War that is not in the hands of Creative Assembly is the Reddit. So right now, the Reddit is full of people discussing, you know, terrible things that Creative Assembly is doing, uh, which, yeah, it's glad that there is at least some place of discussion for how shit that company is. But technically speaking, it really wouldn't be worth it for that YouTuber to take Creative, creative Assembly to court, uh, words, because obviously they could drown him in legal fees, which sucks. But it is unfortunate that companies like that can get away with shit because they know that, you know, they're untouchable, right? They can abuse the DMCA feature and get away with it because, you know, what is that YouTuber going to do, right? You know, start a lawsuit against them for trying to take down one of his videos. Obviously, it's extremely unethical what they did, but there's really not much he has in the way of options, which sucks that people or that companies can bully uh, small creators like that, unfortunately. Blizzard will at least make games people will play. Can't say the same for all companies. Uh, Sega is who owns them. Yeah, I knew it was one of those big companies. Um, but I mean, the sad thing about Total War and Creative Assembly in general is that Creative Assembly literally had a winning formula. For people who aren't aware, Total War is a, a type of game. It's, it's a franchise where for a while they did historical titles. So like one of my favorites is Shogun 2, where it is set in... Uh, the Sengoku era of Japan, and it follows, like, the whole introduction of, like, Western technology into Sengoku era Japan, and, like, the process of uh, the Shogun overthrowing the Emperor, and uh, starting that period of isolation where Japan was, like, cut off from the outside world for hundreds of years. And it follows, like, all of the internal politics of, like, um, Oda Nobunaga and stuff like that, I, I might have butchered the name, but you know what I mean. And it, a lot of their older games would focus on, like, those historical eras. And the actual, like, gameplay is on the overworld map, you have a uh, turn-based, like, strategy, like, army movement and uh, infrastructure building and, you know, troop training, all that stuff. And But then the actual battles themselves are real-time strategy with, like, thousands of units you have a regiment of like 120 soldiers that you can like have maneuver around the battlefield it is by far the most fun real-time strategy game i have ever played because there is so much complexity in terms of like how you can um play with like your different army compositions and stuff and while some of the more historical titles are a little bit more simplistic because obviously you know there's only so much you can do with units that have spears at the end of the day, like, it really is just a numbers game. But the reason why, when they started making Warhammer games, Total War Warhammer, uh, the reason why myself and so many other people loved it is there is so much strategic depth in those games. I love Total War Warhammer, especially the second one. Currently, they're on number three, but they have been making stupid decision after stupid decision for number three. You can still technically play Total War Warhammer 2. It's not like a... World of Warcraft, where you can't access the older versions. If you want to play the older version, you can. It's still a very, very, very good game. It's just no longer receiving updates, because the most recently updated version is, in many ways, objectively worse than the previous title, due to a lot of poor decisions they've made. And honestly, like I said, the game is amazing. It is a type of game that there really is no competition. There are some very smaller, like, indie titles that play somewhat similar to Total War games, but on a triple A level, nothing even comes close to the way a Total War game plays, and it is an amazing playstyle that people like me who love it really can't get that anywhere else. I adore the general way that Total War plays, and it does have a very large, um, yeah, I, I am watching the timer closely, Naomi, but thank you. Um, it, it does have a very large fan base. And it's not like this wasn't profitable, right? Creative Assembly, their first game ever was a Total War game. It was Total War Shogun, the original, back in like the 1990s or something like that. And they've been building upon that formula over and over, over the last like 20 something years. And it took them from some extremely small studio that, you know, this was their only thing into being their flagship franchise 
that you know let them become a part of sega i don't know if they got bought out or whatever um but they are part of sega now they're working on multiple different titles but total war is still their main cash cow it is what has always made them all of their money and it is the thing that started their company and what they've pretty much only ever been known for i think they have a few other smaller games that nobody gives a shit about they just make total war and instead of just being happy with the guys who make the super awesome strategy game that a ton of people love and that makes them a shit ton of money, they said, we are going to just stick our fingers into random ass genres that we have no business making games in and pump out the most uninspired garbage for those genres ever to the point where it's so bad it gets canceled despite being already finished. And then all while doing that shit, we are going to neglect our main games like, this isn't, it's not just Total War Warhammer, right? They've been fucking over Total War Warhammer 3. They also released a game called Total War Three Kingdoms, which was around the, um, I, I forget what the, the term for that period. It's like, I think the Romance Era in China history. I forget the term used or whatever. Romance of the Three Kingdoms or something like that is what it's called. Um, and that is like the historical time period. And it is called Total War Three Kingdoms. It's about like very ancient China similar strategy game and that game was I, I have not played it personally but it was a very well received historical title it did really well in china and other foreign markets and because it didn't make quite as much money as total war warhammer which mind you was a massive title infinitely bigger than all of their other options or all their other games beforehand but it, it wasn't making as much money as total war warhammer despite being an objectively very successful game so they completely cut development for it and pissed off their entire Chinese fan base, who then boycotted all of their other games. That was like a few years ago. It was already a completely stupid decision. And they have just been taking L after L after L after L over the last like three years or something. They released a game called Total War Troy, which nobody really liked. And the only reason it even did remotely well is because it had like one of those free on the Epic Game Store for whatever period of time thing. So that actually got it in the spotlight for a little bit of time. And now they have just released a game called Total War Pharaoh, which has bombed so spectacularly. It is, I think, their worst performing Total War game in like the past decade. And that is on top of all of the other financial issues that they are doing, or that they are having right now. It is bad. And it's depressing because, like I said, this means that a game that I absolutely love and that I've been playing for the past, like, five years and have a ton of fun with and was really excited for the future of is probably just dead. Sucks. And Games Workshop is incredibly stingy about giving their IP to other people. So shit like this just means they're probably never going to give people the ability to make, like, a similar game for Warhammer Fantasy again if Creative Assembly somehow manages to fuck up this badly. So that, you know, just icing on the cake, right? Anyways. Uh, you've had enough horrible personal interactions with their GMs and staff that you're looking for any excuse to stop giving them money? Yeah, that's fair. Since you quit retail and BFA, there's no reason to stick with it. You, you became a classic anti. Yeah, fair. Any tips for sucking hard at tanking in Wrath and getting kicked from normal heroics? You don't know how to get better at doing your job, and you don't want to give up on the game. Um, Steven, I assume you mean how to not suck hard, because the way you worded that implies you want to learn how to suck hard. I, I assume that is not just sarcasm, and you, you just worded that uh, in a confusing way. Um, obviously, I only have ten minutes. Uh, nine minutes, actually. I cannot give you a thesis on Wrath Tanking. I would say, honestly, watch my dungeon guides. Like, I've put a shit ton of effort into those dungeon guides, and they are written from my perspective as a protection paladin. So anything important that you need to know for any of those dungeons, it will be covered there, because I tank in Wrath Classic, and I know what I'm doing, and I make sure that anything important is covered in those dungeon guides. I put a shit ton of effort into those. You know, some of them are a little bit lengthy, like 15 minutes per dungeon. However, if you watch, watch it on, like, two times speed, if you just want, like, to make sure that there's not something you're missing... I would recommend it. Same with, like, my uh, Titan Rune dungeon guides. I also put an enormous amount of effort into those uh, relative to the amount of views they get. Those videos don't perform super well. I just love the content, so I put a shit ton of effort into those videos. So that is the only real recommendation I can really make. But hey, if you have specific questions for Prop Paladin or Tanking in General in Wrath Classic, DM me and I'll do what I can to answer that after the stream. 
Uh, you saved my night's sleep. Don't get offended by this, but your videos... No, no, no. Uh, a lot of people have said that they like, you know, falling asleep to my videos. I completely understand that. I do not take that as an insult. I know what you mean in terms of, like, how that helps you fall asleep. <laughs> Zach said, I keep telling him to do ASMR videos. Look, uh... I don't know. Maybe, like... I would only ever do ASMR videos if it was, like, I already had my channel, like, super-duper, uber-well-established, and I was confident enough to branch out into wildly different genres that may not be super receptive with my base audience. I do not think that my channel is large enough to the point where I can confidently make ASMR videos, even if I do think I'd probably be pretty fucking good at it, but that's a whole different can of worms. Um, and yeah, I, usually when I fall asleep to YouTube videos, it's like, oh, I genuinely want to watch this and pay attention to it, and then, like, my brain shuts off. That's kind of how that goes. Uh, Kuan said, just caught up, uh, to the live at the right time. You think your message was one of the ones that was pushed off? It was just to say you can now have 60 characters per account. Okay. I don't know exactly how many characters I have on my account. All I know is I have hit the character cap recently. So if you can now have 60 characters in your account, then I must have even more characters than I initially thought. Um, imagine you start a stream and you say, today we're going to start a 10 to 60 speed run, and all you do is create a character and then talk to chat all day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, gear updates on the PTR are instant, and yes, you do have to level to 10 first and then log out. Yeah, interesting that, like, I... Didn't consider that, Azro. If I did copy the character over, I think it would automatically give me the gear update thing. It's an interesting idea. I don't think I'll do it just because that's a little bit cheesy, but it is an interesting, like, routing potential thing. And I was not aware it was a thing, so I'm glad to know that it at least exists. Um, and yeah, I'm, like, lag switch stuff, I'm aware it exists, but like you said, it's, like, forbidden tech. It's, like, you can do it, but Lag switches in general are a very sketchy thing to do. It's one of those where sometimes if I lag out in the middle of a cheat torpedo, I'm happy, but I'm never going to try and intentionally set that up. Europe, uh, Sega Europe bought them out in the mid-2000s. Gotcha. Uh, Han Dynasty is when Three Kingdoms was set. Didn't Pharaoh reach top 10 Steam sales? So, if you want a more in-depth analysis on why that doesn't mean anything and why Pharaoh is really doing poorly... Uh, Legend of Total War did a really good video uh, like a few weeks ago talking about that. And he also explains how when it comes to Steam sales, I don't even know if it was top 10. I think it might have barely been top 10. But he was like, generally speaking, when a Total War game becomes available for pre-order, it, pre it'll shoot up to like the top three in terms of like sales. Uh, so it was only like lagging behind at like number 10. And then it tanked down to like 40 or 50 uh, top sellers for most of the stuff after the initial pre-order thing, which is really bad. But also, Legend mentions that with Steam pre-order stuff, it tends to be exponential. So there is no actual, like, number ranking on, like, how many sales it got. If, a like, the number one could get, like, a million pre-orders, and the number two could get 100,000, and that's a massive difference, but it won't actually indicate that. It'll just put one as number one, and one as number two. Um, so, Generally speaking, there's an exponential fall off from number one. So really, yeah, it's with sales within that time period. So the fact that on the like initial week that it was available for pre-order, it still only hit like number 10 for a total war game. That is really, really, really bad. Uh, and then it fell off hard. He shows like right before the launch, it was all the way down at like number 50, really bad. And obviously the launch numbers don't lie. Its numbers are really terrible at the moment. Uh, worst Total War game in a while in terms of numbers. It may not be that bad, but it's overpriced. It's absurdly overpriced for how small the game is. Um, so people aren't buying it because it's literally just greedy. They are marketing a mini, what is called a saga game in their terminology, which is basically a mini filler game as a mainstay Total War game, and it just isn't. It is a filler game, and they are putting a $60 price tag on it, and people aren't falling for it. Raging at Warcraft Rumble ASMR to fall asleep to 10 hours. Oh, God. Um, yeah, okay, so now that I've caught up on chat, 
I have three minutes to go before this VOD becomes completely unwatchable. So thank you all for watching. I'm glad that I managed to get all six of these runs done. This is definitely the most ambitious stream that I've tried to do in a very long time. So all things considered, this went very well. Everything went off pretty much exactly according to plan. I managed to get it done under 10 hours, and we got some good testing done. And all that's left is Sub Rogue, which will be... I, I will record Sub Rogue around this point in time, and it'll probably be posted later in the week, around, like, 8 to the 10th. Depending on, like, the other videos I'm uploading around this point, it'll, it'll vary. You took a nap and I was still alive. Yeah, this has been an extremely long stream. This is the longest stream I've done in, like, over a year. It's been a long one, but hey, we got through it. Uh, three minutes to complain about Warcraft Rumble. Oh, I have all week to do that. Uh, the review will cover that pretty one. And a profitable one. Yeah, lots of lots of donations this one, for sure. That was definitely an unexpected surprise, but, you know, a welcome one. Anyways, uh, I could keep rambling. Obviously, I unfortunately do need to cut it off here because otherwise people won't be able to watch it later. So thank you all for watching. I will catch you on Tuesday the 7th when we do the full launch day live stream and I will keep you updated in my discord if I will do any bonus twitch streams over the weekend I'll probably do one or two specifically for mythic plus testing thank you all for watching